Section 1 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lola Janey of Virginia. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Our Sherivari. When Jerry Boyer, Uncle Lyman's French servant boy, told us there was to be a charivari at Roderick Brown's that night, we were wild to go. We were Allison Hillier of New York, Alernon Keefe from Nova Scotia, and myself, Fred Harvey from Quebec. We were cousins, and we were spending our vacation at Uncle Lyman Harvey's farm on Prince Edward Island. We were having a splendid time, but we were chiefly notorious for our scrapes. Our average was two and a half a week, and Aunt Maria said time and time again she never had a minute's peace lest one or the other of us should be brought in a corpse. And I'm obliged to confess that we generally got into trouble through our own headstrong doings and willful disregard of Uncle Lyman's advice. He was very patient, except in cases of outright disobedience. But he warned us solemnly every day that we would learn a lesson sooner or later if we didn't mend our ways. And Uncle Lyman's words came true to the letter, though we used to wink and grin at each other whenever his back was turned. But about this Sherivari, ever heard of one? Well, it is an old French-Canadian custom and is kept up in a good many places in Canada yet. Whenever there's a wedding, the young fellows of the settlement call at the house, dressed in every queer costume they can contrive, with horns and bells and so on, and keep up a racket for hours. When a charivari is well-conducted and respectable, it is real fun. Sometimes the costumes are well got up and the charivariers don't do anything worse than make a noise, and mostly the people of the house invite them into the kitchen and treat them with cakes, which the bride herself comes out and hands around. Then they go off peaceably and orderly. That's one kind of charivari, but there are two kinds, as we afterwards discovered. Well, we were crazy about the affair, but when we asked Uncle Lyman's permission, we got a decided no. He told us he didn't approve of the Sherivaris anyhow, and he knew from what he'd heard that this was going to be one of the worst kind. A lot of rows from the back road were going, and there'd be liquor in the crowd, and we'd be certain to get into trouble. Uncle Lyman isn't one of the coaxable kind, so we went off pretty sulky and sat down on an old bench behind the barn to hold an indignation meeting. Say, you fellows, I'm going to the Sherivari yet. This was my contribution. How will you manage it? asked Allison. If we could hit on a plan, I'd go in for it, for it's likely the only chance we'll ever have of seeing a real Sherivari. It'd be no end of fun to tell the folks at home. Then we made our plans in cold blood. We agreed to smuggle the necessary things up to an old shed back of the barn during the day, each being responsible for so much. Algy was to get the lantern, two horns, an old tin pan, and a pot to get black off of, you see. I agreed to bring two old dresses of Veronica's. Veronica Gallant was Aunt Maria's big, fat French girl, and Allison was to get Jerry's working clothes. Jerry and Veronica had gone home. It was a holy day, so we had a fine chance. Every now and then through the day, you'd see a boy sneaking into the house when Aunt Maria wasn't round and rushing out again by the back way with something. We knew no one would go near the old shed. How to get out at night bothered us most. Uncle Lyman not only locked all the doors at bedtime, but carried the key off with him because he discovered that Jerry had a habit of getting up and going out apple stealing after everyone was in bed. All the downstairs window made too loud a noise in opening to think of getting out of them, 
for uncle and aunt slept on the ground floor. The only upstairs one that would serve was a little one in the clothes room. It opened on the steep kitchen roof at the back of the house. We resolved to climb out of this, slide down the roof, and jump off on the pile of seaweed that had been used for banking in winter and hadn't been removed. When we went to bed that night, we could hear horns blowing all up the roads, and it just made us tingle. It was a dusky, starlit night, and a new moon was low in the west, looking like a little crescent of reddish gold. After what seemed a dreadful long time, Allison and I concluded uncle and aunt were asleep, and we got up. When we crept into Algie's room, of course he was sound asleep, and such a time we had to wake him. And then he was sleepy and stupid for half an hour. We took our shoes in our hands and tiptoed down the hall to the clothes room door. Then Allison tripped on a rug and fell against the door. It flew open with a bang, and his shoes went skating over the floor. We were sure every soul in the house would be up at the noise. But, as all was still, Allison got up, and after we had a laugh, we got to the window. I thought we'd never get it up. It stuck, and Allison shoved and shoved. All at once, it gave way and went up so suddenly he nearly went through it. We fired our shoes down first, giving them a good fling to send them clear of the roof, and then Allison went out. He slipped out and went down the roof like an eel. We heard him jump and then whistle softly as a signal. It was Algie's turn next. He crawled out boldly, but the roof was slippery from the dew, and first thing I heard him give a scramble and a yell, and then he was gone. I heard him and Allison giggling below, so I knew he wasn't hurt, but I thought Uncle Lyman would certainly hear that yell, and for quite ten minutes I didn't dare to climb out. When I did, I forgot about the window, and when I had wriggled halfway down, the contrary thing fell with a force that fairly jarred the house. I suppose things sounded worse to us in the dark and silence, but at the time I couldn't see why everyone didn't wake up. I lay there quaking till I heard Allison below. Say, you up there? Are you going to get down tonight? So I crept down and jumped off on the seaweed. When I got it all out of my mouth and ears, I said, Have you fellows got all the shoes? And it turned out they couldn't find one of mine. So we had to waste about 15 minutes rooting around for it till we discovered Algie had it with the rest after all. I relieved my feelings by saying, well, you idiot. And we started, taking a shortcut through the spruce grove and nearly tearing our eyes out at the low boughs. Just then, old Jip, who was chained in the orchard, began to bark furiously, ending off each series with a long, quivering howl. I'd like to choke that dog dead, snarled Allison. I don't want to give you the impression that Allison was always this bloodthirsty mind. Generally, he was quite amiable, but his patience had been tried that night. Jip had stopped barking when we reached the shed and we lit the lantern and hurried back to work. Algie put on Jerry's trousers, hitched neatly to his shoulders and turned up to his knees, Jerry's coat wrong side out, and an old straw hat. Then he blacked his face and hands with pot black and took a tin pan. Allison and I had a fearful time getting into Veronica's dresses. They were a mile too big for us, and no matter how much we tucked them in at the waist, we were sure to trip and fall every minute and have to pick each other up. It's a mystery to me how girls ever get round. I blacked my face and hands, but Allison was too nice for that. So he put on a headdress he had made of fool's cap. It came down over his face and went up in a big peak with two long horns. He had blacked it in stripes and looked perfectly wild in it. We laughed at each other for a spell and then took a horn apiece and started. When we got to the house, it was pretty late and the Sherivari was in full swing. We agreed to keep together, but as soon as we mixed with the crowd, we were quickly separated. There was a big crowd and such an array of costumes you never saw. 
they all had torches of birch bark and burning brooms and such yelling and horn blowing and pan hammering i got jostled around roughly and besides i was beginning to be doubtful some of the fellows were acting pretty wild they had liquor that was plain to be seen and there was a good deal of fighting and pelting rocks at the house and they kept getting worse i was out of breath blowing my horn and after i had been kicked and cuffed and knocked down once or twice my taste for chavarese was a thing of the past then someone fired a pistol and i said to myself i'm for out of this and looked around for the boys I was just despairing of finding them when the crowd opened before me and I saw Algy standing bareheaded at the other end of the space. He started across and got in the way of a big charivarier who lifted his foot and kicked the child. Algy was only a little fellow. Before I could move, Allison sprang out and struck the bully fair in the face. Then I shouted and sprang forward. Someone tripped me and I fell. The next minute, the whole crowd closed over me, mad with liquor, hooting and fighting. I thought the life was being trampled out of me, and then I felt someone grab me by the arm and drag me out. It was Allison. His headdress had fallen off, and he looked white and scared. Let's run, he panted. Algy, I gasped, waiting for us up the lane. Quick now, before they see us. We ran pell-mell up the lane. Algy falling into rank as we passed him, and if you've ever tried to run in a girl's dress, you know it was a serious time. At the road, I just dropped down to get my breath and take off that dreadful skirt. Tell you, we're lucky to get out of that, puffed Allison as he struggled out of his. Uncle was right, as he always is. What fools we've made of ourselves. You were a brick, Fred. That fellow would have downed me. He was a regular tough. I guess we're quits, I said feebly. Algy, did the chump hurt you? My leg's pretty sore, he admitted. I wish we'd minded Uncle Lyman. Allison and I did too, but that didn't mend matters, so we started across the fields on the run. We were going at a furious rate when we came sprang up against something. It was a barbed wire fence, and we hadn't seen it in the dark. Allison and I weren't hurt as our heads came above it but it took Algy right across the face and he was killed. We knew he must be badly scratched, but the only thing to do was to get him home as soon as possible and we had to go around by the road. We didn't talk much, but when we got to the seaweed again, we stopped and looked at each other and Allison said, well, it looks flat on paper, but I never realized before how much expression could be crowded into a single syllable in all our scheming it had never occurred to us to ask how we were going to get up and in again there was simply no way for it we felt that we were sold there was only one thing to do allison and i might have braved it out till morning but algy's face had to be attended to we marched around to the door and knocked soon we heard steps and uncle lyman opened the door holding the lamp above his head and peering out in wonder the wonder changed to blank amazement when he saw us. We pushed each other in and stood there, a sorry trio, black, torn, ragged, hats gone, and blood all over Algy's face. Uncle set the lamp down and went to the hall door. Maria, he called, get up and come out here, will you? Then he said sternly, now, boys, I want to know the meaning of this we stammered through it piecing out each other's remarks shamefacedly by the time we finished aunt maria came in and she took algy in hand while allison and i went out to scrub ourselves what do you suppose uncle lyman will do questioned allison as he helped me wash the back of my neck pack us off tomorrow like as not i answered dolefully it'll serve us right but I'm sick of this sort of thing, and I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Same here, said Allison energetically, and we went in to face our doom. But Uncle Lyman said not a word. He simply handed me the lamp and pointed to the stairs. We'll catch it tomorrow, whispered Allison consolingly as we went upstairs. 
We were three pretty humble boys as we slipped down to breakfast next morning. We ached from our soles to our crowns. Allison had a black eye. I was all bruises. Algy came in after we did and his face looked dreadful and yet so comical, all patched with sticking plaster. I didn't intend to laugh, but I happened to catch Allison's eye. Nothing could keep that boy down long and I snickered right out. Then I was more ashamed than ever. Aunt Maria sat with her lips shut forbiddingly, but we were nearly through breakfast before Uncle Lyman spoke. Then he asked, Boys, have you had enough of this kind of fun? We said we had. Will you ever do the like again? Never, we all said. Algy said it twice. And that was every word Uncle Lyman ever said, even when Jerry came in and said a man had been seriously hurt the night before. But we kept our word. Uncle Lyman had no reason to complain of our obedience the rest of the summer. He referred to the affair but once again, and that was when he saw all of us off at the station. Just before the train started, he came over to the edge of the platform. Boys, he said, you've had some queer experiences this summer. Now, which one of you are most ashamed of? As the train glided out, we poked our heads out of the car window. De Sherivari, we all replied together. End of section one. Section 2 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aisha17. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. A Practical Joke. Ever since we could remember anything, Will Hanstead and I had spent our vacations at Grandpa Richardson's farm. We were cousins, but as he lived in Maine and I lived in New Brunswick, we were together only when we went to the old farm in summer. We looked forward to it all winter. Just as soon as school closed and we had stacked our dog-eared textbooks in the darkest corner of the attic, we went to Grandpa's. It was a jolly place for boys, big woods, quite handy, and a capital trout pond, and a show where they fished for mackerel. Win and I used to put in two months of solid fun before we went back to football and Latin words. There was nobody at the farm but Grandpa and Grandma and the hired man, but it wasn't the sort of place you'll get lonesome in. There was always something to do. If there wasn't, we did it anyway. Grandpa kept us straight in essentials and was pretty indulgent, though he detested my slang and what he called Wind's Yankee twang. Grandpa was a rabbit old Scotchman, one of the regular Scots Waha, and he hated anything that didn't smack of the heather. We went down this summer, expecting to find things as usual, and they were at first. Win and I were both 15 and no smarter than we fancied ourselves. We had a fairly good opinion of our own acquirements. I don't know what other people shared it, and above all, we didn't want to have anyone else bothering around. So that when Grandpa told us that another cousin of ours was coming to spend his vacation at the farm, Win and I kicked each other under the table. And when Grandpa said he was sickly and was coming down to see if the CA would do him any good, we nudged with our elbows. His name was Reggie Talbot and he was only 12. After dinner, Win and I went out to a bench under the apple trees and talked it over. We were pretty mad. Here we planned so much fun for the summer and now this child was coming to spoil everything for of course he won't be at our heels all the time and tagging around wherever we went. And most likely he'd be one of the whining, petted kind and want as much looking after and humoring as a baby. The more we talked it over the worse we made him out. And at last we got worked up into a white indignation and felt as if we were very much abused boys who ought to have lived when martyrs were appreciated. We grumble about it all the afternoon. By the bedtime, we have reached the stage of resignation. We said if our vacation was spoiled, it was spoiled, and the statement was wonderfully consoling. After we went to bed, we compared our mental photographs of Reggie. Wynne thought he had red hair, eyes between grey and fishy blue, and a squint. 
I leaned to the opinion that he was dark and that he stuttered. After much discussion, we decided we would see him when he came. By next day, Win got so far as to say that since Reggie was coming, he wished he was there and had it over. When Grandpa went to the station for him after dinner, we put off our fishing excursion on the carefully explained grounds that it looked like a thunder shower and stayed around home. We were at the door when Grandpa and Reggie drove up. Win said he looked exactly as he expected him to. I couldn't understand that since Reggie was pale and freckled with mouse grey hair and shy brown eyes. He was the thinniest boy I ever saw and his legs were no bigger than broomsticks. His appearance wasn't exactly taking but you never can judge of a person by their looks. Before a week was out, Win and I began to think we had been rather previous in counting our vacation spoiled. In fact, after we got used to Reggie, we admitted he was a valuable addition. He wasn't a bit troublesome or in the way and such an obliging little chap, really quite useful. Vin and I found it very convenient to have someone to run our errands and do lots of things we used to have to do ourselves. He was the most innocent youngster. Everything Vin or I said he believed as gospel. And when we discovered this we got some fun out of it, we would spin the most amazing yarns about our school and home life, piling up statements regardless positively awful stretchers. And Reggie would stand before us looking gravely up and taking it all in unsuspectingly and admiringly. I suppose it was dreadful. Neither Win nor I would have told a lie in earnest for the world, but we never thought how really wrong it was to impose so on Reggie's innocence. We thought we saved our consciences when we winked at each other over his head. Not that we were bad to Reggie, you know. We were real kind to him, but we did tease him a good deal. There was another thing for which we poked fun at him. He was dreadfully afraid of the dark and he believed in ghosts, pure and simple. You couldn't coax Reggie to go anywhere alone after dark. No, not for anything. And Grandma always had to leave a lamp burning in his room till he went to sleep. And mind you, he was no coward either. By daylight, he was the spunkiest boy I ever saw. There was as much spirit in his thin little body as Win and I had put together. And he would go right through the things that even we could stop to think over. Vin and I said it was a pity such a spunky boy should be spoiled by one fault and we fixed up a plan to cure him as we thought. It was agreed that I decoy Reggie to the shore after tea and keep him there till dark. Then coming home we were to pass the sheep house. It was in a dismal spruce grove back of the warren, and Vin was to appear in the door dressed as a ghost. Then I was to yell and run as if I were frightened to death. We expected Reggie would beat his record for speed and then we'd have a laugh at him and shame him out of his nonsense about ghost. We devised a costume for Win and everything worked beautifully. After tea, I proposed to Reggie that we go to the shore for a swim and he agreed as unsuspicious as a lamb. We had a pretty good time at the shore watching the fishing boats through a spyglass and diving off the rocks. Reggie did some perfectly reckless things in this line. I just have to own up, I wouldn't dare attempt them. He was alright till sunset and then he got anxious to go home. I put him off by saying I wanted to wait till the mackerel boats came in and kept him there on one pretext or another till I thought it was dark enough. Then we started. When we got up on the capes, Reggie was terrified to find how dark it really was. There was always a sort of lemon after light reflected from the water that kept the shore quite light long after it was dark above. He clung tight to my hand shrinking closer and closer and I knew that every tree and fence corner we passed was just bristling with ghosts for him. And once when a harmless old white cow got up suddenly from where she had been lying by the fence, I felt him trembling like a leaf. I began to feel really guilty and uncomfortable with Reggie's cold clammy little fingers clinging to mine and I would really have backed out only for the thought of Win. Win said afterwards that while he was waiting he felt real remorseful too but stuck to it on my account so there it was but i hardened my heart and when we reached the barn gate i whistled to warn win and sure enough as we came around the shed corner there he stood in all his ghostly glory and you never in your life imagine a more unearthly sight than he presented if i hadn't known what it was i believe i should have taken a fit as it was i was actually creepish he had a long white sheet pinned around him and a pillow slip stuffed stiff with shavings on his head. 
This prod his face about in the middle of his body, seemingly that he had rubbed matches over it till it shone and flared fearfully. Wind made a noise to attract Reggie's attention. A dreadful hollow sort of groan and howl combined. He'd been practicing it all afternoon out behind the barn when nobody could hear him and I shouted and ran. I went so fast that I couldn't stop till I got nearly down to the house. I pulled up puffing and had just time to wonder why Reggie wasn't at my heels when I heard Wynn calling Guy, Guy from the barn. Something in his voice made me go back quicker than I had come, if that was possible. I never want to feel again. As I felt when I got up there, I heard people wondering how a murderer must feel. I know as near as I want to, there lay Reggie, just where he had dropped in a limp little heap with Wynn on his knees in that ridiculous rig begging him to speak. He isn't dead, I gasped. I just went cold all over. It seemed to me whole years and centuries before Wynn got up shakily and said, No, 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 his heart is beating. Oh, guy here, let's carry him in, quick. Wynn took his feet and I took his shoulder and we marched down to the house and into the kitchen with Reggie's white face hanging over my arm. Grandma was setting bread and Grandpa was reading an amusing Scotch story out aloud to her. He sprang up as we stumbled in, breathless and trembling. Grandma screamed and said she'd always expected it. Boys, what is this? asked Grandpa, in the tone he reserved for state occasions. We never heard it more than two or three times in our lives, but those two or three times were sufficient. We stammered a few words. Grandpa waved his hand to the door. Go out, he said. We went dumb and repetent and sat on the doorstep till they brought Reggie to. We gripped each other in joy and shame. When we heard the poor child give a gasp and say in a shuddering wild voice, Oh, don't let it catch me. Don't. You poor dear grandma saw. No, no, those miserable boys and carried him upstairs. Ben and I were still skulking around when grandpa came out and such a solemn talking to as he gave us. He didn't say anything more than our own consciences had said, but it sounded worse, put into words in a cold blood. He pointed out what a mean, cowardly thing it was to scare a little fellow like Reggie, who was delicate and timid instead of protecting him all we could and showing forbearance to his little weaknesses. He said Reggie's mother was a widow and Reggie was all she had to love and now perhaps we made him sicker than ever and give him a fright he'd never get over. Grandpa said he noticed before several times that our behavior to Reggie wasn't all he could wish. But he hoped it was more thoughtlessness than any real meanness. And that this would be a lesson to us. I tell you, when he went in, we were pretty sober. Vin said he felt like a downright sneak. I said, I guess there was a pair of us. It seemed to us we could never wait till morning. As soon as we knew Reggie was awake, we slipped in. The poor little chap was lying in bed, as white as the pillow. But he sat up when he saw us. Vin and I just dropped on the edge of the bed and each of us took one of his thin little hands. Oh, Reggie, stammered when my face was just as hot as fire. I couldn't have spoken to save my life. We were regular sneaks. Can you ever forgive us? Of course, said Reggie. Why, I know you didn't mean it to be so bad, you fellows. Honest, I don't mind. I know I am a goose. And he smiled up at us. We just sat there in silence for a while till Grandma came in and sent us out, saying Reggie was to stay in bed all day and she hoped we were ashamed of ourselves. Ben and I went up to the apple tree bench and made a solemn vow that our first practical joke should also be our last. We had had enough of ghost in all conscious and we both said Reggie was a prick. End of our practical joke. Recording by Aisha17. Section 3 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Rando. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. A Missing Pony. First published Golden Days for Boys and Girls. October 17, 1896. I never see a sorrel-colored pony with a faded mane and tail without remembering a night adventurer that Sam Richards and I once had on account of just such an animal. 
It happened long ago when I was teaching school in a well-to-do country district called Moberly. I boarded at old Ezra Burke's, and I chummed a good deal with his hired boy, Sam Richards. I was a mere boy myself at the time, being barely 18, and Sam was a few months my junior. He was by no means an ordinary hired boy, as the status of hired boys went in Moberly, but was several grades higher in the social scale. Sam was an orphan and had been well brought up with an uncle's family. Upon the death of his uncle, a few years previous to the date of my story, Sam was thrown upon his own resources. But he had any amount of pluck. The only thing he knew anything about was farming, and he stuck to it. I don't believe in trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, he once said to me. I like farming, and I didn't know how to do anything else, so I didn't try. Of course, I don't mean to be a hired boy all my life, but so long as I am one, I intend to be the very best it is possible to be. I liked and respected Sam. He was an active, intelligent lad, with a cheerful way of looking at things and unlimited good nature. All the Marberly people were his friends and never dreamed of looking down on him because of his occupation. Sam needed all of his good nature to get along with Ezra Burke. I never knew a more disagreeable, exacting, fault-finding old curmudgeon. It was always a wonder to me how Sam could put up with him at all. It was nothing unusual for old Ezra Burke to have three or four different hired boys in one season. Few of them could endure his unreasonableness, and the few who could generally found themselves peremptorily discharged for some trifling reason. This was Sam's second summer with him, a phenomenal record in Moberly Chronicles. He looked with sour disapproval on my intimacy with Sam. I was never a favorite with old Ezra, and I fancy he imagined I did not exert any favorable influence over Sam. One evening, Sam was ordered to take back to Isaac Gardner, a cart which Ezra Burke had borrowed. I intended to go up to Gardner's along with him and borrow Isaac's two-wheeled gig in order to make a short trip to the nearest town on the following day. At dusk, we went out and hitched Major into the cart. Major was a sorrel pony, which Mr. Burke had bought a week before from Stephen Pollock, a farmer over at Maple Ridge, the next district to Marberly. We did not know much about him, but he seemed a quiet, inoffensive little animal with not enough spunk to get into mischief. Old Ezra came out just as we were ready to start, and finding we had taken Major, he flew into a furious temper and abused us roundly in most unmeasured terms. Had we taken any other horse, it would have amounted to the same thing. He had been in an unbearable humor all day, and was just in the mood for a tantrum. He ended up with a peremptory command to unhook the pony instantly and take another horse. Sam, who had listened to it all with praiseworthy calmness, respectfully replied that the black mare's leg was so lame it was impossible to take her. She had sprained it, if I remember aright, and that the gray horse and the bay colts were away in the back clearings, where it would take a good hour to go and get them. Consequently, either Major must be taken or the cart must be left where it was. Old Ezra grimly succumbed to these unanswerable arguments, but he seemed to cherish a grudge against Sam for the stress of circumstances and evidently blamed him for it all. You look out what you do with that pony, he growled as he shuffled off. I don't trust you. If anything happens to him, I'll send you packing before morning. Sam and I smothered a laugh over the old fellow's crustiness and rattled off down the lane in Isaac Gardner's road cart. We were in high spirits, and it was a delightful evening, somewhere along between haying and harvest, with an exhilarating sparkle in the air and a cool breeze. It was about a mile to Isaac Gardner's, where the post office was kept, and which was a general rendezvous in the evening. Several of the boys from adjacent farms were in the habit of dropping in to discuss news or play games with the jolly crowd of Gartner boys and girls. 
Sam and I frequently went over in the evenings to play checkers with Bell and Gertie Gardner and eat platefuls of their August apples and homemade taffy. This evening, after we had unharnessed Major from the cart and put it away in the shed, we went in as usual, leaving our pony securely tied, as we fancied, to the orchard fence. There were a number of our friends there, and as we were all very merry, it was not until eleven o'clock that we dispersed. We all went out in a jolly mood, playing boyish pranks on each other and calling back joking messages to the gardeners. But Sam and I sobered down when we reached the spot where our pony should have been, but was not. The bridle was hanging to the fence, but Major was gone. At first we accused some of the others of having loosened him for a trick, but as they all solemnly protested their innocence, we concluded that the pony had somehow contrived to free himself and had taken French leave. Isaac Gardner came out with a lantern, and we searched the yard and outbuildings thoroughly, but Major was not forthcoming. It's too bad, said Sam in a vexed tone. Nonsense, replied Isaac Gardner, banteringly. Surely two strong young fellows like you don't mind a mile's walk on a night like this. Your pony wanted to teach you a lesson on keeping early hours and has gone home before you. You'll find him there when you get back. I hope we will, rejoined Sam seriously. I wouldn't care if I were sure that he had gone home. But you know Mr. Burke bought him only last week, and he belonged to Stephen Pollock. He hasn't seemed contented since we bought him, and I'm afraid he's gone back to Maple Ridge instead of home. However, there was nothing to do but go home and see. We bade the rest good night and tramped moodily off. Sam said little, but he was visibly anxious. Old Ezra's threats were never empty ones, and if Major did not turn up safe and sound, Sam would undoubtedly suffer for it. Cheer up, Sam, I said. We'll find the pony home when we get there, all right. Anyhow, he can't have done anything worse than gone back to Maple Ridge, and he'll be safe there. Old Ezra won't discharge you for that, won't he? responded Sam gloomily. You don't know old Ezra yet. He's the biggest crank alive. Why, he sent his last man off with an hour's notice because he accidentally dropped a bucket down the well one day. It's been nothing short of a miracle that he's kept me so long. I wouldn't stay with him except that he pays better wages than most, if he is a crank. We kept a sharp look out along the road for Major, but saw nothing of him. All was silent when we got home. The family had long since gone to bed. Sam and I went straight to the barnyard and searched the premises thoroughly, even going through every building in the hope that Major had got home before old Ezra went to bed and had been put in. There was not a dark corner on the place which we did not explore, but we were not rewarded by finding the sorrel pony. Plainly, he had not come home. We met at the well and gazed at each other blankly in the pale light of the late rising moon. Major's gone back to Maple Ridge, said Sam at last, and the only thing to do is to go straight there after him. Sam, I protested, go to Maple Ridge at this hour of the night. You're crazy. Why, it's twelve o'clock now, and it's six miles over there and back. What time would it be before we got home? If that miserable pony has gone there, let him stay till morning. It won't hurt him. Let's go to bed. No, replied Sam decidedly. I didn't expect you to come, Fred, of course. You go in and go to bed. But go, I must and will. I know old Ezra better than you do. If Major isn't in his stable by daylight, my place isn't worth a continental. If you're bound to go, Sam, of course, I'll go with you. I wouldn't think of doing otherwise if it's necessary. Let's start then. We've no time to lose. It'll be rather a lark after all. We went after I had overcome Sam's objections to my troubling myself. Our walk, though long, was not unpleasant. The moon cast a mellow, hazy light over the fields and road, and the night breeze was cool and inspiriting. Most of our way lay through woods of young maple, a second growth, leafy and luxuriant, intersected by many woodland streams, 
whose liquid gurgle came musically to our ears in the silence of the night. We walked along over a mosaic of light and fantastic shadow, occasionally cutting across a pasture field or an overgrown blueberry common wet with dew. In no very long time, we found ourselves at the Pollock farm at Maple Ridge. All was dark and silent. I knew they'd be all in bed, Sam, I said. What are you going to do now? You didn't suppose I was going to rouse them up this hour, did you? returned Sam. You forget that I was hired here two summers ago, and I know every nook about the place. If Major is here, he must be outside somewhere, or in an open shed, for he couldn't get in anywhere. I know where to look. Don't make a noise. Sam made a speedy and careful search about the place, with precisely the same result as before. We did not find Major. Sam was getting decidedly worried, for he had been quite sure the sorrel pony would be there. We stopped in the open moonlit yard in front of the barn to discuss our next move. Go back home, I suppose, said Sam dejectedly. It beats me where that pony has got himself to. This is getting serious. What will old, good gracious, a series of angry, snarling barks burst out of the shadows at the end of the barn. The next second, a huge, dark body with cruelly glimming teeth came bounding across the yard. Run! exclaimed Sam, taking to his heels at the word. And run we both did, with all our speed, to a big fir tree behind the barn, up which we scrambled in headlong haste. Not a minute too soon, either, for the dog was close at our heels, and sprang with a vicious snarl at my boot as I drew myself up into a place of safety beside the breathless Sam. Gracious, what an escape, he panted. That brute would have torn us in pieces, I believe. I clean forgot all about him, like the edel pated idiot I am. Mr. Pollock keeps him for the benefit of orchard raiders, and he's the most vicious beast in the dog line you ever saw. He must have broken his chain. We're safe at present, anyhow. But how are we to get out of this? I asked. Wait till I get my breath and we'll discuss that, said Sam philosophically. And I waited, perforce, wondering how on earth we were ever to free ourselves. The dog had settled down on his hunches under the tree and evidently meant to stay there. At our slightest movement, he bounded and snapped. He was a huge brute of a mastiff and could almost have chewed us up at a mouthful. The bowls of the fur were very thick and close, so that our position was an extremely uncomfortable one. I suppose, said Sam, we had better try shouting first and see if we can wake anybody up. Probably Mr. Pollock will shoot us for orchard thieves, but that will be preferable to being eaten alive or dying a lingering death here by cramp. We shouted accordingly. I ventured to say that no two boys of our size ever made more or louder noise in a given time than we did. The dog helped us by howling furiously, and we whooped and shouted for about a quarter of an hour. Then I stopped in despair. Can't keep it up any longer, Sam. My voice is all gone, and I am as hoarse as a crow. The people in that house have died or immigrated. We've raised a racket that will wake the seven sleepers. Sam, who was shouting with undiminished power and energy, stopped also. It's no use, he admitted cheerfully. It was characteristic of Sam that the more desperate a situation got, the more cheerful he became. The house is too far away. Besides, old man Pollock and his wife are both deaf as doornails, and the hired man must be away. Well, Fred, what is our next move? Any suggestions will be thankfully received. I've none to make, Sam. My brains won't work in so cramped a position as this. Sam twisted himself around and looked up the tree. After a short scrutiny, he said, You see, those big branches up there hang right over the barn. Can't we climb out on them and swing ourselves down to the roof? What better off would we be? The roof is fourteen feet from the ground, and if we could get off, the dog's here. Hold on, Fred. I confess my landing you in this scrape doesn't argue much for my common sense, but I'm not quite so idiotic as all that. You only see one side of the roof. 
There's a pigsty built against the barn on the other side, and one roof serves for both. It slopes down to within five feet of the ground. If we could get down off it, we'd be all right, for there's a big pig pen underneath with a high board fence all around it, and the dog can't get at us. Then there's a door opening from the pigsty into the barn, and we could wait there till the dog got tired and went back to his kennel. Then we might get out on the other side of the barn and slip off. It sounded feasible if we could only get on the roof. I didn't know anything about the intricacies of Stephen Pollock's barns, but Sam appeared to be thoroughly at home. I'll try it, I assented heartily. Anything's better than this. Who'll go first? I will. Watch how I do it. If I fall off and break my neck or get chewed up by the dog, hang on where you are. He climbed up and out along the swinging bowl. The dog jumped in a frenzy of rage and howled furiously. Sam swung himself down on the end of the bowl and dropped lightly to the roof. He saved himself from slipping down its steep side by clutching one of the staging brackets that ran in rows across it. The barn had been recently shingled, and the staging brackets had been left on it, fortunately for us. All right, said Sam. It's not so hard. Come on. I tore innumerable rents in my best black suit as I struggled up through the thick branches, and my hat fell off into the very jaws of the eager foe. I have never seen that hat since. But at last I found myself on the roof beside Sam, and slowly, and with a good deal of difficulty, for some of the brackets were rather riggedy, we climbed up to the top and down the other side. I'll drop first, said Sam, and he did, landing squarely among a group of fat porkers who were snoozing comfortably in the corner of their pen, and who careered blindly about with terrified squeals while the dog rampaged around outside the pen and added his voice to the general uproar. Sam got up as I came sprawling down, nearly escaping being carried off his feet by the frenzied dash of a big black porker, and we shook hands in silent congratulation. Then we stumbled through the pigsty, falling over things in the dark and alarming some more pigs. Stephen Pollock must have kept an immense number of pigs, and finally made our escape through a door into the barn. Tell you, it's lucky I was hired here and know all the ins and outs of it, said Sam complacently. Now we'll take our bearings. There's a window over there, looks out on the dog kennel. We'll watch cautiously till he goes, and then we can get out of that door opposite. It opens from the inside, fortunately. At this point, he stumbled again and fell over something with a clatter. He picked himself up with a growl. What's the matter? I asked, stifling a burst of laughter. You seem unsteady tonight, Sam. If you weren't a member of the S of T in good and regular standing, shut up, interrupted Sam impatiently. This is no joke. Here I stumbled into old Stephen Pollock's collection of paint cans. Oh, what a mess. Smell the turpentine, will you? I've got paint all over myself. Confound that major. But if this isn't just like old Pollock, setting paint cans around just where a person will fall into them. Don't be unreasonable, Sam. I suppose that if Mr. Pollock had known we were going to favor his barn with a midnight visit, he'd have put his paint out of the way. Sam never could stay provoked long. He went off into a shout of laughter, and we perched ourselves upon the wheat bin and watched the kennel for what seemed an age. What if that dog doesn't go back, I suggested. What do we do then? Stay here till morning and have Mr. Pollock coming out and demanding if we are burglars or oat stillers? He won't demand, said Sam with a grin, which the moonlight rendered absolutely ghastly. He'll knock us over the head first and inquire afterward. That's old man Pollock's way. But there goes that dog at last. Now for it. We stole across the barn carefully, unfastened the door, and stepped out. The coast was clear. It would serve old Stephen right for keeping such a dog if I were to leave this door open, said Sam, as he conscientiously put a stick against it. But I won't, since he built such a good pig pen fence. After we had crept cautiously out of earshot, 
we took to our heels and did not slack up until we reached the main road. We were considerably worse off than when we left it, but sound in limb, which was more than we had expected. Sam's anxiety returned as we trudged home. I guess I can go home and pack up, he said. I wish I could find Major. Don't mention that wretched beast again, I said crossly. Isn't it all on his account we've gotten to this miserable scrape? Look at my clothes, will you? They're ruined, and so are yours, all for that rat of a pony. I wouldn't go through this again for a dozen majors. By the time we got as far as Isaac Gardner's, the eastern sky was rimmed with silver. As we passed by the orchard fence, Sam stopped and said with great earnestness, Well, I am blessed. And there, calmly gazing at us from the corner of Isaac Gardner's orchard, where the faint light of early dawn and waning moon shone over his damp sorrel sides, stood Major. I never saw anybody so disgusted as Sam Richards. I never once thought to look behind the copse of cherry trees in the first place, he said. The next time Ezra Burke calls me a fool, I'll believe him. We went in and captured the meek, unresisting Major and borrowed Mrs. Gardner's clothesline to lead him home. When he was finally safe in his stable, it was open daylight, and all the east was rosy and fire-streaked. Old Ezra got up fifteen minutes later and found Sam and me leaning meditatively over the barnyard fence. He did not address us, except by giving an inarticulate huh as he passed by, and we did not feel called upon to relate our exploits to him, so we left him to suppose that we had merely been attacked with an acute spasm of early rising. Major kept his own counsel, and the story never leaked out. It is now several years since I saw Sam Richards last. He was then a well-to-do farmer with a comfortable home presided over by the Bell Gardener of other days, and we had a hearty laugh over the recollection of the night we spent hunting for Major and frightened old Stephen Pollock's pigs over at Maple Ridge. End of Section 3 Section 4 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by D. Randall. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Our Uncle Wheeler. First published in Golden Days for Boys and Girls, January 22, 1898. In reality, he was our great uncle, and we were very much in awe of him. The rare times when he came to visit us, usually popping down unexpectedly at some particularly inconvenient moment, were periods of misery for us lively boys. For Uncle Wheeler was a very precise old gentleman, fidgety when boys were around and with all an old bachelor's decided opinions as to the training and behavior of those unavoidable evils. Consequently, as Rod used to say, we were as unhappy as a cat on hot bricks when Uncle Wheeler came. He had befriended and aided father more than once in troublous times, for he was really kind-hearted at the core, and hence we were instructed to regard him with gratitude and respect. He was always Uncle Willer to us. Our other uncles were Uncle Tom, Dick, or Harry, but we would as soon have thought of calling Uncle Wheeler Uncle James as of saying hello to the minister. Rod and I were the oldest of our family, being 15 and 14 respectively. We were hardy, growing boys and found it very hard to tone down during Uncle Wheeler's sojourn. Nevertheless, we tried our best, for we really liked the old man in spite of our fear of him. When it was decided that Rod should go to college if it could be managed, Uncle Wheeler wrote to father and mother a letter in which he denounced the project as absurd nonsense and railed at it for three pages. On the fourth, he announced his intention of paying Rod's way through college if he were really bent upon going and hoped he wouldn't disgrace the family. Rod was jubilant, but it behooved him to be very careful for Uncle Wheeler was extremely touchy, 
and sometimes got offended at very trifling things. Therefore, we made up our minds to be more than usually sedate and proper on the occasion of his next visit. About two months after this letter, Rod and I received an invitation to a party at the house of one of our schoolmates. During the afternoon, Sidney Hatfield, a cousin of ours, arrived and decided to stay overnight, as he was going to Tracy's too. Mother intended to put him in the spare room to sleep, but about dusk a cutter drove up to the door, and in it were the three Winslow boys from Bracebridge, who came in and said they were also bound for the party and would afterwards remain with us until the next day. We were a big family, all told, so that mother said to us, just before we left, I think, boys, you better take Sidney up to your room tonight and let the Winslow boys have the spare room. We can accommodate you all if you won't mind a little crowding. Lou Winslow said uninvited guests ought to be thankful to be taken in at all, and for his part he thought it jolly to sleep three in a bed, if it was a big one, and we all drove off to the party in high spirits. It was late when we returned, and of course everybody was in bed. Mother had left a light burning for us, and we tiptoed in cautiously so as not to disturb the sleepers. While we were putting away our coats, I noticed Rod and Dave Winslow talking earnestly, and when I went out to lock the back porch door, Rod followed me. Say, Art, Dave's nervous. He's afraid of the ghosts and doesn't want to sleep in the spare room. Of course he's a ninny, but arguing won't do any good. What's to be done? Dave Winslow was a delicate boy of nearly 15, and we always regarded him as babyish. He was extremely sensitive, and his nervous whims had to be indulged. I don't know how he got wind of our ghost, but he had. I may here remark that our spare room had the reputation of being haunted during the sojourn of the family who had preceded us. None of us had ever seen or heard anything worse than ourselves in it, and never felt in the least disturbed. We had good, healthy nerves and didn't worry about spooks. But I knew Dave couldn't help his terror. So, feeling sorry, I said, Well, the three Winslows had better go upstairs to our room, and you and Sid and I will take the spare room. We're equal to any ghost who may be on the hunting trail tonight. This arrangement suited all hands, so we showed the Winslows upstairs and separated. Our house was an old-fashioned one, and the spare room opened off the end of the parlor. The parlor was a long, narrow room, and the bedroom was also long and narrow, so that from the parlor door to the extreme end of the bedroom, where the bed was, was quite a distance. Sid, Rod, and I went into the parlor and found it deliciously warm, as there had been a fire in the stove. We supposed Mother had lit it to warm the spare room for the Winslows, and we thought it rather a good joke that Dave's ghostly terrors should have put him out of a warm sleeping room. We undressed by the fire quietly enough, for we were tired. But when we were ready for bed, Sid, who was always up to mischief, had a brilliant idea. Say, you chaps, let's start from the hall door and see which will get into bed first. Rod and I thought it would be good fun, so we didn't make a noise. So, having taken a vow of silence, we put out the candle, for the moonlight was streaming in at the windows, ranged ourselves by the hall door, and Sid gave the word, Go! The bedroom door was open, so we flew down the parlor, shot through the door in the spare room, and the whole three of us, with one spring, bounded on the bed at the same instant. There was one awful moment in which we realized what had happened, and then a wheezy, sleepy, well-known voice puffed out. Why, bless my soul, what's the matter? It was Uncle Wheeler. We had jumped upon that bed pretty quick, but we jumped off three times quicker, dashed out of the room, and scuttled through the parlor, never stopping for breath until we reached the kitchen. Rod and I wished the floor would open and quietly let us into the cellar. Sid, being a stranger, of course, didn't appreciate the situation so keenly. Say, you chaps, that old duffer must have got his breath most lambed out of him. Who is it? Uncle Wheeler, groaned Rod, and oh, what will he say? 
However did he come to be there, and why didn't Mother leave some way for us to know? Just then we heard a gasp and sigh, and a sort of groan in the little breakfast room off the kitchen. We all jumped. Great Scott! Is that one of Dave Winslow's ghosts? exclaimed Sid. But I had got a lamp lit, and by its light we saw our eleven-year-old brother Tad come shuffling out of the breakfast room, rubbing his eyes. Say, you fellows, have you got back? Mother told me to sit up and tell you, tell us what? That Uncle Willard come, and she put him in the spare room, and that the Winslow boys must have your room, and you chaps would have to sleep in the kitchen loft. I meant to keep awake, honest, I did, but I got so tired. I went in there and lay down on the lounge. I guess I went to sleep. I guess you did, growled Rod. You've done for us now. And after each of us had raided the still, stupid, and half-asleep Tad soundly, by way of venting our ill humor, we crept off shiveringly to the kitchen loft. We were too tired and cold and cross to talk it over then. But by dawn, Rod and I were sitting up in bed, discussing our mishap in whispers so as not to awaken Sid. Nothing worse could have happened. Laminated Rod. Uncle Ruler will be piping mad. You could hardly blame him, I suppose. What a rousing scare he must have got. But he won't listen to any excuse, and not a blessed cent need I expect for college if he finds out. Some men would just look on it as a joke. But Uncle Ruler isn't that sort. After forlornly admitting that we got into a scrape beyond doubt, we got up put on some old clothes, and went down to sneak Sid's suit out of the parlor for him. For needless to say, we hadn't stopped to get our clothes in our stampede of the night before. On our way through the hall, we met the Winslow boys tiptoeing downstairs, much to our surprise, for it was barely daylight. What's the rush? asked Rod, with an attempt at hilarity. Been seeing any ghosts, Dave? It's beginning to rain, announced Lou and it's setting in for a big thaw. So we decided to get up, rouse you out if we could, and start just as soon as possible. You know, it's a long drive home, and a wretched road at the best of times. It'll hardly be passable in a thaw. They passed on out to the stables. Rod and I looked at each other, both struck by the same idea. Nobody else will be stirring for an hour yet, said Rod, voicing my thoughts rather shamefacedly. We'll light a fire and get some grub up for the boys, and they'll be gone before Mother or Uncle Wheeler come on the scene. They were supposed to be going to the spare room, and if we just hold our tongues and get Sid to do the same, Uncle Wheeler will think it was the Winslows. But Tad, Tad didn't appear till too late, so that won't give us away. And he was half asleep, and I'll bet a cent he'll never remember how many of us were there or that we hadn't our clothes on. It hardly seems fair, though, to put it on the Winslows. That won't hurt. They're nothing to Uncle Wheeler, and he doesn't even know them, so it won't do them any harm, while it would do us a whole heaps. We talked it over and decided to go ahead. I left Rod to light the fire, while I went up, wakened Sid, explained the whole affair, and easily got him to promise silence. We're not going to tell any fibs, of course, I said virtuously. If anybody asks us who it was, we'll have to tell straight out. But not likely anyone will, and we'll just keep quiet. See? Sid thought it a good joke and agreed to keep mum. The Winslows came in. Rod and I got them a cold breakfast, and they started off. Just as they drove away, Mother came out at the hall door, and Uncle Wheeler, in dressing gown and slippers, emerged from the sitting room. He just looked as grumpy as Uncle Wheeler could look, and that is saying a good deal. Mother didn't see him at first, and merely asked us why we were up so early, and where the Winslow boys were. We explained, and then Mother saw Uncle Wheeler, and said she hoped he slept well and found his pillows high enough for him. Slept well? growled Uncle Wheeler. I wonder if you or anyone else, Amelia Jane Miller, could sleep well, if just when you had dropped off to sleep after a long and arduous journey, you were suddenly awakened by half a dozen great lumbering louts of boys coming down on you like an avalanche in the dead of night. 
I ask you how anybody could sleep well under such circumstances, madam. And Uncle Wheeler glanced at us boys as if he knew we were the guilty ones. Mother was greatly distressed. Oh, dear me, the Winslow boys went in after all. Didn't Tad tell you that Uncle was there? Tad went to sleep, said Rob, promptly nudging me with his elbow for fear I'd put in a word too many and complicate matters, and didn't wake up till too late. When he appeared, the mischief was done. You might have known he couldn't keep awake, Mother. There was no one else to leave, replied Mother, and I warned him not to go to sleep. I'm very sorry this should have happened, Uncle Wheeler. Uncle Wheeler barely answered. The Winslow boys had gone, so he couldn't come down on them, and he had no excuse for blaming anyone except Tad, who kept religiously out of the way that morning, so he felt defrauded of his rights. He was as snappish and crusty as he could be all through breakfast, and kept making remarks about boys being out late at night and gadding about to parties and coming home to disturb respectable folks at unseemly hours. He was never guilty of it in his young days, and he felt very sorry to see that his nephews were, and as for those three fools that had wakened him up, he'd like to teach a lesson to boys who hadn't enough sense to get into bed properly but must race in terror like a pack of wild cubs. There was no doubt that Uncle Wheeler was in a fearful humor, and Rod and I realized that we had had a narrow escape. Sid Hatfield, having no particular interest at stake, enjoyed the whole performance immensely and afterwards remarked in the seclusion of the kitchen loft it's a jolly good thing for you chaps that your respected uncle doesn't know that it was you who disturbed his peaceful slumbers. He doesn't seem particularly amiable this morning. But for all our success, I really didn't feel comfortable, and Rod looked awfully glum. Pretty soon he came out with it. I feel like an out-and-out -out sneak, Art, he confessed. I never did anything like this before, and I never will again. We've deceived Mother and Uncle Wheeler, and all I wish is that we hadn't. Same here, Rod, I said heartily, for Rod had just put my own disquieting reflections into words. Sid stared at us. You're a pair of geese. I think it's all a capital joke. Why, you didn't say a thing. Never even stretched the truth itself. And it can't hurt the Winslow boys one single mite. That isn't the question, replied Rod. It's what we've done. I feel kind of dishonorable, but I suppose there's nothing more to be said now. Still, we did feel mean. Uncle Wheeler got over his ill humor by next day and was as good as gold. Everything went well for a week outwardly, but Rod went about kind of grim and sulky, and as for me, I felt somehow or other that I was a pretty mean, sneaking sort of chap. Rod and I had both been brought up to be strictly truthful and above board in everything, and we felt that we had come short of Mother's standard. It wasn't that our evasion was going to harm anyone else, but we had simply lost our self-respect. Sid had gone home, so we hadn't him to bolster up our consciences, and we got regularly blue and moody. One night, Uncle Wheeler had another cranky fit on, the wind was northeast, and his rheumatism was always bad in a northeast wind. Finally, he remarked to Mother, I had a letter today from Henry Winslow, the father of those rascals. He wants me to accommodate him with a loan for a short time. I shan't. I've worked hard for my money, and I'm not going to risk it in doubtful loans, not if he is honest and hard up. I don't propose to help a man that can't bring his boys up better than he's done and Uncle Wheeler poked the fire viciously. The memory of the towsing up he got that unlucky night was still vividly present with him. Rod and I went softly out, leaving Mother trying to intercede for Henry Renslow with no very good success, and went to our favorite roost in the kitchen loft. Here's a mess, said Rod. A bad one, said I. What's to be done? Done. Make a clean breast of it to Uncle Wheeler, of course. It'll ruin my chances with him. But I'm not going to have other people suffer for what isn't their fault. If we'd only told him at first, I said mournfully. But even if he could forgive us for jumping over him, 
He never will for bluffing him about it. He'll think we were just fooling him for pure fun. It's a blue show, said Rod gloomily, but we deserve it. So I'm not going to flinch. After all, I don't know that I'm sorry we have to. I felt like a regular sneak this week. Uncle Ruler will be a furry, of course, but I think worse of how Mother will feel. She hates any crawly business. We made up our minds to beard the lion in his den as soon as possible. The afternoon of the next day, we screwed up our courage and marched straight into the parlor where Uncle Riller was writing letters before the table. He shoved up his specs and looked at us sourly. What do you youngsters want? he demanded gruffly. We both knew by experience that it doesn't do to beat about the bush with Uncle Wheeler. You have to come straight to the point and say what you've got to say. Rod took a header right in. We've come, Uncle Wheeler, to tell you what we should have told you before. It wasn't the Winslow boys who woke you up the other night. It was Sid Hetfield and Art and I. Then we waited for the outburst. Uncle Wheeler gazed at us over his specs quite calmly. We knew he had a dozen different ways of getting mad, and this might be one, but if so, it was brand new. It was you, was it? He said at last. You young scamps, and you've the face to come and tell me so. And why did you say it was the other boys? Please, sir, we didn't, I ventured to say. Mother just thought it was, because she had told them to go there. But Dave was scared of the ghosts, so we changed rooms. Sid wanted us to race and see who'd get into bed first, that's all. We didn't know anybody was there, and we are awfully sorry. We were kind of scared, too, so we thought it wouldn't be any harm to let you all think it was the Winslows. But it wasn't right, and we felt mean ever since. Uncle Wheeler glared quite fiercely. What do you think you deserve, he asked and Rod spoke up manfully. Uncle Wheeler, we deserve a sound scolding for deceiving you, and we will get it when Mother finds out. But as for the rest, it was only in fun, and I don't think anyone ought to regard it as a serious crime, although it was very silly of us. Most people would merely look upon it as a joke. Oh, they would, would they? said Uncle grimly. Perhaps when you get to be my age, young man, and don't find it so easy to get to sleep as you do now, you won't consider it much of a joke to have three great boys come sprawling over you in your first doze. We're sorry we disturbed you, Uncle, said Rod firmly but respectfully, and we apologize for not owning it up right off like men. That's all we can do, and I hope you'll forgive us. Hmm, go out and tell your mother I want her. That was all the satisfaction we got. But we went gladly, for we had escaped wonderfully well. Mother went in and was closeted with Uncle Riller for half an hour. When she came out, she looked amused over something, and though she tried to be severe, it was a failure. You deserve a scolding, boys, but I promised your uncle I'd let you off this time. He really seems in a good humor over it all, but I wouldn't advise you to repeat the experiment. What's he going to do about Mr. Winslow, broke in Rod anxiously. He's going to help him, I think, since he found out the boys are not such louts as he thought them. Rod and I felt a good deal better then, you may be sure. Uncle Wheeler went home the next day, but he parted from us kindly, told Rod to be ready for college in the fall, and to remember Mother's training and straightforwardness, and finally left an envelope in our respective hands. We found a $20 bill in each of them. Hooray for Uncle Wheeler, said Rod. He's a brick. End of section four. Section five of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. A Pastoral Call and How It Brought Happiness 
to a disunited family first published the christian herald and signs of our times part one april thirteenth eighteen ninety eight part two april twentieth eighteen ninety eight mrs kennedy turned from the window where she had been smilelessly watching the golden-red glow of sunset flush over the transitory softness and splendor of the harsh bare outlines of the late autumn landscape she was a spare little woman with a slight stoop and a quick nervous step her gray hair was drawn tightly back from her lined forehead and twisted into a hard little knot behind her eyes were keen and shrewd her thin long lips were tightly even obstinately set her face was sallow and wrinkled she looked much older than she was there is someone coming up the lane miranda she said i think it's the new minister if it is go and open the parlor blinds and show him in there i don't want to see him a mite she muttered vindictively after miranda had shuffled out into the hall i know what he's coming for just to rake those old bones over again i haven't a doubt i'm sick and tired of it the last minister soon found out i wasn't going to put up with his interference he learned to hold his tongue about in the end i guess now it'll have to be done all over again i wish folks would mind their own affairs what business has a man just because he is a minister to go poking and prying into what doesn't concern him i'll let that young man know it too if he says much he'll think it is his duty to rebuke me if he's heard of me and of course he has gossip and scandal is all that crowd down at pawtucket live on she passed her hands over her hair and straightened her starched white apron then she listened attentively yes it's him i kind of hoped it wasn't well he'd better mind what he says to me she shut her lips in a way that boded no good to the young man who was at that moment sitting by the parlor window where the warm rays of the sunset fell over his boyish face pale and thin as if from long study his eyes were large and dark with a singularly earnest and spiritual look his mouth was mobile and sensitive he looked very young, younger than he really was, and he was only a little over twenty-one. Mrs. Kennedy coming in, defiant and rigid, felt a sort of protesting anger that this beardless boy should have any right to criticize or disapprove of her actions. She shook hands coldly with him and sat down by the other window, where the harsh gray light on her face brought out all its hard, uncompromising lines the young man felt vaguely that she brought with her a spirit of hostility she sat upright the angularity and stiffness of her whole appearance in keeping with the arrangement of the little square room the chairs were set in a prim row along the walls the mats were laid precisely some faded photographs in old-fashioned frames adorned the walls and over the mantel hung a cheap chromo of the prodigal son the windows were draped with straight stiffly starched white muslin curtains so crisp and crackly that one expected them to snap off at a touch he wondered what he should say to her but she spoke first you're the new minister over at pawtucket i suppose she said stiffly i'm pleased to see you perhaps you find it cold in here these fall days are real chilly i'm not cold at all thank you mrs kennedy I know it is a rather late hour for a call, but I wished to visit all the families along this road today, and this is the last house. You are quite a distance from any neighbor. He smiled at her as he spoke, a rare sudden smile that irradiated all his pale scholarly face with a warm magnetic glow. The Reverend Cecil Douglas was still too young to have learned how much that sweet sympathetic smile did for him perhaps when he learned its value its charm would be less potent people thawed out unconsciously under it children smiled back to it with the perfect unreasoning confidence of childhood hard-working unsentimental men and their women felt their hearts warm to their boyish pastor when he looked into their eyes with that clear smile 
Even Mrs. Kennedy felt its influence. "'I do live considerably out of the world, I suppose,' she said less rigidly. "'Not that I mind. It keeps me from getting into rows and quarrels with other folks. Pa Tucker people ain't angels. I suppose you've discovered that. I don't set up to be better than others, but I keep to myself. You look kind of young to be a minister.' The young man flushed sensitively. "'I look younger than I am,' he said. "'But I am young, very young, and very inexperienced. I often wonder how I dare undertake the responsibilities of such a position as mine. My heart is in my chosen work. I desire to be not unworthy of my high calling. I need all the patience and prayerful sympathy of my people. A minister can do a great deal sometimes.' but the means of his usefulness is limited by the spirit of those whom he is appointed to teach and to be taught by. I have a great deal to learn. I am willing to begin at the very beginning. I hope, I am sure, that you will help me in my work. Mrs. Kennedy was quite silent. She had not expected this, and had no answers ready. The last minister had been in Pawtucket for fifteen years. He was an old man and a good man, but he was very different from this. He had grown a little too dogmatic and severe in his long experience with the contrary-minded in Pawtucket. The Pawtucket people were not easy to get along with. In his own mind, he had considered Mrs. Kennedy to be a hard, worldly-minded woman. She had felt and resented this. Pawtucket folks heard with relish of certain verbal conflicts between Mrs. Kennedy and the Reverend Dayton, conflicts in which Mrs. Kennedy had held her own with such spirit and energy that the poor pastor was fain to resign her to the dominion of her own evil nature. Mrs. Kennedy herself had grown to have a chronic spite against any and all ministers. She had been thinking with a certain relish as she sat there, what she would say to her caller if he should try to unlock the door of her skeleton closet. She felt disconcerted that he had taken so different a course. The young minister looked compassionately at the pinched, discontented face opposite him. He felt instinctively that this woman required help if he were able to give it, or if she would take it when offered. "'You live all alone,' he said." "'Yes, you may say so. "'A servant girl ain't much company. "'I'm as good as alone.' "'So is my mother now,' said the young man softly. "'All alone. "'And I am so far away from her. "'She misses me, I know, "'and I miss her more than words can say. "'She is such a dear, good mother, "'the best a boy ever had, I think. "'I suppose every boy thinks that of his mother, though.' "'You have no sons, Mrs. Kennedy?' Mrs. Kennedy stiffened herself up and looked at him with angry suspicion. She had an odd resemblance to a watchful, irritated cat, ready to pounce at any movement. But she saw nothing save kindly interest in the minister's open face. "'Yes, I have one son,' she said deliberately. "'Or I had. I don't consider him as a son now,' after the way he has behaved. It's a wonder you haven't heard. His name is Walter Kennedy. He lives in that little shanty away down at the corners. You can see the end of it beyond that bush. She pointed defiantly out the window behind him. Her eyes were angry, and her breath became faster. I was there this afternoon, said Mr. Douglas slowly. He felt surprised and was not sure of his ground. I did not know you were his mother. He has a very sweet wife and child. That ain't nothing to me, retorted Mrs. Kennedy acridly. I ought to know how sweet she is, I guess. You needn't talk. I've had enough lecturing on that subject already. I don't want ever to have anything to do with them again. I know what it is to have an ungrateful child. Walter Kennedy and his wife can go their own way for all of me. 
i don't want to hear nothing about them i haven't no dealings with them and i don't want to have she paused with a cowering exultation over her boldness in speaking so to the minister she expected a severe shocked rebuke but none came i am sorry he said simply perhaps things will be better some day you don't know much about the kennedys if you think that we mean a thing when we say it i didn't drive walter away he went of his own accord so i guess i won't ask him to come back again in a hurry she stopped abruptly and looked at him suspiciously it's queer you haven't heard about it before this ain't that what you came here for just to lecture me about that affair mrs kennedy i did not even know you had a son you need not tell me anything about it if you do not wish to ah uh, i don't know if i care i ain't ashamed of my part somebody else'll tell you if i don't and they'll put more to it some of the pawtucket folks have great imaginations walter's father died when he was a baby he was our only child i brought him up and did as well as i could for him i was a good mother to walter if i do say it i worked hard and saved for him i won't say he wasn't a good son too he was i wouldn't ask for a better i never heard a cross word from him then he got married he married esther willis i was dead against it from the first but walter wouldn't listen to me i hadn't nothing against esther but she weren't brought up to be a farmer's wife she didn't know how to work she was as pretty as a picture and just as useless she was a flighty thing with a lot of highfalutin ideas it was nothing but trouble after walter brought her here i ain't saying the blame was all on esther's side i s'pose i ain't any too easy to get along with a woman that's been at the head of a house for thirty years don't feel like knuckling under to any young chit esther hadn't no consideration for me she come between me and walter that's what she did she set him against me me his mother that had slayed for him he always took her part everything she did was right he never made any allowance for me i wasn't going to stand it i wonder who'd expect me to the house was mine and so was the farm i told them that one day but i didn't suppose well they just went that high-stepping wife of walter's couldn't swallow my saying that he had a bit of land down at the corners and he put up a shanty on it and took esther and the baby down there i told him if he went out of my house he went out of my heart and life he had his warning and i told esther i'd never forgive her for taking my son away from me she made out she was sorry i knew she was just as glad as could be in her heart that was two years ago i ain't ever spoke to either of them since and i don't ever mean to i've got on well enough since they left and i've had some peace of my life i don't know why i'm telling you all this you ain't like mr dayton though he used to make me mad he said it was wicked and sinful to show such an unforgiving unchristian spirit i suppose it is wicked everybody's a good deal wickeder than they let on some show it more than others that's all the difference i ain't going to be trodden on and then be as meek as moses i can tell you i suppose you think i'm unnatural and inhuman too mr dayton did she threw the last sentence at him defiantly her thin little body trembled her knotty toil-worn fingers were tightly interlaced he reached forward and took one of the rough unsightly hands in his own slender white one it was an impulsive movement as of a son seeking to soothe his mother why should i think so mrs kennedy said mr douglas gently everybody makes mistakes i am only very sorry for you all you have suffered perhaps your son has too he loved you he must miss you bitterly he doesn't 
said mrs kennedy with an ominous stiffening of her upper lip he doesn't care he's got esther that is all he wants no i don't think that is all he wants he was a good son you say a good son never ceases to love his mother mrs kennedy i am sure that your son repents what has passed even if he has given no sign if you were to go to him and say mr douglas it ain't any use you mean well but you don't know we ain't that kind of people we never give in i don't want to give in for that matter if walter can get along without me i can get along without him mrs kennedy i had a letter from my mother to-day there were little blisters on the paper where her tears had fallen she wrote i miss you so much my son i miss your voice your face every hour no one can fill your place all good mothers are alike i believe mrs kennedy didn't you miss your boy when he went away for a minute there was no answer then she spoke in a low voice yes mr douglas i did i do i miss him dreadful dreadful i never said so before to a living mortal but it's true sometimes i feel as if i could give most anything to have them all back esther and all she wasn't a bad little creature in some ways i suppose it was hard on her she was very young i might have made more allowances uh, I, I guess i was just jealous walter thought so much of her and then uh, uh, their little baby such a dear little thing as that baby was they called it ellen after me esther suggested that i haven't seen it for two years it used to love to have me nurse it and fuss around it i did set a heap of store by that child i ain't never talked like this so to any one before mr douglas i was real mad when i saw you coming i know the pawtucket crowd think i'm awful hard i s'pose i am it's in my family we're all as hard as flint i ain't very happy though if walter would only let on he cared uh, but he doesn't i believe he does i know he does it would break my heart if my mother were angry with me i'm sure your son feels the same i'm glad you have given me your confidence i shall pray for you i will ask my mother to pray for you you love your son still go to him and tell him so and you will find that his mother has never lost her place in his heart there was a silence in the dim room the last faint gleams of light fell over the bowed gray head by the window he was a wise and clear-sighted young minister in spite of his youth he knew when enough had been said he read the twenty-third psalm and made a simple earnest prayer then he went away with a cheery good-bye mrs kennedy went with him to the door and watched him as he walked erectly down the garden path with the rough wind of the autumn night swirling the wrinkled brown leaves about his feet she did not go back into the house instead she carefully closed the hall door behind her and sat down on the step wrapping her red knitted shawl tightly around her sharp shoulders she sat there in the dark for a long while her thin pinched face looked more thin and pinched than ever in the faint cold light of the fall evening all the warm red glow of sunset had faded out of the sky there was only one savage fiery streak that ran low along the west against which a row of grim fire came out with black spectral distinctness the sky was all curdled over with little rolls of gray clouds between which a few pale stars glimmered uncertainly the chilly wind moaned around the house and the maple tree by the door tossed its gaunt branches wildly as if some passionate ghostly thing were wringing its fleshless hands in agony the row of lombardies at the foot of the garden stood up like a line of rigid sentinels the gate creaked dismally as it wavered to and fro in the raw gusts 
and the leaves went eddying fitfully up and down the paths in weird uncanny dances of their own the whole outdoor world was bleak and unlovely in its leaflessness and gloom to the old woman crouching on the doorstep it seemed the outward type of her own lonely loveless life she shivered and drew her shawl closer around her it's awful cold and raw to-night she muttered thinking aloud as was her habit since she had lived alone i believe it'll snow before long i wish it would i'm sick and tired of those old bare fields i don't know what makes me so miserable to-night i don't know what there was in that young minister to stir me up so he didn't say much he only looked it i don't know but what he's right i wish he was i wish walter did care it was mostly my fault i was a cantankerous fault-finding old thing i needn't have been so hard on esther i guess mr douglas's mother wouldn't have been i'd do different if i had the chance over again i just wonder what walter would say if i were to go right down there now i guess he'd stare i suppose esther wouldn't let him speak to me though i guess she's pretty bitter i suppose it ain't much wonder if she is i believe i would go if i thought it would be any use walter's light gleamed suddenly out away down at the foot of the long hill she looked at it a minute uncertainly then she got up in a quick decided way and went into the house it was very dark and silent miranda had gone out there was nothing alive in the house but herself she lit a candle and went into the bedroom off the parlor it was a small and immaculate apartment she looked at herself in the scroll-framed mirror by the pale flickering light. "'I look awful cross and disagreeable,' she muttered. "'I am fearful wrinkled. It's all come these last two years, I guess. I don't look much like a minister's mother. I know what she's like as well as if I saw her. She's one of them little women with soft, scrimpy hair and brown eyes like his.' and she'd wear something soft gray silk maybe and have a lace ruffle at her neck and her smile will be like his no i guess we don't look much alike she smiled bitterly at her reflected self in fancy she saw the sweet mild face of the minister's mother beside her own could that far away unknown woman ever treat her son as she had treated walter there's a big difference in mothers she said aloud i am on the wrong side of the difference too it's too late to learn it now but perhaps not too late i shall go and see walter if he does care anything for me i shall find it out if he doesn't i'll find that out too and so much the better she put on her best bonnet and shawl she blew out the light and put the matches by it on the table, ready for lighting. She locked the front door and put the key under the step. Miranda'll find it there, but I guess I'll be back before she is. I won't stay long, maybe. I guess I'm an old fool to go, but I don't want to look at that minister's eyes again and not be able to say I've done my part. I'd hate to have him contrasting me with his own mother. I declare I'm scared to go. I wonder what they will think. I expect Esther will look me over in that top lofty way of hers. If I stay here much longer thinking of it, I'll get too nervous to go at all. She went down the path with a little determined rush. The wind swirled her black skirt about her, and the leaves fled elfishly before her feet. There was a short cut down through the fields to the corners, and she took it, hurrying breathlessly along as if trying to get ahead of her own thoughts and fears it was very dark and bleak the moon had not risen and the night was full of weird eerie sounds the creaking of boughs above her the moaning of the wind in the dark treetops the nestling of dead leaves the vibrations of strips of dried bark on the rail fences 
i never was out in such a ghostly night she panted timorously she was out of breath when she got to walter's door she paused panting i don't dare knock she murmured supposing walter should come and when he saw who it was shut the door in my face or if esther should come i've a notion to go right back she hesitated wavering off and on the steps a dark silhouette came out against the white blind it was the restless curly head of a little child she rapped on the door there was a moment's silence within and then the sound of coming footsteps the door opened and walter stood in the doorway peering curiously out the rush of light over his shoulder fell on the little shrinking figure and the anxious uplifted face walter's look of curiosity gave way to one of astonishment and alarm mother is it you is there anything wrong no no walter nothing she said hurriedly the naturalness of his words gave her courage it's only i got so lonesome up there miranda went out and i thought i'd run down and see you come right in ma said walter heartily but dazedly he stepped aside to let her pass the room was warm and lighted the tea-table was spread and esther was sitting at it she was a young pretty woman with a rather careworn face she got up and came over to meet mrs kennedy why why i declare mother i'm glad to see you sit up to the fire it's real chilly out tonight isn't it i shouldn't wonder if we'd have snow we're just at tea you see i suppose you've had yours over hours ago walter was away and we waited for him uh, maybe you'll sit in and have a cup of tea with us she spoke nervously and hurriedly as if trying to bridge over an awkward situation gracefully the baby was holding her dress and peering around her at its grandmother with its round dark eyes walter stood foolishly in the background he felt in the way i should think you'd feel more like turning me out of doors esther said mrs kennedy tremulously i expected nothing else i guess you ain't overjoyed to see me esther's lips were quivering don't talk so mother we ain't got no hard feelings walter and me let me take your bonnet no said mrs kennedy resolutely not till i've said what i've come here to say esther i'm real ashamed of the way i acted to you i was a mean spiteful old thing it ain't much wonder that you and walter got your backs up i'd do different if i'd had another chance if you and walter can just forgive me esther knelt and put her arms about the bowed figure don't mother i've been so ashamed too i didn't behave right mother i've done some thinking since i came here i guess i've got a little more sense i ain't never forgot how you said i'd come between you and walter it was true and i had no right to i was real sassy and nasty to you and walter he's most fretted to death you don't know how bad he's felt i've coaxed him to go up and see you but he said it was no use i didn't dare go alone pa tucker folk said you was so bitter against us she laid her head in the older woman's lap mrs kennedy stroked the fair waves of the hair with gentle fingers i'm real glad that you and me's friends again esther i've missed you awful seemed as if i could never get over wanting to see that blessed baby around the house it's awful lonesome up there i wish you were all back we wouldn't quarrel again walter came forward and put the baby into his mother's lap then he stooped and kissed her that kiss meant much for walter was not a demonstrative man he had not kissed his mother since childhood it was quite late when mrs kennedy went home the wind had died away the moon had risen touching the hills with silvery glory 
and casting twinkling shadows of bare boughs and twig tracery over the wood path mrs kennedy stepped along briskly and cheerfully a light was gleaming from her house up on the hill there was a smile on her face as she thought of the near future the future which she was to share with walter and esther and the baby and in the background of her dreams glimmered the ideal of a sweet approving face a face with tender brown eyes framed in waves of soft silver sprinkled hair i guess the minister's mother would be glad if she knew all her son has done for me whispered mrs kennedy softly End of section five section six of uncollected short stories of l m montgomery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america uncollected short stories of l m montgomery by lucy maud montgomery old hector's dog first published in golden days for boys and girls june fourth eighteen ninety eight his name was trey the old hector truly thought i believe that he was the most wonderful dog in the world as well as the handsomest for love is blind and old hector loved trey the dog was all he had to love nobody in swamp hollow knew very much about old hector as he was commonly called although he had lived among us for more years than we boys could count he was always old hector to us nothing more a morose surly old man with a gruff voice and a chronic scowl he lived by himself in a little cabin on a back road and made his scanty living by day labor in summer and shoe mending in winter he had no kilth or kin in the world as far as we ever found out and the only living creature that belonged to him was trey a dog so unlovable that nobody but old hector could have endured such an animal about his premises we swamp hollow boys had vowed mortal enmity to trey partly because we all heartily detested old hector and partly because trey himself never lost an opportunity of being disagreeable he was a lank yellow cur with torn ears and the merest apology for a tail he had fought with and maimed nearly every other dog in swamp hollow and was even accused of sheep raiding but this was never proved and i think we did trey an injustice there wherever hector went trey followed him shuffling along with his ears hanging down and his eyes watching out for stray cats or any other promising game we boys had discovered that the surest way to annoy hector was to tease trey nothing made him so angry and to make old hector mad was one of our objects in life nevertheless we were rather frightened of him and took care to keep out of his reach why we detested the poor old man so would be hard to tell for he had never done us any harm or interfered with us in any way except by abusing roundly any one he caught shying a stone at trey i for my part am now thoroughly ashamed of the pleasure i used to take in tormenting the old fellow but i had gotten in that summer with a certain crowd of swamp hollow boys who were not the best companions in the world for me they were locally known as roaders from the fact that they all lived along what was known as the swamp hollow road a locality somewhat off cast and numbered about a dozen all between twelve and fifteen years of age they were a rowdy set and at the bottom of most of the mischief that went on in swamp hollow if anybody in the village offended one of them he generally found his windows broken or his orchard raided or his cows turned into his wheat field not long after the guilt could seldom be brought home to any one in particular but the roaders came to be in bad repute in swamp hollow it is not to my credit that i got mixed up with them but the fact remains that i was although i was always regarded with suspicion by most of them they thought me off color and miss nancy-ish and i was only tolerated among them on account of my chumship with ted thompson ted was the ringleader of the gang and to a certain extent they were under his control although ted was really not at all responsible for their worst outrages he was fond of playing pranks 
but he was always against wanton destruction of property. Ted had a bad reputation in Swamp Hollow, and perhaps he deserved it, but I always liked him. He was about fifteen and had had a rough bringing up. He was generally in mischief and got the blame of all the Roders' outrages, whether he was a sharer in them or not. Still, he was kind-hearted in his own way, and generally stood up for the weaker side manfully. He certainly had considerable influence over the Roders. He was a good friend, but a bad enemy, and he had taken a bitter hatred against old Hector. One night somebody had thrown a stone through old Hector's window while he was at supper, smashing the panes and some of the few dishes on the table. It probably was a Roder, but it certainly was not Ted. He denied it stoutly, and I never knew Ted Thompson, with all his faults, to tell a deliberate lie. But old Hector had seen him prowling around the road that evening at dusk, and fixed on him as the culprit. The next evening several of us were hanging around the blacksmith's forge, Ted among the rest, when old Hector and Trey came along. I do not think the old man intended to stop, but Ted could not resist the temptation to shy a stone at Trey, who promptly yelped and old Hector turned furiously on Ted. He stormed at him for fully five minutes, and finally ended up dealing him a stinging cuff on the ear. Ted attempted no reprisal at the time, for there were no rotors handy to back him up, and he knew that public sympathy was against him. But he laid himself out for the remainder of the summer to make old Hector's life a burden to him. I am bound to say he succeeded. He was never at a loss for some new and original device but his main idea of revenge centered in Trey. He had made up his mind to get possession of Trey, by fair means or foul, and though he refused to tell us what he would do with him, we all supposed that Trey's career would be abruptly closed. It was, however, no easy matter to ensnare Trey. He was never seen abroad without his master, for he seemed to be instinctively aware of his unpopularity, and no one, not even the most reckless roader, dared venture within twenty yards of old hector's dwelling in daylight trey was never seen outside after dark and slept on a mat by the old man's bed but ted declared that he would get him if it took all summer some of the roaders suggested putting poison around where trey would find it but ted scorned this idea it was sneaky he said ted had his own code of honor and such as it was he lived up to it although he did plenty of things i thought it shady between abducting and drowning Trey, as I believed Ted meant to do, although he had never said so, and poisoning him off, I did not see a great deal of difference. But Ted appeared to, and stoutly refused to have anything to do with such a proceeding. And don't any of you chaps try it on, either, he warned the roaders. This is my affair. I've got the grudge to settle against old Hector, and I don't want any of the rest of you poking in and spoiling my fun. Do you hear that? The roaders heard and governed themselves accordingly, while Ted bided his time with a patience worthy of a better cause. One day, old Hector made a trip to town to buy some of his scanty supplies. For a wonder, he left Trey at home, owing, as we afterwards found, to the animals having a sore foot locked up in his little kitchen. Ted Thompson found this out in some way, and had no idea of letting so good a chance slip. He hunted up a rotor or two who could keep a secret, and with their assistance got into old Hector's kitchen by the shed window, secured Trey with a rope and gunny bag, and lugged him off with them. I was not with them, so I knew nothing of the affair until old Hector came down to the forge that night to hunt for Trey. He had missed his pet whenever he got home, and was in great distress of mind. As usual, there was a crowd about the forge and Ted Thompson, his black eyes shining with some secret delight, was sitting on the fence. Several roaders were hanging around to see the fun. "'Did any of you unsee my dog hereabouts?' demanded old Hector, glaring savagely at us all, and at Ted in particular. The smith replied, "'No, haven't laid eyes on him. Have you lost him?' "'He's gone,' said the old man in a strange, piteous tone. "'I don't know why. I left him.' When I went to town today, and when I came home, he was gone. He never went off on his own, I'm sure. Poor Trey, I believe some of you boys there know where he is. If you do, tell me where. He ain't never done you any harm. 
the old man's slip heel touched me i had never seen old hector in so gentle a mood before his distress and grief were very real and keen but ted's eyes only glistened more maliciously i guess you won't ever see that old yeller dog of yours again he called out tauntingly he's gone for good he is old hector made a quick step towards him but the wary ted dodged what have you done with him you imp of evil cried the old man i might a known it was you tell me whar he is well i guess i don't i ain't responsible for the whereabouts of your old cur you can go and hunt him up oh tell me where he is pleaded old hector with wonderful patience he never harmed you the poor dog surely you hain't killed him have you ted winked with inexpressible impudence trey is gone and you can make up your mind to that and he won't come back in a hurry neither next time you box people's ears that haven't done anything to you you can think of trey so you did it out of spite said hector his anger mastering his grief i'll learn you he made a dash at ted but the latter leaped from his perch with a mocking whoop and went flying down the road the rotors finding themselves deserted also took to their heels and disappeared after their leader in a cloud of dust the other man sympathized with the old man and promised to help him find his dog if they could some eyed me suspiciously for my intimacy with the rotors was well known but i was not molested i too felt sorry for old hector that evening i met ted about dusk and tried to find out what he'd done with the dog ted grinned you'd like to know now wouldn't you sonny what'd you do if i told you run and blab I indignantly disclaimed all intention of blabbing, and after a while Ted became more communicative. You won't tell? No, I'll never breathe a word. Honest? Honest. Well, the dog's alive. I've got him chained up in a safe enough place. Never mind where. I ain't going to tell you that, because you're too soft-hearted. Old Hector's mind would be kind of at rest if he thought Trey was dead, so I mean to keep him stirred up. Look here, I'm going to stick this up on Hector's door after dark. This was a half sheet of paper, upon which Ted had scrawled the following. To old Hector, my dear sir, your dog ain't dead, but he'd be a heap better off if he was. He ain't very happy. You won't ever see him again. Yours respectfully, Ted Thompson. That will make the poor old man feel bad, Ted, I objected. He'll think you're ill-treating the dog. You're not, are you? no i ain't you silly the dog's as well off as he ever was i just wrote that to tease hector it'll put him in a stew what are you going to do with trey but ted not having found me as sympathetic as he expected got on his dignity he refused to say more and we parted for the next week old hector's state of mind ought to have satisfied the most inveterate seeker after revenge he could do nothing but go about mourning for his loss and seeking pitifully for some trace of Trey. Ted and the other rotors kept well out of his way. I had not seen one of them since my last recorded interview with Ted. There came a change at the end of the week. As I was not one of the parties interested, I think I had better give you the story in Ted's own words, as he told it to me when I went to see him. He was lying on the sofa with his ankle bandaged up and another bandage around his head. You see, Hal, it happened this way. Last Monday night after dark, I went up to take that wretched tray something to eat. We had him chained up in that old barn of Maloney's, back of the woods. Nobody ever goes near it, because they say it's haunted. So it is, I guess, by us roaders. Well, we had him there, and I fed him well, anyhow. I'll bet he'd better meals, and more of them than he ever had at home. I really meant to let him go back after a while when I'd made old Hector miserable long enough. Coming back, I took a short cut across the fields. Back of Hector's, it was awful dark, and I had to go through Patterson's sheep pasture. You know, he had a well dug down in the hollow for his sheep. It ain't a very deep one, but just the same, a fellow wouldn't jump down it for pure fun. It went dry this summer, and before that he kept it covered up with boards. I'd clean forgotten all about the well, and I was running full tilt across the hollow when kerblunk! I just felt myself pitching headlong, and when I came to my right senses, there I was, at the bottom of Patterson's well. It wasn't very deep, as I've said, and nothing in it but mud. So I wasn't killed. 
but my head and face were all cut and my ankle felt dreadful i didn't know what i had done to it but i was afraid it was broken the blood was running all over my face and i thought i'd die there all alone in the dark i knew i couldn't get out and i might yell all night and nobody'd hear me i tell you hal i felt pretty bad and upon my word the thing that worried me most was that poor old tray i did wish i'd never touched him i can tell you it seemed an awful mean trick all at once especially when i remembered poor old hector's trouble about him i huddled up there feeling as if i was going to die right off i shouted as loud as i could now and then nobody came of course i think i was there about an hour i couldn't move because my ankle hurt so and oh how my head did ache all at once just as i'd had another spell of shouting a light flashed overhead and next minute i saw who do you suppose why old hector peering down at the top with a lantern close to his face i was glad to see any one but you'd better believe i thought my chances for getting out of the well weren't very much better than before and small blame to him if they hadn't been who's down there he asked i hollered back that it was ted thompson and then i tumbled down and broke my ankle i honestly expected to see him march off then and there but the old fellow said you poor boy how am i to get you up out of that can you help hold on until i run down home and get a ladder i'll be as quick as i can i said i could and off he went in no time he was back with a ladder he poked it down just as careful and down he came too poor little chap he said and he picked me up as if i'd been a baby you know how strong he is hal and so carefully and tender like he hardly hurt me a bit and somehow or another he climbed up with me and we got out then he carried me all the way down to his cabin and laid me on his bed he was just awful good to me hal he got hot water and washed the blood off my face and then he poked around my ankle and said he didn't think any bones were broken and he bound it up and do you know when i'd flinch there'd actually be tears in his eyes he couldn't have fixed me up better or petted me more if i'd been trey himself i didn't dare to mention trey at first you bet i felt small here i'd been plaguing the life out of old hector for months and breaking his heart by stealing his dog this was how he was paying me back i just felt mean there was no use in talking i'd never have believed old hector could be so kind he wasn't a single bit cross or gruff he did everything he could to make me easy and then he said now i'm going to run down and let your father know where you are and how are you fixed how'd you come to fall in patterson's well anyhow i just made up my mind to make a clean breast of it there and then i said i'd been up to maloney's barn to feed trey old hector gave a big jump is trey alive is he is he you bet he is i said and likely to live i've looked after him well and i've doctored his foot too i'd have never taken him if i'd known i'm awful sorry but he's all right please do forgive me just fancy hal if any of the roaders had heard me asking old hector's pardon do you know the tears actually ran down his face poor old trey safe safe was all he could say at first he was just overcome with joy and he didn't say a cross word to me he went down to our place and dad came after me with the cart and got me home somehow i gave hector the key of trey's padlock and he shuffled off to maloney's barn to get him i'd have given a pile to see the meeting anyhow he's got trey again do you know the old fellow has been down every day to see how i am getting on and he's not a bad sort at all i'm ashamed of my cuttings up and i'm going to reform sure as you're alive don't blab all this to the roaders though hal ted kept his word indeed he really became quite intimate with old hector and frequently accompanied him on his fishing and gunning expeditions the rest of the roaders also although they always remained shy of their ancient enemy were influenced by ted to such a degree that they gave up molesting old hector hector himself perhaps through his liking for ted grew much more sociable and we found that under his gruff exterior was hidden a warm kindly heart he never had much use for any roader except ted but to the more respectable of the Swamp Hollow boys, he became quite friendly. Ted gradually weaned himself away from his old associates and eventually became such a peaceable, well-behaved boy 
that people forgot that he had ever been a roader at all as for trey i regret to say that his disposition remained the same he was snappish and unamiable till the end but as that was his constitutional misfortune we overlooked it and refrained from molesting him when he died of old age hector mourned him sincerely and he and ted buried him under the old willow in hector's yard and as a proof of the changes time can bring a number of us swamp hollow boys went to the funeral end of section six section seven of uncollected short stories of l m montgomery this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Holland Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery Section 7 A New Fashion Flavoring First published in Golden Days for Boys and Girls, August 27, 1898 When Mrs. Clay went to pay a long-promised visit to her sister, it was not without some misgivings that she left her household in charge of Edmund and Ivy. To be sure, Ivy could be trusted. She was fifteen and had been her mother's right hand for years. But Edmund, who was sixteen and ought to have had more sense than Ivy, but hadn't, was prone to tricks and nonsense, and all the rest of the little clays, around half dozen in number, were noted for the numerous scrapes they contrived to get into daily nevertheless mrs clay stifled her doubts and went away for a week burdening edmund and ivy with so many charges and reminders that they forgot half of them before she was fairly out of the gate edmund was deputed to kindle fires chop wood feed the pig bring in water and last but not least he was to look after the youthful clays and keep them in order ivy was to do the housework and see that the children were kept comparatively clean and mended and keep a wary eye on things in general and if anything dreadful should happen warned their mother be sure to send for me at once be careful of the fires ivy and edmund never you try to light one with kerosene i expect in the end to come home and find the house burned to the ground or half the children killed that isn't the right spirit to go on a visit in mother said edmund he was sitting on the edge of the wood box whittling over the floor just make up your mind to enjoy yourself don't worry about us we'll be all right i give you my word everything will go swimmingly i'll keep the kids straight and ivy too if she gets fighting you can depend on me mother i know just how much dependence is to be placed on you edmund replied his mother severely now do behave yourself while i'm away and don't call your brothers and sisters kids well i'm sure i can't call them lambs anyhow just listen to that as a crash and a scream sounded in an adjoining room fan and reeve have gone over on the rocking chair again there won't be a whole piece of furniture left in this establishment by another month altogether as has been said mrs clay did not leave home in a very easy state of mind nevertheless the clay household got on wonderfully well edmund behaved himself tolerably well and attended to his man-of-the-house duties with praiseworthy diligence moreover he kept the younger clays within reasonable bounds and refused to aid or abet them in making nuisances of themselves he studied hard in the long evenings after fan and reeve and kitty and joe and frank and bobby had been tucked away in their beds and ivy had taken her knitting and sat down in the little sitting-room i'd put more heart into it if i thought it would come to anything he said mournfully but it won't no college for me i'll have to leave school in the spring and pitch into earning my own living and helping you folks along it's tough on a fellow to be poor don't i envy scott dawson he's going to college next fall it's too bad you can't go ed said ivy sympathizingly you're ever so much smarter than scott dawson but i don't suppose we could ever manage it i know that well enough let a fellow complain a bit will you it eases me no i won't whine when it comes to the point i'll get all that done beforehand and you'll see me grinning over the counter as if i were the happiest fellow in the world 
If we were not so awfully poor, Ivy, or if the good old days of fairies and three wishes had gone by, what would you go in for? Music, answered Ivy with a little sigh. Oh, dear me, I'd just love to be a good violinist, but that cost money, too, so I needn't think of it. If that blessed Uncle Eugene of ours wasn't such a miserly old crank, continued Edmund, he might help us along a bit. He isn't much like a storybook uncle, is he, Ivy? I'd like to meet him, just to see what he's like. I wouldn't, said Ivy emphatically, if he's as cranky in particular as Mother says he is. And he behaved abominably to Father when they had that dispute over the property. No, I don't want to see Uncle Eugene. If I did, I should be apt to flare out and tell him what I thought of him. It's a mercy there's no fear of us seeing him. He wouldn't come here for anything. You don't know. It's always the unexpected that happens, replied Edmund oracularly. Wouldn't it be a joke if he were to come now when Mother is away? If the kids, I beg your pardon, I mean my hopeful brothers and sisters, behave as they usually do when we have company, how it would horrify him. Old bachelors generally know all about how children should be trained, and I've no doubt Uncle Eugene's an aggravated specimen. The Clays were undeniably poor. Mr. Clay had died some five years before, leaving his family but scantily provided for. Mrs. Clay had hard work to make both ends meet. Being a woman of resource and thrift, she accomplished it, but luxuries were unknown in the little household. Yet they were happy in spite of their poverty. Edmund's college course had to be given up. He was to take a position as clerk in a dry goods store in the spring. Ivy had her own deprivations, of which she said little. She buried music dreams in the recesses of her heart, and made over her dresses and wore her hats three seasons with smiling sweetness. I think, on the whole, they enjoyed life quite as well as richer people. Only, as Edmund said, a little more cash would not have been an overwhelming inconvenience. I tell you what, Ivy, said Edmund on Saturday afternoon as he banged down a load of wood with a deafening crash and sent a shower of dust over the dishes Ivy had so carefully wiped. I'm glad Mother's coming home Monday when all's said and done. We've got a long tip-top to be sure, but the cares of being at the head of family affairs have weighed me down so heavily this week that I feel like an old man. We've been fortunate so far in that we've had no visitors, but they'll be sure to come today. Just our Saturday luck. Mercy, I hope not. I'm so busy. I'm determined that Mother shall find this house in spick and span order when she comes home, so I'm having a grand rummage. This cupboard has to be put to rights, and I've fifty other things to do, and I've got the most dreadful cold in the head. I can scarcely breathe. Goodness, Ed, that's never a knock at the door. But it is. Ten to one it's Aunt Lucinda Perkins come to stay over Sunday. Ed, you must go to the door, said Ivy, with dismayed remembrance of her wet apron and generally disorderly appearance. And whoever it is, show them to the sitting room. Don't dare to take anyone into the parlor, for Reeve and Robbie got in there this morning to play shop before I discovered them, and it's in an awful mess. Ivy listened anxiously as Edmund went to the door. The visitor's tones were masculine, and she breathed a sigh of relief that it was not Aunt Perkins anyhow, but her complacency was of short duration. When Edmund had shown the caller into the sitting room and returned to the kitchen, Ivy divined that the something dreadful had happened at last. Ivy, the Philistines be upon thee, said Edmund, with a solemnity belied by his dancing eyes, eyes that plainly indicated his enjoyment of the whole situation. Is it Aunt Perkins, after all? It's worse than ten Aunt Perkinses. Ivy Clay, in that room, at this very minute, sits our respected Uncle Eugene. Mercy on us exclaimed ivy and then collapsed sitting down on the wood box don't take a fit sis when i opened the door there he stood as grim as you please is your mother at home boy he asked no sir she isn't i replied well i'm her brother-in-law eugene clay he said and i've come to see her as i have to wait a few hours here for my train whereat i gasped out oh and towed him into the room feeling decidedly faint my part's done. Now, Ivy, it's your turn. 
sail in gracefully and bid him welcome to the house of clay in this mess i can't declared ivy well no you'll have to fix up a bit brush your hair and so forth do the thing up in good style ivy i'm going to peek through the crack and watch the interview edmund implored ivy beginning to recover her equanimity don't do anything dreadful now will you don't make me laugh or anything like that bless you no i'll be a model nephew i'm properly scared i tell you don't i look pale all i'm afraid of ivy is that uncle eugene will get alarmed and run for all the kids are in the room above his head and are making a most unearthly racket if some of them come crashing through the ceiling it's no more than i expect oh ed do go and make them stop my head is just in a whirl oh if mother were only home do help me out of this scrape like a dear boy what does he look like who uncle eugene oh he's not too savage more civilized looking than i had expected well i'll go and make those little clays up there toned down before his nervous system is utterly wrecked you pretty yourself up ivy and beard the lion in his den as if you liked it don't let him suspect what a martyr you are to family ties poor ivy hurriedly brushed her rebellious curls into place replaced her soiled apron by an immaculate white one and with her heart in her mouth but looking very pretty and housewifely nevertheless contrived she never knew how to get into the sitting-room and say how do you do uncle eugene i am glad to see you hoping she would be forgiven for the atrocious fib are you returned uncle eugene grimly so your mother isn't home hey no she's visiting aunt mary she expects to be home on monday was that your brother who opened the door yes that is edmund my older brother won't you take off your overcoat sir of course you'll stay to tea said ivy devoutly hoping he wouldn't well yes i suppose i will if you'll get me an early one train leaves at four thirty i can't wait over sorry your mother is away how many are there of you eight <laughs> i should have thought there were four times eight by the noise that was going on overhead when i came in so you're housekeeper at present you look like your mother uncle eugene slowly divested himself of his handsome light overcoat he was a tall man of about fifty with grizzled hair and a clean-shaven face he had a hard mouth and deep-set eyes ivy with a covert glance around the room was thankful to see it was comparatively neat a sudden calm had succeeded edmund's entrance overhead his measures whatever they were must have been sudden and effective there said uncle eugene depositing himself comfortably in a rocker by the fire that will do i dare say you're busy so don't let me detain you you needn't think you're in duty bound to entertain me in fact i'd prefer you wouldn't thus abruptly dismissed ivy gladly left her grim uncle to the charms of solitude and hastened to the kitchen where she found edmund scrubbing the hands and faces of all the little clays not one of whom dared whimper under the operation for they realized that edmund meant business hello ivy you didn't take long to dispose of him did he bite oh don't edmund this is no joking matter no indeed it's a serious case don't i look as if it were ed he's going to stay to tea and he wants it early what can we give him to eat what other people eat i suppose or has he some abnormal appetite that craves i mean there's nothing baked in the house only loaf bread i was so busy this morning i thought i wouldn't make cake and i've heard mother say what an epicure uncle eugene was i'm going right to work to make a layer cake it won't take long but i shall have to hurry and there is the quince preserve that'll have to do you'd better go in with him ed not i i'll have to fly round to the grocery for butter do you want anything else no don't bother me replied ivy who was scurrying in and out of the pantry with a bowl and a flour scoop edmund proved himself a tower of strength he finished putting the little clays in order and then went around to the grocery with a rush on his return he found ivy whipping up her cake energetically it's all ready for the flavoring ed just hand me the bottle of vanilla out of the pantry will you it's on the second shelf edmund dived into the pantry and returned with the vanilla bottle 
rushing off again to settle a noisy dispute between Frank and Bobby in the hall. Ivy measured out and stirred in a generous spoonful of vanilla, filled her pans, and triumphantly banged the oven door upon them. Now, I do hope it will turn out well. I'll whip up a bit of frosting for the top. What a blessing those children are behaving so well. If they only keep it up at tea time. Ivy began to set the tea table, stepping briskly in and out of the room. She saw with dismay that Joe had strayed in somehow and was actually perched on Uncle Eugene's knee in earnest conversation with him. Now, Joe Clay was six years old, and not having arrived at years of discretion, was justly regarded as the infant terrible of the family. He could not keep either his own secrets or those of other people, and Ivy was on thorns, for there was no knowing what revelations Joe might be making to Uncle Eugene. She hoped devoutly that he had not overheard any of her or Edmund's remarks, for they would be fatally sure to be recounted. In vain, she surreptitiously beckoned Joe out of the room. Joe refused to heed her, and once Uncle Eugene saw her and said, Leave him alone. We're all right. After which she gave up in despair, although in her pilgrimages, in and out, she caught scraps of Joe's remarks about music and Ed wanting to do college that made her groan. Ivy set the table daintily with spotless cloth and shining china, and put an apple geranium in pinkish bloom in the center. The loaf bread was cut in the thinnest of slices. The quince preserve was dished in an old-fashioned cut glass bowl, and her cake came out of the oven as light and puffy as down. Just the best of luck, Ed, said Ivy delightedly as she clapped the layers together with ruby jelly, whisked the frosting over the top, and sprinkled grated coconut on it. Isn't that pretty? I hope it'll taste as good as it looks. Now, Ed, I'll take in the tea and you take in the children and get them settled in their places. Keep an eye on them, too. I'll have enough to attend to. And, oh, Ed, Joe's been sitting on Uncle Eugene's knee for an hour, and I know he's been telling him a fearful lot of stuff. Why couldn't you have decoyed him out? Didn't dare. I'll bet Uncle Eugene knows everything about our family kinks by this time. Never mind. Come on. Charge, Ivy, charge. We'll win the day with the last words of Edmund Clay. Edmund marshaled the little Clay soberly in and arranged them in order at the tea table. Uncle Eugene sat down and Ivy poured out the tea with fear and trembling. But all went well at first. The tea and preserves were good and the children behaved beautifully. Uncle Eugene said absolutely nothing. He evidently considered silence to be golden. Then Edmund, in obedience to a nod from Ivy, gravely passed the layer cake to his uncle, after which it went the rounds of the appreciative little clays. Ivy took none. She was too tired and worried to eat, but Edmund helped himself to a generous slice. When he had tasted it, he laid down his fork, rolled up his eyes, and opened both his hands in exaggerated dismay for Ivy's benefit. Bobby Clay followed with, why, Ivy, what's the matter with the layer cake? Edmund silenced him with such an awful look that none of the others dared open their lips, though each, after the first mouthful, left their cake uneaten on their plates. Uncle Eugene, however, appeared to taste nothing unusual, for he gravely ate his cake with an impassive face and finished the last crumb. Frank sat to the right of the agonized Ivy, too far away to explain, but by his pantomime he conveyed the fact that something serious was the matter. Finally, she took a peek of the triangle of cake on Reeve's plate next to her. She gave a gasp, a look at Edmund, and then, sad to relate, burst into a ringing peal of laughter, which coming after the dead silence was electrical in effect. She caught herself up with a scarlet face and in quick transition felt so much like crying that she might have done so if Uncle Eugene had not abruptly pushed back his chair and announced that he had had enough. Ivy fled to the kitchen, whither she was followed by Edmund with all the little clay swarming after him. Ivy, demanded Edmund tragically, what in the world did you put in that cake? Never tasted anything like it in the cooking line before. Oh, Ed, how could you do such a thing, cried poor Ivy hysterically. I can never forgive you, and after promising you wouldn't play any tricks, too. 
Me? exclaimed Edmund, too surprised to be grammatical. Goodness, what have I done? Oh, don't pretend innocence. I suppose you thought it a very smart trick to hand me out a bottle of anodyne liniment to flavor that cake with, but I call it mean. Edmund stared at her blankly for a minute, and then flung himself on the sofa and went off into a burst of laughter that made the kitchen re-echo. Oh, he cried, Ivy Adela Clay, you don't mean to say you flavored that cake with anodyne liniment? Ho, 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 if that isn't an original idea. I always knew you were a genius, Ivy. How could you, Edmund? Edmund sat up. Ivy, I give you my word of honor. I didn't do it on purpose, he said solemnly. I thought it was vanilla. Honest, I did. Why, it was in a vanilla bottle, and it's just the same color. Yes, don't you remember Reeve broke the liniment bottle last week, and I put what wasn't spilled into an old vanilla bottle? Oh, dear me, this is dreadful. You're to blame, then? Why didn't you put it out of the way? How is a fellow to tell? And how is it you didn't smell it? I couldn't with such a cold. Oh, Edmund, what must Uncle Eugene think? Dear no, said Edmund, going off into another paroxysm. I suppose the poor man will think we were trying to poison him, unless he happened to recognize the taste. Fortunately, the liniment is for internal as well as external application, so nobody will die. Well, this is the latest. Flavoring a cake with anodyne liniment. Well done, Ivy. Will we... Do you think we ought to say anything to Uncle Eugene about it? Goodness, no. Perhaps he didn't suspect anything amiss. He ate every crumb of it, so doubtless he imagined it was the newest thing in flavoring extracts. Your reputation as a cook would be gone forever if you let him know, Ivy. Well, said Ivy disconsolately, it's done now, and it can't be undone. Fortunately, as you say, it was harmless, but the whole thing is simply dreadful. What will Mother say? Accidents will happen, even in a well-regulated family like ours. Go and clear off the ruins, Ivy, and feed that liniment cake to the pig. Uncle Eugene will never be any the wiser. Alas, when Ivy summoned up enough courage to return to the room and attack the table, what was her horror to find Joe delightedly telling all the details to Uncle Eugene? Ivy called the fatal word liniment and mentally collapsed. She must apologize somehow. Uncle Eugene, she stammered with a scarlet face, her confusion not calmed in any degree by a glimpse of Edmund gesticulating wildly in the back hall. I'm very sorry. That cake shouldn't have tasted as it did. I meant to put in vanilla, but Edmund made a mistake and somehow... Well, I put in a spoonful of anodyne liniment instead. It won't hurt anyone. You know, it's sometimes taken internally. But not in cakes, came a stage whisper from the back hall. Ivy gave up trying to explain, and in spite of her efforts, gave vent to something that couldn't be called anything but a snicker. As for Uncle Eugene, his eyes twinkled quite genially, but all he said was, Accidents will happen and Ivy went out, considerably mystified as to what effect the disclosure had had on him. Soon after, he looked at his watch, said it was nearly train time, and put on his coat. He shook hands with Ivy and Edmund, told them to tell their mother he was sorry not to have seen her, and relieved the clay mansion of his unwelcome presence. "'Thank goodness,' said Edmund emphatically when he had seen him safely out of the gate. "'The old crank is gone.' I guess he won't come back in a hurry. I should say liniment-flavored cake was an excellent preventative of unwelcome guests. What an opinion he must have of us. You are always doing something brilliant, Ivy, but you've surpassed yourself in this exploit. When Mrs. Clay returned home on Monday, she listened to the tale with a curious mixture of dismay and amusement. I wish I had been home, she said. I can't think what induced him to come. He once said he'd never darken our doors again. I suppose I ought to be thankful to find you all alive and sound of limb. But it's a pity Uncle Eugene should have come when I was away. I expect he's gone for good now, Ivy, after what you gave him to eat, poor man. I know how Uncle Eugene would regard anything like that. But she didn't. 
Next week a letter came from her brother-in-law, short and abrupt as was his fashion, but the contents were satisfactory. It ran, Sister Martha, doubtless this will impress you. I called at your house last week and found you away. However, your son and daughter entertained me very hospitably, and I was much pleased with them both, but especially with the girl. The boy, I take it, is somewhat mischievous and likes to tease his sister. I dare say they think I am a crusty old fellow, and they are right, but I desire to make amends for the past if you will let bygones be bygones. I am a lonely man, and I want to have some interest outside myself. Edmund and Ivy did not tell me about your concerns, but I picked up an inkling from little Joe. Tell Edmund he is not to go into that store, but to prepare for college next fall, and I will put him through. I have nothing else to do with my money, and you must gratify me in this whim. As for Ivy, you may tell her she is to take music lessons, and I will send her the best violin to be had. She is a good housewifely girl. Tell her also that her liniment cake seems to have had an excellent effect on her cranky old uncle, for it appears to have made him well all over, even to his bones and marrow. I may pay you another visit soon. Until then, I remain yours respectfully, Eugene Clay. Uncle Eugene is a brick, exclaimed Edmund breathlessly. A regular brick. I repent in sackcloth and ashes of anything I ever said to the contrary. He is splendid, said Ivy with shining eyes. To think I am to have music lessons and a violin. It is too good to be true. You may well be grateful. It's not every uncle who would behave so handsomely to a girl who gave him liniment cake to eat. What an advertisement this would be for that liniment firm if they got hold of it. A liniment warranted to cure not only every known body ailment, but those of the mind and heart as well. They'd make their fortune. Mother, say something. Relieve your feelings in some way. I say, long live anodyne liniment, said Mrs. Clay, laughing. Your experiment has turned out well this time, Ivy, but I wouldn't advise a repetition. Uncle Eugene was always kind at heart, although peculiar, and now, to prevent any further mistakes, I'll go and put that new-fashioned flavoring of yours out of the vanilla bottle into a more orthodox one. The next time Uncle Eugene comes, I'll make the cake myself. End of section 7、section、eight of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcela Collado. Uncollected short stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 8. A Brave Girl by L. M. Montgomery. First published in Family Herald and Weekly Star, July 19, 1899. Aunt M. was the heroine of the story, and it was she who told it to us on her last visit here. We were all sitting around the fire one evening when Clive, my older brother, came in and said it was the darkest night he had ever been out in. I said I was glad I hadn't gone over to see Kitty Martin that evening as I had intended, since I would have had to come home alone. You wouldn't have been frightened to do that, would you? said Aunt Em. Yes, I would have been scared to death, I admitted frankly. I'm the biggest coward that ever breathed, Aunt Em. Clive here would tell you that. Mother smiled across the table at Auntie. Matt wouldn't ever be able to do what you did for me one time, Emmy, she said. Oh, yes, she would. I was frightened enough, Alice, and you know what a dreadful coward I had always been before that night. Clive and I had scented a story by this time, and we gave Aunt Em no peace until she consented to tell us. I shall try to give it as nearly as possible in her own words. It was thirty years ago, said Aunt Em, settling comfortably back to her knitting. But I'm sure I shall never forget a single incident of that night if I live to be a hundred. I was fourteen years old, and your mother here was eight. We were living on a farm in one of the loneliest, dreariest backcountry places you could imagine. Our nearest neighbor lived three miles away, 
and we were almost surrounded by woods. About six miles away was a little village called Crossroads. Quite a stirring place, we thought, with a church and a store. Father and mother made frequent trips there too, but Alice and I rarely went out of sight from our own farm. We did not even get to school and not often to church. We had no playmates and were often lonely. Our family consisted of father and mother, we two girls, and old Aunt Maragret, as we called her. She was really no relation at all, but a trusted nurse and servant combined, and was as much a part of our household as any of us. We girls were blindly petted and spoiled by her. Looking back now, I cannot say I think she was a judicious friend by any means, for she told us so many tales of fairies and witches and spooks that our heads were full of such nonsense. I, in particular, grew to be dreadfully afraid of the dark. You could not have persuaded me to go into a room without a light, and the mere idea of venturing out of doors alone after nightfall would fill us with terror. I knew I was very foolish, for I did not really believe in Aunt Margaret's stories at all, and I honestly tried to conquer my fears. But I could not succeed, although I was very much ashamed of myself. One day, father and mother started on an expedition to the nearest town about 30 miles away. They intended to remain overnight and return the next day, leaving Alice and me in Aunt Margaret's care. I was very busy all day, for there was an extra amount of work for me to do and left Alice to the care of Aunt Margaret, who was complaining greatly about her rheumatism. Alice had always been a rather delicate child and subject to attacks of croup. It was a cold day for the time of year, with a raw east wind blowing. Alice went out too much in the forenoon and would not wrap herself up. At dinner time I noticed she had a cold, and Aunt Margaret insisted on her staying indoors the rest of the day. She did not seem any worse by night, but Aunt Margaret took her to bed with her, insisting that she could keep her covered up warm better than I could. I went to my own little room over the kitchen and soon fell asleep. I slept soundly for I did not know how long, when I was suddenly awakened by a glare of light in my eyes. Aunt Margaret was standing by my bed with a lamp. Oh, Aunt Margaret, what is the matter? I exclaimed in fright. Aunt Margaret set the lamp down on the table and wrung her hands in a manner that convinced me something serious had happened. Oh, Alice has the croup, she moaned, and she's dreadful bad, all fevered up and clean out of her head. I've done all I could, but tain't no use. She'll die in our hands and not a soul to go for a doctor or anything, and me all crippled up with rheumatism. Oh, what's to be done? During Aunt Margaret's distracted speech, I had been dressing as quickly as my trembling fingers permitted. A great dread was tugging at my heart. Was Alice really in danger? My little sister, whom I loved so dearly? Something must be done. But what? And who was to do it? I took the lamp and hurried into the other room, followed by Aunt Margaret, who hobbled after me, crying and lamenting dismally. She seemed to have lost her usual clear-sighted calmness altogether. Alice was her pet, and the sense of her danger quite unnerved our old nurse. I realized that the whole responsibility rested on me, and I felt very helpless. Inexperienced though I was, I saw at once that Alice was dangerously ill. She tossed to and fro, and coughed incessantly with a hoarse, choking sound. Her eyes were glaringly bright, and she did not seem to know me at all. Oh, Margaret, I said piteously, is she going to die? What can we do? Oh, child, I don't know. I've tried every remedy I know of. I didn't want to wake you till I had to, if we had only someone to send for Dr. Long. I tried to think calmly. Our nearest neighbor was three miles away. Father and mother had taken the team to town, and I could not drive the only horse left, a wild young three-year-old. The doctor lived at Crossroads, six miles away by the roundabout main road. But there was a shorter cut, not more than two and a half miles or three at the most, through the woods directly back of our farm. I knew the road well. It was used for wood hauling, and we went through it when we went burying in the wildlands back of Crossroads. 
I must go for the doctor, and I must go by that dark, lonely wood road. There was no help for it. There was no other way. But you cannot realize how terribly frightened I was. Margaret stared at me in amazement as I hastily slipped on my jacket and hat. Where are you going, child? For the doctor. I'm going through the woods, and I'll be as quick as I can. Do everything you can for Alice, and keep up the hot applications. I went over to the bed, kissed my little sister, then ran downstairs and slipped back the bolt of the door. The night was very dark, and our lantern was broken. A frantic terror took possession of me, and my trembling limbs refused to move. I could not go. I could not face that dark, lonely walk bristling with unknown horrors. I can smile at myself now, as you do, but I could not subdue my fears then. Then came the thought, if you do not go for the doctor, Alice will die. And it nerved me with a sort of desperate courage. I stepped out, shut the door, and started resolutely in the direction of the woods. It was, as I have said, very dark. But after I had been out a few minutes, my eyes got accustomed to the gloom and I could see my way. I had to cross two large fields before I reached the wood road. I climbed the fence and fairly flew over the dew-wet grass. The trees along the fences were terrifying in their dim, shadowy outlines. When a cow got up suddenly from a corner, my heart gave a painful bound. The far-off bark of some prowling fox sent the cold shivers up and down my spine. I arrived at the wood road out of breath and paused in fresh fright. The gloom under the trees was intense. There were so many eerie and mysterious sounds coming and going in the darkness, too. The groaning of the wind, the swaying of the branches and the leaves all thrilled me with terror. Now, M. Carter, I said aloud and the faint sound of my voice in that great empty darkness was as terribly as anything else. You know perfectly well there is nothing to hurt you, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. You have been through this wood dozens of times in daylight, and you never saw anything worse looking than yourself. You know there is no such thing as a ghost. Your sister is dying, and you are skulking here afraid to take a step to save her life. By the time I got through with this monologue, I felt braver, and I plunged in desperately and hurried down the dark wood road. I really yet cannot think of that experience without a little shudder. To me, the forest seemed fairly alive with a stealthy, uncanny life. I was fast, but my thoughts were faster, and every ghost or boogie story Aunt Margaret had ever told me flashed across my memory. I dared not turn my head, lest some dreadful thing should be dogging my steps although it would have had a lively race of it, for I was going at a headlong pace. Several times I tripped on roots and fell. Once I struck my face against a stump and cut my cheek. I could feel the warm blood trickling down as I scrambled up and ran on, but it seemed a very trifling thing compared with my mental agony. But at last I did get through the wood belt and came out back of the crossroads village. I had still quite a distance to go, over blueberry commons dripping with dew and so overgrown with young maple that I came near losing my way, but somehow or other I pushed through, following a cow track, and reached the fence along the main road. I climbed over it, but somehow in my hurry my foot slipped on the top longer and I fell heavily to the ground. I sprang up at once, but staggered back with a cry of pain for it seemed as if a knife had been thrust through my ankle. I had sprained it somehow when I fell. I could not bear my weight on it for a minute, and at first I felt as if I were going to faint. But my physical pain drove my ghostly fears out of my mind, and I set my teeth firmly. There was only one thing to do, and I did it. I got down and crawled, slowly and suddenly, on my hands and knees along the roadside to the doctor's house, feeling as if I must give up with every wrench of my ankle. I crawled up to the door and rang the bell. It seemed hours to me before I heard steps inside. Then the door opened and Dr. Long's kindly face appeared. He carried a lamp, and as the light fell over me, he fairly jumped, as well he might, for my face was all blood-stained, my hat gone, my dress torn to tatters, and I was sobbing and gasping wildly. 
bless my heart exclaimed the doctor amy carter here at this hour of night and in such a plight child where did you come from and what is wrong oh please sir i gasped brokenly alice is dying with croup won't you come at once there was nobody home but aunt margaret and me and i've run through the woods oh won't you come right away i'm afraid i sprained my ankle jumping over a fence down there i do declare said dr long and he picked me up as if i had been a baby and carried me into his office he insisted on bandaging up my ankle before he would attend to anything else and he wanted me to stay there while he went up to our place but i declare i must go back with him so he harnessed his pony as quickly as possible lifted me into the phaeton and we started back it seemed to me that drive would never end but it did of course and we got home before aunt margaret thought i had time to get to the crossroads the doctor looked very grave over alice he was barely in time he said a very little later would have been too late it was morning before alice was out of danger then dr long found time to ask me how my ankle was i had not thought much about it as i lay helplessly on the sofa and watched aunt margaret and him working over my sister but when i knew alice was safe i began to recollect my own mishaps it feels as if somebody were sticking needles through it i said and that isn't exactly pleasant how long am i going to be laid up oh not very long said the doctor cheerily it's not a bad sprain and alice is all right thanks to you my brave girl i felt myself getting very red oh i'm not brave at all i cried i'm an awful coward dr long if you knew how terribly frightened i was at first i was sure i couldn't go at all and every step i took i was sure some dreadful thing was just on the point of catching me i don't believe i could do it again the doctor laughed and said something about shakespeare's definition of bravery do you know it clive the brave man is not he who feels no fear for that were stupid and irrational but he whose noble soul his fear subdues and bravely dares the danger nature shrinks from quoted clive glibly yes that was it said aunt m but i told him that couldn't apply to me for i didn't subdue my fear i only just went somehow in spite of it but that night cured me i never was frightened in the dark after that my ankle was all right in a few days and father and mother said some very nice things to me but my sweetest reward was the knowledge that i had really saved alice's life we all drew a long breath as aunt m finished her story and her stocking together aunt m you were a brick exclaimed clive with boyish enthusiasm i could have never done that auntie i said i think you could if need arose said aunt m i would have been sure i could not do it either but you never know what you can do until you try End of section 8. Recording by Marcela Collado. Section 9 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by T. J. Burns. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery Miss Marietta's Jersey by L. M. Montgomery First published in The Household, July 1899 Miss Marietta's Jersey It was ten o'clock on a hot July morning, and Miss Marietta was helping Cordelie shell the peas for dinner on the back veranda, which was always cool and pleasant, shaded as it was by virginia creepers and sibilant poplars miss marietta whose morning work was not done was not dressed for the day she had on her lilac wrapper and her front hair was in curl papers an ample white apron was tied around her trim waist and floated off in long crisp streamers behind she was fair and forty and could afford to admit it since she looked all of five years younger her round, plump face was flushed pinkly with the heat. She swayed easily back and forth in her rocker, holding the pan of peas in her lap, 
and running her fat white fingers deftly up the green pods as she talked to Cordelie. Cordelie was Miss Marietta's cousin and stayed with her. She was paid wages for so doing, but nobody ever thought of her as hired help. She was much higher up in the social scale than that. She was a thin, snapping, black-eyed woman with angular elbows and nerves, and she shelled four peas to Miss Marietta's deliberate one. But then Miss Marietta took things easy, and Cordelie never did. It wasn't her way. My, it's dreadfully warm, isn't it? said Miss Marietta, making an ineffectual attempt to fan herself with a pea pod. I'm glad Herm has decided not to begin haymaking until next week. I'm sure I shouldn't feel like cooking for a lot of men in such weather. And I do hope Mr. Randall will come this afternoon and see about buying that Jersey cow. I shall never feel easy in my mind until she's safely off the place, she concluded. I guess Nathaniel Griffith won't either, said Cordelie, giving her chair a vicious hitch around. I wonder if he's got over the last tantrum by now. My, but wasn't he mad? He knows your cow is ever so much better than his, for all they look so exactly alike, and that helps to rile him up. Well, it was very aggravating to find her in his best clover hay, I've no doubt, said Miss Marietta soothingly. <laughs> I'm sure I shouldn't like to find his jersey in my hay, but I must say, I wouldn't get into such a ridiculous fluster as he did for all, and, oh! Goodness me, Cordelie, look there! Miss Marietta pointed with a gasp across the yard. Cordelie looked and saw. She sprang up, scattering peas and pods widely over the clean veranda floor in her flight. Goodness gracious, Marietta, that cow has been in again. However could she have jumped out? And he's mad clear through. Scuttling through the yard at a lively rate was a demure little Jersey cow, and behind her came Miss Marietta's next-door neighbor, Mr. Nathaniel Griffith, very red and puffing and angry, as he bounced up the veranda steps and faced the two women. Now, see here, Miss Hunter, he sputtered. This isn't going to do. I don't intend to put up with it. This is the third time, ma'am, I've found that Jersey cow of yours in my clover hay. Think of that. I warned you last time. Now, ma'am... What do you mean by letting her in again? Mr. Griffith stopped, perforce, for want of breath. Miss Marietta rose in distress. Dear me, Mr. Griffith, I had no idea that cow was in again. I don't know how she got out, I'm sure. I'm very sorry. Sorry, ma'am? Sorry isn't going to help matters any. You'd better go look at the havoc that animal has made in my hay. Trampled it from center to circumference. It isn't to be endured. I won't endure it. Oh, you needn't scowl at me back there, Miss Cordley Hunter. I'm talking to Miss Marietta. I'm a patient man, Miss Hunter. Very, very. Cordley could not have helped saying it to save her life any more than she could have kept the sarcastic inflection out of it when she did say it. Only your patience will be the cause of your bursting a blood vessel yet. If you go on in such a fashion a hot day like this, if I was a man, Nathaniel Griffith, I would try to have a little common sense. Hush, Cordelie, said Miss Marietta with dignity. Mr. Griffith, I regret very much that my cow has been so much trouble to you. Perhaps if you had kept your fences in better order, she might not have been. They're not very good, I notice. My fences are all right, snapped Mr. Griffith. There weren't ever fences built that would keep a demon of a cow like that out. Much a pair of old maids know about fences, or farming either. Miss Marietta carefully set her pan of peas on the bench and stood up, the better to overwhelm Mr. Griffith. Her mild blue eyes were sparkling dangerously, and her cheeks were very red. I may be an old maid, Mr. Griffith, she said, with calm distinctness. I've no doubt that I am, but it isn't because I've never had a chance to be anything else. And there are people not one hundred miles from here who know it, too. 
Mr. Griffith grew pink all over his shiny little face, to the very top of his bald head. He stepped backward awkwardly and fanned himself with his hat. Miss Marietta was mistress of the situation after that last effective shot, and she knew it. Cordelie could not repress a little chuckle of triumph as she watched him down the steps and across the yard. When he passed out of sight up the lane, Miss Marietta sat down again with a sigh. Oh, dear me, Cordelie, how very unpleasant, and me to be caught with wrapper and curl papers, too. <sighs> we must certainly do something with that cow. It is quite unbearable. What a dreadful temper Mr. Griffith was in, and he has trampled those peas you spelled right into the floor. That old monster, I'd have liked to pitch the whole panful at his head, returned Cordelie vindictively. Why didn't you fly at him? I'd have done it if I'd been in your place. Dear me, Cordelie, what good would that have done? I've no doubt it was very trying to find that cow in his hay again. Of course he need not have been quite so ridiculous. He can't and won't ever forgive you for refusing to marry him, said Cordelie. That's what's ranking in his mind. Not Jersey cows or hay either. Didn't he get red, though? How many times did you refuse him, Marietta? Twice, said Miss Marietta, with apparent satisfaction. And the last time pretty decided, too. It doesn't become him to be casting up to me that I'm an old maid. He's an old bachelor because nobody would have him. I suppose it's no wonder the poor man flies into tempers. <laughs> I should think it would spoil anyone's temper to have to put up with a housekeeper like Mercy Fisher. I don't suppose the poor soul has a decent meal from one end of the year to the other. If you'd fly into a temper, too, said Cordelie, who could not forgive Miss Marietta's easygoing ways, when he comes here blustering about his hay, it would settle him. Law, I feel better now than if I had, laughed Miss Marietta. You're too peppery, Cordelie. Mr. Griffith does not mean half, he says. You may be sure he's sorry for it already. He's always been so from a boy. But I shall certainly sell that cow. She's no milker, and I don't like fracases like this. Dear me, I feel quite upset. And what a dreadful state this veranda floor is in. The thunderstorm that came up at noon and drenched everything well did not last long, and at two o'clock Miss Marietta and her handmaid were dressed for driving, and the carriage was at the door. Miss Marietta had harnessed the horse, her hired man being away, and moreover, she shut the recalcitrant jersey up in the milking pen. She can't possibly get out of that unless she tears the fence down, she reflected complacently as she tied up the gate. She looks pretty quiet now. I dare say she sickened herself on that clover hay. I'm sure I wish I'd never been persuaded into buying her. A woman is apt to make mistakes in judgment when it comes to farming, after all, though I'd never admit it to Nathaniel Griffith. <sighs> and Miss Marietta sighed as she looked over the trim, well-ordered fields of her neighbor to the right. Perhaps it was on account of the shortcomings of Jersey cows with jumping proclivities, or it may have been because she discovered that she had slightly draggled the skirt of her new chocolate print in crossing the yard, or it might have been for neither of these reasons. I do hope that cow will behave herself while we're away said Miss Marietta, as they drove out of the gate. It was four o'clock when they got back with a wagon full of parcels. As they drove up the lane, Cordelie uttered a shrill exclamation. Miss Marietta, absorbed in a mental calculation regarding the day's expenditure, looked dreamily in the direction of Cordelie's extended finger. Before them, on the right, extended Mr. Griffith's broad field of clover hay, wet and odorous and luxuriant, and there, standing squarely in the middle of it, up to her broad sides in sweetness, and blinking calmly at them over the intervening blossoms, stood the Jersey cow. Miss Marietta dropped the reins and stood up with a curious tightening of the lips. She climbed nimbly down over the wheels, whisked across the road and over the fence before Cordelie could recover her powers of speech. "'Goodness gracious, Marietta! Come back!' screamed the latter. "'You'll ruin your dress in that wet hay. Ruin it, do you hear?' "'She doesn't hear me. 
The woman's gone crazy, I do believe. She'll never get that cow out by herself. I must go and help her, of course. Miss Marietta was charging through the thick hay like a mad thing. Cordially hopped briskly down, tied the horse securely to the post, turned her neat plaid dress skirt over her shoulders, mounted the fence, and started in pursuit. Cordily could run faster than plump Miss Marietta, and consequently overtook her before the latter had made much headway. Behind them, they left a trail that would break Mr. Griffith's heart when he should see it. "'Law's sake, Marietta, hold on!' panted poor Cordelie. "'I'm clean out of breath and wet to the skin. "'We... we... we must get that cow out before Mr. Griffith sees her!' "'Guess, Miss Marietta. I don't care if I'm drowned. Oh, if we can only do that.' But the Jersey cow appeared to see no good reason for being hustled out of her luscious browsing ground. No sooner had the two breathless women got near her, she turned and bolted squarely for the opposite corner of the field. "'Head her off!' screamed Miss Marietta. "'Run! Cordily, run!' And Cordily ran. Miss Marietta tried to, and the wicked Jersey went around the field as if she were possessed. Privately, Cordily thought she was. It was fully ten minutes before they got the cow headed off in a corner and drove her out of a gap and down the lane into their own yard just as a buggy turned in that direction. Miss Marietta did not often lose her temper. But at this critical moment, she felt decidedly cross. Her dress was ruined, and she was in a terrible heat. Cordily, being thinner, had suffered less, but she slammed the gate behind her with a vicious emphasis. There's Randall and his boy now, she said. He's a heaven sent if ever a man was. If you don't sell him that cow straight off, Marietta, I'll give warning here and now. Land sakes! I won't get over this picnic all summer. Miss Marietta needed no urging. Her gentle nature was grievously disturbed. Mr. Randall, she said, if you've come for my cow, you can have her at your own price. I'll give her away before I keep her another hour. In exactly twenty minutes, Mr. Randall drove away, and following him went his son driving the Jersey cow. Miss Marietta counted the roll of bills in her hand complacently, and Cordily looked after the disappearing bossy with malevolent satisfaction. I do hope we will have some peace of our lives now, she said. It was sunset before Miss Marietta recovered her equanimity. Ah, I guess I'll go out and begin milking, she said to Cordily, who was folding up the next day's ironing at the table. You needn't come until you finish with the clothes. Ah, I feel flustered yet, I declare I do. Ah, but it's such a comfort to think that cow is out of the way. Five minutes later, Cordelie wheeled about at the sound of her own name to see Miss Marietta standing white and shaken in the doorway. She whirled across the room and caught the latter's lilac arm. Marietta Hunter, what's the matter? Are you going to take a turn? You look as if you've seen a ghost. So I have, or something worse, <laughs> said Miss Marietta with a hysterical little giggle as she dropped into a chair. Cordily Hunter, it was Nathaniel Griffith's cow that I sold to Robert Randall this afternoon. My own is out there, in the milking pen yet. A lesser shock would have rattled Cordily's nerves completely, but this was so great that it left her perfectly calm. Marietta Hunter, are you dreaming? Go and look for yourself if you don't believe me, said Miss Marietta tragically. Cordily needed no second bidding. She shot out over the veranda and flew across the yard to the gate of the milking pen. There, looking calmly out over the bars and chewing the cud of placid reflection, stood Miss Marietta's jersey cow, as she had stood probably ever since her incarceration therein. "'I never did in all my life!' gasped Cordelie, stooping for the milking pails Miss Marietta had dropped. When she got back to the house, she found the kitchen deserted, 
and charged into Miss Marietta's bedroom, where she found the latter putting on her best dress with nervous haste. Land sakes, Marietta, this is a nice scrape to be in. What are you going to do? she asked. Go up to Mr. Griffith and explain, of course. That is, unless you'd like to go in my place, Cordelie. Heaven forbid, said Cordelie devoutly, as she dropped limply into a chair. I'd rather face a lion. I never did hear of such a piece of work. Mad isn't any word for what Nathaniel Griffith will be. I wonder you ain't scared to death, Marietta. Well, I almost am, returned Miss Marietta tremulously. But then, you see, Cordelie, it has to be done, if it's ever so humiliating. I suppose he'll say again that it's just what one would expect an old maid to do. <sighs> There's no getting his cow back, for Randall said he meant to take her right down to Larksville and ship her on the 5.30 train. I shall offer him the money, or my cow in her place, whichever he likes. And my cow is better than his, if she does jump. Oh, dear, my crimps all came out in that hurry-scurry this afternoon, and I look a fright. Miss Marietta started off bravely enough, cordially watched her out of sight, and then picked up the milking pails again. Laws me, won't there be a scene, she sniffed. Mr. Nathaniel Griffith was smoking a pipe on his front veranda and enjoying the view while his housekeeper was milking. Mr. Griffith never dared to smoke a pipe inside his own house. A henpecked husband is to be pitied, but a hand-pecked bachelor is the most forlorn creature on earth. Goodness me, said Mr. Griffith, removing his pipe and jumping to his feet as he caught sight of Miss Marietta skimming up the lane. If there ain't Marietta Hunter coming up here as sure as a gun, she must want to see mercy for something. Huh, I'm blessed if I want to face her after the fool I made myself down there about that cow. Darn her. But it won't never do to run with Mercy way down in the yard, and she's seen me anyhow. Mr. Griffith did not run, but manfully stood his ground, though he got pinker and pinker until, when Miss Marietta sailed up the steps, he was crimson from chin to crown. But Miss Marietta, in her own confusion, failed to notice this. Oh, Mr. Griffith, she said, desperately, without wasting time on preliminaries, I've... I've something dreadful to tell you. Bless my soul, ma'am, exclaimed Mr. Griffith. Sit down, ma'am. Do sit down. Has that cow of yours got into my hay again? But it's no difference, no difference at all, ma'am, if she has. I was too hasty today, ma'am, far too hasty. Oh, it's worse than that, said poor Miss Marietta, taking no notice of the rustic seat Mr. Griffith pushed nervously towards her. I don't know how to tell you. I shut my cow up after you brought her home, and Cordelie and I went over to Larksville after dinner. And when we came back, we saw a Jersey cow in the hay again, and we chased it out. And Mr. Randall came along just then, and I was so exasperated I sold her to him on the spot, and he took her away. And tonight... When I went out to milk, there was my cow in the pen. And it was yours I had sold, Mr. Griffith. <sighs> and the revelation being over, Miss Marietta sat down in the rustic chair with a distinct sob. Oh, <sighs> bless my soul, said Mr. Griffith. What an extraordinary thing. Don't cry, ma'am, I beg of you. It's no difference at all. Nothing to disturb yourself over, ma'am. There now, don't cry, my dear. He stepped over and patted her shoulder nervously. Miss Marietta wiped her eyes. It's very good of you to say so, Mr. Griffith, she sobbed. I do feel so dreadfully about it. Your cow is a hundred miles away by now. But I've brought the money over, or you can have my jersey if you'd rather. She's a very good cow. I can't begin to tell you how sorry I am. No need to be sorry at all, ma'am, said Mr. Griffith gently, still patting Miss Marietta's arm. 
It was an accident, ma'am. One cow is the same to me as another. I'll take yours in her place, since you want to get rid of her. Now, don't think another thing about it. Bless me, I'd rather lose every cow I've got than have your feelings harrowed up so, my dear. Miss Marietta colored a little and stood up. I'm much obliged to you, Mr. Griffith. Here and we'll drive the cow over in the morning. I guess I must be going now. Cordelia is milking all alone. Mr. Griffith fidgeted down two steps and up again. Uh, no hurry, ma'am. Mercy will be in in a minute or two. Sit down again, won't you, and have a neighborly chat. It's, it's lonesome here by spells. Miss Marietta sat down again. It would be very uncivil to refuse under the circumstances. Mr. Griffith had been so nice about the cow, and it must be rather lonesome for a man to be there all the time with no company but a cross old housekeeper. He looked neglected. She felt sorry for him. Cordely had almost made up her mind to start out and see if Mr. Griffith had murdered Marietta when she saw two figures coming up the lane in the moonlight. There she is now, said Cordely, peering out of the kitchen window in relief. What on earth kept her so long? And old Griffith's with her, or my name isn't Cordelia Hunter. What can be going to happen? Miss Marietta and Mr. Griffith stood and talked at the gate for nearly half an hour, until Cordelie thought they must both be demented. When Miss Marietta finally came in, with a very high color in her face, she found Cordelie sitting blankly on a chair. Marietta Hunter, said Cordelie solemnly, did I, or did I not, see Nathaniel Griffith kiss you out there at the gate? I dare say you did, was the calm response, especially if you happened to be peeking out of the window. We're... we're going to be... married. Well, I never did. Cordily was overwhelmed. Marietta Hunter. I've heard you say a dozen times if you said it once that you wouldn't marry Nathaniel Griffith if he were the last man left alive on earth. And after you're refusing him twice. Huh? The third time's generally lucky, I've noticed, said Miss Marietta, loosening her bonnet strings composedly. Ah, dear me, what a day this has been. If you could see the state that poor man's house is in, You'd think it time somebody took pity on him. And it's a woman's privilege to change her mind, you know. To be sure, I might never have changed my mind if it hadn't been for that blessed jersey. <laughs> what could you do, Cordelia Hunter? You couldn't say no to a man when he's just forgiven you so beautifully for selling his prize cow. I couldn't, anyway. And I don't know that I'm sorry either. End of section nine. Recording by T. J. Burns. Section ten of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Raymond Cockle Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery A Double Joke Well, the sun is setting, so I suppose that signifies that we must be trudging. It almost takes the edge off a of fellow's fun to have to walk four miles to and from it. You know you'd walk three times as far for as glorious an afternoon skating as we've had today, Phil. So what's the use of growling? We always have to pay a certain price for our fun in this world, old fellow, and in this corner of it especially. For my part, I rather enjoy a tramp home over good roads on a night like this. A night like this was a clear, crisp winter evening, frosty and sharp without being unpleasantly cold. 
The sun was just setting behind a ridge of pine-fringed hills in the southwest, and the gleaming sheet of ice before the boys, covered with an intricate tracery of skate tracks, reflected all the tints of the sky that was a vast lake of cloudy crimson and melting crocus and transparent rose. Up on the hill behind them, the spires and roofs of a small village came out with clearest darkness against the arc of colour. It was named Forest Hill, but Phil Burgess and Bert Lawrence, who had been spending the afternoon in having what they termed a glorious skate, did not belong there. They came from over Ashbury Way, as the Forest Hillites would have said, with a fine inflection of disdain. Ashbury was a settlement about four miles east of Forest Hill, and was just as good as the latter in every particular, except, as Bert would have said, it was overlooked when skating arrangements were made. There wasn't, in the length and breadth of Ashbury, any kind of place for skating, unless the miserable little saucer of ice in Cole's field could be called so. It served as a place for new beginners and girls to practice on, but for the real article, the Ashbury boys were forced to betake themselves and their skates over to Crystal Lake at Forest Hill. There was no love lost between the Ashbury boys and the Forest Hill boys, and that famous ice had been the scene of more than one spirited brush between the two factions, in which victory perched now upon one standard and now upon the other, with an impartiality that kept the balance pretty even. But Phil and Bert had the ice all to themselves that day, and had enjoyed themselves immensely. Bert, at the conclusion of his last sentence, sat down and dragged his skates off. Phil went off for a final twirl. I suppose it's time we were going, he said regretfully, but I'll have one more spin anywho. When it was over, he rejoined Bert, and the two chums started off across the snowy fields. On the crest of the hill, Phil paused to look back and saw a dozen or so dark figures descending the opposite slope. Jing, he exclaimed. There are the hillites now. Won't they have a glorious evening? It's going to be moonlight. I have a half notion to go back. What say, Bert? Not I declared his chum. There'll be nobody from Ashbury, and those hillites are mad yet over the licking we gave them last week. We're in a huge minority, and we'd be sure to get in a row. Don't know as I'd care if we did, said Phil, moving on, however. I feel exactly like having some excitement, just in the mood for doing something wild. This, I am afraid, was not at all an uncommon mood for Phil, or Bert either, for that matter. They were in mischief every day of their lives, although it was generally harmless, yet they were growing up into big boys now, and some of their pranks had gone rather too far. They were simply average boys, neither scamps nor saints, and their tricks were mostly the outcome of mere boyish thoughtlessness and spirits. Still, habit makes character after a while, and Bert and Phil were at a somewhat critical period. As old Jim Carpenter, the Ashbury Oracle, remarked sagely, Those two lads want a stopper put on them right off, before it gets too late. Nobody had as yet applied the stopper, however, or seemed likely to. Their last escapade, untying and retying in a different place, all the horses and carriages hitched to the church fence when a lecture was going on inside, so that when people came out on a night so dark that it was dated from, the scene of confusion was one that made history, had been a good deal talked about, but no serious damage had been done, and as it couldn't be positively proved that it was they who did it, they got off scot-free. Old Jim Carpenter's theory was the correct one. Bert and Phil were in need of a little kindly and careful advice and repression just at this turning point in their teens. This they were not likely to get. Phil lived with a mummy-like old uncle 
who concerned himself over nothing earthly but the making of money, and let his nephew grow up as he would. And Bert's father was an easy-going mortal, who found a refuge from all responsibility in the indisputable assertion that boys will be boys. Nobody wants them to be turnips or cabbages, he said. Bert's all right. He'll tone down in time. <laughs> Bless me, I never saw anything so funny as old Johnny Stone flying around the other night hunting for that old sorrel nag of his. The boys had walked two miles and were just entering on the strip of fir woods that marked the boundary between Ashbury and Forest Hill, when a twinkle of bells behind them made them look around. A cutter with a solitary occupant was coming around a curve in the road, and Phil recognized the turnout. There's Dr. Taylor coming, Bert, with that little mare he bought down at Oakvale last month. Take a good look at her as she goes past. I tell you, she's a dandy. She can just walk away from anything in Ashbury. Or Forest Hill, either. I'd give almost anything just to get a spin behind her. Phil's wish was gratified more speedily and surely than wishes generally are in this workaday world. The little mare and the cosy cutter came to a prompt standstill, and the doctor called out cheerily. Jump in, boys! The cutter holds three! Nothing loth, the boys jumped in, and away they went at a speed that Phil declared next thing to flying. What do you think of Barney Queen? asked the doctor proudly. Is that her name, sir? Well, I think it just suits her. I never saw anything to equal her before. Phil spoke honestly. The little mare was a beauty clean-limbed and satin-coated, with a record for speed which no horse in Ashbury could touch. The doctor smiled, well pleased. I'm as proud and fond of her as if she were one of my own family, he said. She's never had a blow in her life, and never will, I hope. I let nobody drive her but myself. She's rather a nervous little animal, and doesn't like strangers. Well. Here we are at the hall. There's a meeting of the shareholders here tonight, and I promised I'd attend. But I don't care about leaving Bonnie Queen out this frosty night. And I haven't a blanket with me either. I guess I'll go on home. But just at this juncture, Squire Clay came along. Good evening, Doctor. You're going to stay, of course. I am not sure, said the doctor, hesitatingly. You must, said Squire Clay, decidedly. We can't do without you. A few minutes' conversation aside resulted in the doctor's turning to the boys. It's only a mile to my place, he said, and I want you to take Queen home for me. Don't drive her too fast. Gordon is home, and he'll attend to her. Will you? Would they? Well, they just guessed so. To drive Bonnie Queen for a mile through Ashbury with everybody envying them, what a windfall. I wouldn't trust a horse like that with those two for a good deal, commented Squire Clay when the cutter was out of earshot. They don't know what mischief to be up to next, either of them. It's said they were at the bottom of that affair at the church the night of the lecture, too. The doctor looked troubled. But it was too late. Phil and Bert were already out of sight, and Bonnie Queen was prancing along the road on her slender feet, as if she knew her own value. It was a perfect night. The sunset glow still lingered in the west, and the moonlight was becoming brilliant. Every boy in Ashbury seemed to be on the road, and the sight of Phil Burgess and Bert Lawrence driving Dr. Taylor's Bonnie Queen made a sensation which our two heroes enjoyed to the utmost. I wish it were half a dozen miles instead of one, said Bert. The remark was like a match to powder. Phil had not yet worked off his mischievous mood, 
Just before them was the corner where the road to the Seven Oaks branched off at right angles. That, coupled with Bert's remark, sent an idea scintillating through Phil's brain with dizzying impulse. Let's make it six miles, he said promptly. How? Just let's drive over to Seven Oaks Corner just for the fun of it, before we take the Queen home. The doctor will never know. It'll be a capital joke. Bert thought so too. But what if the doctor should find it out? He said doubtfully. Oh, he won't. Not for a while, anywho. We can be back long before that meeting will be out. And the Taylor boys will suppose we've just come from the hall. Of course, it will leak out in time, but we'll have had our fun, and all will be well over. And to put the matter beyond discussion, Phil turned Bonnie Queen down the Seven Oaks Road and gave her free rein. Neither of the two boys stopped to think at all seriously over what they were doing. It was, in their eyes, a good joke, and there was fun to be had besides. But it was something a little worse than any of their past tricks, for there was a principle of honor involved in this. They were betraying their trust. But they did not see it in this light at all. They were enjoying themselves recklessly. To be sure, they felt a little anxious at first, but that feeling soon wore off. The evening was moonlit and frosty. Bonnie Queen was on her metal and fairly flew. Phil tingled with excitement to his very fingertips, and sent the mare along at a pace that would have broken the doctor's heart if he had seen it. Can't she just go, though? Bert, what wouldn't you give for a horse like that? Dr. Taylor doesn't half drive her. He's so afraid of hurting her. Won't we make a sensation at the corner, though? Seven Oaks Corner was six miles from Ashbury. There was a store at the corner, which was the evening rendezvous of all the Seven Oaks boys. The place was in rather bad repute. Careful Ashbury fathers and mothers did not like to see their sons go over that way in the evening. The corner boys were reported to be a tough lot. Phil and Bert had no business to be there, and they knew it. But they had scraped up an acquaintance with the boys there, and went over all too often. Phil had not underrated the sensation their appearance driving Dr. Taylor's celebrated Queen, whose fame had reached Seven Oaks, would make at the corner. When they drew up before it with a curve and a prance and a clash of silvery bells, the loafers in and around the store swarmed about them with noisy admiration and questions. The boys told their story with gusto. In the eyes of the Seven Oaks contingent, their exploit was regarded as a cute trick. Nobody in the crowd noticed a dark figure standing silently on the front porch of a house next to the store. When the boys had finished their story, and the cornerites had looked the queen over admiringly, Oliver Bates, the son of the storekeeper, said, Well, tie up and come in for a while, boys. You're cold and in no great hurry, I suppose. Even Phil was a little dubious about doing this. Now that the first sparkle of excitement was over, he began to feel slightly uneasy, and he felt it would be risky to leave Bonnie Queen unguarded at the mercy of all the ragtag and bobtail of Sevenoaks who might be skulking around. Phil suddenly realized that if anything should happen to the animal, it would be a serious case for Bert and him. But Oliver coaxed, and the cornerite sarcastically inquired, if he was afraid they'd put the mare in their pockets if he left her. And the end of it all was that Phil and Bert hitched Bonnie Queen to the post and went into the store, while the dark, quiet figure aforesaid still lingered in the shadow of Mr. Bates' front porch. The boys did not mean to stay long, but there was much to hear and relate. Mr. Bates was genial and the store warm, and finally... Oliver treated the crowd to peanuts and candy all around, so that it was all of half an hour or more before Phil and Bert bethought themselves of Bonnie Queen, standing blanketless in the frosty air after her hot drive. 
It's time we were off, whispered Berth anxiously. If we don't hurry, the doctor will be home before we are, and we'll get into trouble. Come on, Phil. All right, responded Phil, as he demolished his last peanut. I'm ready. Now for a 240 spin back to Ashbury. Out into the sparkling moonlight went the noisy crowd. Bonnie Queen was gone. Phil and Bert stared dazedly at the post, at first quite incapable of realising what had happened. Then the horror of it broke upon them. Bert! gasped Phil, in a voice utterly unlike his own. Where? Where is the horse? It was a question Bert could not answer, nor anyone else, apparently. There did not seem to be a soul in sight around the corner, except the crowd who had come out of the store. But the horse and cutter had vanished, leaving not a trace behind. She must have got loose and started home, said Oliver Bates consolingly. Nobody would have dared to take her. Phil and Bert were not so sure of this. They knew that there were several toughs in Sevenoak who were capable of having done it. What in the world was to be done? They found out just then the worth of corner friendship. Their hail fellows well met of the past half hour melted away as if by magic. They had no desire to be tangled up in any Ashbury scrape about Dr. Taylor's horse. Oliver Bates was almost the only one who stayed to advise the alarmed boys. The best thing you can do is to go straight home, he said, and see if the mare has gone home. If not, you can get help to hunt her up, but I think you'll find her there. Phil and Bert looked at each other miserably. A six miles walk home wasn't a pleasant prospect, certainly. But that wasn't a circumstance to the disappearance of Bonnie Queen. Perhaps if you had searched Seven Oaks and Ashbury and Forest Hill and all the outlying and adjacent districts and villages, you might possibly have found two limper, cheaper, more thoroughly frightened boys than Phil Burgess and Bert Lawrence just about that time, but I doubt it. In their hearts, the boys did not believe that Bonnie Queen could have got loose of her own accord. She had been too well tied for that. But some cornerite or other might have loosened her for a trick, and she might have gone home. At any rate, as Oliver said, there was nothing to do but go and see. So they started. Neither of them ever forgot that walk. You can call it only six miles from Seven Oaks Corner to Ashbury, if you like, said Phil to me afterwards. But it was ten times six that night. They were too disgusted and scared to talk it over. In grim silence they tramped along, filled with gloomy forebodings. They had plenty of time to see their joke in its true light, with all its alarming possibilities. When they finally reached the Ashbury Road, it was half past nine o'clock. They decided to go straight to Dr. Taylor's and took a shortcut across the fields there too. There was a light in the stable yard, and as the boys rounded the corner of the shed, they saw a sight that made their hearts give one wild bound of relief and amazement. Before the carriage house door, Edgar Taylor was unharnessing a horse from a cutter, and by the light of the lantern Gordon Taylor held, both Bert and Phil recognised Bonnie Queen. The boys, standing in the shadow of the shed, had not been noticed by the tailors, and in the calm night they heard plainly what Edgar was saying to his brother. Those two smart boys drove up just as I came out of the house. I knew the queen at sight, and you'd better believe I wondered what on earth they were doing there with her. They didn't see me, and when their cronies came out, I heard the whole story. At first, I thought I'd march right out and face them. Then I thought of a better way, since they seemed to be so fond of a joke. When they went in and left poor Bonnie Queen tied there, in a reek of perspiration too, mind you, I just waited till all was quiet, took off her bells, and drove away. I called down at Curdie's for a while, and then came home. 
I'll bet a hat those two chaps are feeling small enough to crawl through a knot hole by now. It'll give them a jolly good scare, and they'll richly deserve it. They might have ruined Queen, driving her like that. But luckily she hasn't a scratch. Are you going to tell father? asked Gordon. Not just now, was the reply. It would worry him. He wouldn't believe what she was hurt. He'll hear the story in a few days, of course, but it will be all over then. But I'll give those two boys a piece of my mind when I see them, that they won't forget in a hurry. And Edgar led the mare into the stable. Outside, Bert looked at Phil, and Phil looked at Bert. You could buy me for a cent, said the former. I'd give myself away for nothing, said the latter. Let's go home. And they went home. They did not do much talking, but there is every reason to believe that they did some hard thinking. When they parted at Bert's gate, Phil said, We're a pair of fools, Bert. That's a fact, Phil. The joke's dead against us this time. I don't feel as if I wanted to play any more. Of course, in a day or so, the story drifted over from Seven Oaks, and Phil and Bert were chaffed unmercifully. But they kept very quiet, and when Edgar Taylor met them and proceeded to give the promised peace of his mind, they took it so humbly and repentantly that he did not come down on them half as heavily as he had intended. In due time, the tale reached the doctor's ears and horrified him not a little. But it was all well over. He said nothing, rightly deeming that the boys had been already well punished. And they had. The stopper had been applied, with good results. Bert and Phil gave up playing jokes and turned their attention to the cultivation of good behaviour, which was the more easily done in that their visits to Seven Oaks were cut short at once and forever. They never dared go there again, for the Cornerites would have tormented their lives out. As Phil said, Single jokes are funny enough, but when it comes to double ones, you don't appreciate the point quite so cheerfully. End of section 10「Section 11 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brenda J. Davis. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 11. The Knuckling Down of Mrs. Gamble. Mrs. Gamble was knitting by the west window of the kitchen. It was already quite dark in the big spotless room, for the kitchen of the Gamble farmhouse was on the north side and was shadowed west and north by a grove of firs. Outside it was a chill, colorless November dusk. Overhead, the gray sky was faintly flushed with a transient pink, and lower down, between the dark boughs of the firs and far away over the dull hills, Mrs. Gamble could see the sullen, crimson bars of an autumn sunset. The cherry tree at the corner of the house was tossing its bare boughs weirdly, and shriveled brown leaves went scurrying up and down the garden in uncanny dances before the breath of viewless winds. Mrs. Gamble dropped her knitting on her lap and leaned forward to look out of the window, through the firs, to that red glow of fading sunset. She was a tall, stout woman of perhaps sixty, for there were many gray threads in the smooth, thick waves of somewhat coarse auburn hair that framed her strong-featured face. Amelia Gamble had never used spectacles in her life, and her light gray eyes were as keen and penetrating as they had ever been, and a good deal harder. 
She drew her black shawl closer about her square shoulders and shivered a little. It's dreadful cold and bleak out tonight, she said aloud. She had a habit of talking to herself, for she was a woman who hated to be alone and was given to many devices for circumventing unwelcome solitude. I shouldn't wonder if we had snow before morning. It would be a relief to see those long, bare hills covered over. I hope it won't rain anyhow. I hate fall rains. I wish James was home. Oh, that someone would drop in for company. It makes me feel nervous some way to be alone in this big house. I must be getting old and silly when I get such notions in my head. She went and poked up the fire. She would have some cheerful light anyhow. Amelia Gamble had been brought up to consider it shameful waste to light a candle before it was absolutely dark and she had never departed from the traditions of her childhood. Then she went to the other window. It looked out on the long valley of the village, at the head of which the Gamble homestead stood on the hill. The main road wound through the valley, and here and there along the dun slopes early lights twinkled. Mrs. Gamble's cold eyes swept down the length of the valley and then fell on a beshawled figure coming up the lane between the rows of bare sweetbriar bushes. That's Laurilla Johnson, said Mrs. Gamble. I'd know that wobbly walk of hers anywhere. I don't know as I'm glad to see her. For all I've been wishing someone would step in. She's a gossip and a pry, and that tongue of hers is hung in the middle. It's queer how some folks aren't happy unless they're forever poking their noses into something that don't concern them. She had been moving swiftly about during this monologue, pushing chairs into place and lighting a lamp when Lorilla's sharp, imperative little rat-a-tat came at the door, Mrs. Gamble opened it and bade her caller a semi-cordial good evening. But Lorilla Johnson was not to be daunted by a cool reception. It was her maxim to make herself at home under all circumstances. And when she had laid off her hat and shawl and ensconced herself comfortably in the rocker, she produced from her satchel a long gray woolen sock and began to knit. Her tongue, keeping time to the click of the needles. She was a thin woman with a long, colorless face and pale blue eyes and had a disagreeable little laugh. Mrs. Gamble disliked her, and Lorilla knew it, but had her own way of taking revenge. I knew James wouldn't be back till late, she said, so I thought I'd run up and keep you company for an hour or so. Don't you find it rather lonesome here by spells? Not particularly, was the curt response. There's too much to do for that. Fine ladies with nothing to do may find time to be lonesome. Perhaps I never could. Lorilla smiled and shifted her tactics. She understood Amelia Gamble. That's so, she assented smoothly. Fact is, it's a marvel to me how you ever managed to keep up with your work so well. It's a great thing to have your good health. Now me, I'm never well two days at a time. I've a cough now. There's a good deal of sickness round the center. Dr. Richardson has kept pretty busy, I guess. All the Dales are down with diphtheria. Lorilla stopped for breath, and Mrs. Gamble narrowed her lips down hardly as she stooped to pick a stray wisp of yarn from the yellow-painted floor. If there's anything going, the Dales will have it, I'll be bound, she said. 
When they are well, they go gadding around until they catch something. Where'd they get the diphtheria? Over Carlton Way, they say. I suppose you know Flory has it, too. It was the most effective shot in Larilla's locker, and her lead-colored eyes watched Mrs. Gamble keenly as it was fired. The result disappointed her. Mrs. Gamble started slightly, but showed no other sign of emotion. Spencer's Flory? Yes. O of course, I suppose you knew. She took down with it Monday. Dr. Richardson says she's pretty bad. I guess Jessie is about worn out. Have you been to see them, Mrs. Gamble? A braver woman than Larilla Johnson might have quailed before the flash of Amelia Gamble's gray eyes. You know as well as I do, Lorilla Johnson, that I've never been to see Jesse Gamble at any time and don't ever expect to go. She's nothing more to me than any stranger, nor her husband either. Mrs. Gamble, your own son, faltered Lorilla deprecatingly. He's been no son of mine ever since he married Jesse Green. I gave him his choice between us, and he made it. I must abide by it. I'm sorry to hear Flory is ill, just as I'd be sorry for anybody's child. Is she dangerous, did you say? The doctor hasn't much hope of her, I believe. Spencer's just distracted, so they say, and Jessie, too. She's their only one, and they're just wrapped up in her. Like as not, it's one of proper nursing is the trouble. Jessie isn't much of a hand in sickness, I suppose. Never had any experience, and she can't get anyone. People are scared, you know. Diphtheria isn't a thing to be trifled with. Jessie Green never had any faculty for managing anyhow, said Mrs. Gamble coldly. There never was a Green that had any constitution either. Flory was always a sickly child. Don't you find it chilly in that corner, Lorilly? Move nearer the fire. Lorilla understood that Mrs. Gamble considered the discussion of Spencer Gamble's family troubles closed, and nothing more was said on the tabooed subject. When she finally went away, Mrs. Gamble sped the parting guest without any regret. I wish she'd stayed away, she muttered, or held her tongue about Spencer's folks when she did come. I don't want to be told anything about them. Lorilla Johnson is always trying to twit me underhand about that affair. Flory Gamble isn't anything more to me than any other Lawton child. There's James now. As her quick ear caught the rumble of wheels coming down the hard, frozen lane. I'm sure I'm glad. I don't know what has got into me tonight... I seem to get all of a tremble when I'm left alone. She had the supper table set for her husband by the time he came in with his arms full of parcels, which he deposited silently on the dresser. James Gamble was a tall, stoop-shouldered old man with dim, blinking eyes and long straggles of thin gray hair and whiskers. There was something meek and deprecating about his whole appearance. Lawton Gossip said that James Gamble never dared to have an opinion of his own in the presence of his wife. Supper was a silent meal. Neither of the two seemed disposed to talk. As Mrs. Gamble passed her husband his second cup of tea, he cleared his throat tentatively and stirred the tea with the air of a timid man who wants to say something. Melly, 
Did you hear that Spencer's Flory was down with the diphtheri? He said hesitatingly. I heard it down at Shattuck this afternoon. Yes, I heard it, answered Mrs. Gamble coldly. Lorelli Johnson was here this evening and said so. Spencer was in at Morton's store while I was there. James Gamble faltered between nervous swallows of tea. I heard him telling Tom Keefe about Flory. He said they hadn't much hopes of her. He seemed awful downhearted over it. His wife made no reply. Her face was emotionless and her cold gray eyes gazed unblinkingly at the light. James Gamble moved his chair about restlessly. They do say over Shattuck Way. I heard Tom Keefe and Bob Sharp talking of it when they didn't know I was around. That Spencer and Jesse ain't very well off this winter. It took most all Spencer's wages to pay the doctor's bills for that sick spell of Jesse's in the summer. Well, it just amounted to this. They appeared to think that Spencer's folks didn't have enough to eat or enough to warm themselves with. I suppose, said Mrs. Gamble in a hard, dry voice. If you hear that about any stranger, you take them a load of stuff. I suppose you could do as much for Spencer's folks. It ain't the same thing, said her husband huskily. And Spencer wouldn't take it if I did. You know that, Melly. He's too proud to take for charity what is his by right. He looked peaked and miserable enough himself, and he'd a bad cough, too. It just seemed to rack him in pieces like. A sudden change swept over Amelia Gamble's face, quite marvelous in the transformation it wrought. The hard lines seemed to melt away. The mouth softened. A whole flood of repressed mother love glorified her cold gray eyes. She bent forward insistently. Did you tell him to do anything for it? She asked eagerly. Did you recommend that emotion Julius Hackett was taking? I wasn't speaking to him at all, Melly. You know that well enough. He never looked my way. Spencer always took cough so hard, said Mrs. Gamble anxiously, and he never would take care of himself. I suppose he's run himself down slaving and slaving and nothing but sickness to contend with. Perhaps you might go down and see them tomorrow suggested her husband timidly. You do as much for a stranger, Melly. I don't doubt I would, but you said yourself this isn't the same thing. Jessie Green said once that she hoped neither you nor I would ever darken her door, and she can't complain that we have or ever will, said his wife defiantly. You don't know for sure whether she ever said such words or not, Melly. It might have been nothing but gossip. And if she did, I dare say she was provoked to it. You said enough about her. I dare say it all went to her ears. It's lately you've begun to take her part, said Mrs. Gamble sarcastically. I wasn't the only one who said things, James Gamble. I know you weren't, Melly, he said humbly. Only I kind of think now maybe we were foolish to raise such a row. 
Of course, I ain't saying I don't still think it was a big mistake for Spencer to marry a green. But when he did, we might as well have made the best of it. This house is big enough for half a dozen families. Goodness knows. We're left all alone in our old age, and it's all because we were cantankerous with Spencer. We were too unreasonable, Melly. It was not often James Gamble dared to speak so plainly to his wife. He expected some biting sarcasm in reply, but Mrs. Gamble made no response. Her husband lighted a candle, seated himself near the fire and tried to read. She washed and put away the dishes, then sat down near him and gazed into the glowing fire. Was it true? She wondered uneasily. That Spencer and his wife were not so well off in the matter of food and fuel as were others? Her thoughts traveled remorselessly back over the past as she sat there. Spencer had been her only idolized son. It had been for him that James Gamble and his wife had toiled and economized, that his inheritance of land and money might surpass any other in Lawton. Everything they had done was with an eye to Spencer's future benefit. When they had built the new house, Mrs. Gamble had insisted that it should be large and handsome, so that when Spencer would bring there a wife, he might bring her to no mean or narrowed home. And to think that after all he had married Jessie Green. It was five years ago. James Gamble and his wife had opposed it bitterly. But Spencer Gamble was his mother's son. His obstinacy was fully equal to hers. When she had plainly given him his choice between her and Jesse Green, he had not hesitated. James Gamble had been furious with the temper of a usually meek man roused at last. He told his son that he would disown him if he married Jesse Green and Spencer Gamble had married her, taken her to a tiny house at Lawton Center, and between him and his parents fell a long and unbroken silence. He struggled along somehow and managed to make a living by hiring out in the summer and doing odd jobs in the winter. It was not what Spencer Gamble had been used to, and he felt the difference keenly. Amelia Gamble's heart broke when her son went out from her roof to return no more, but she made no sign. Lawton people said she was the hardest woman they had ever known. She never even looked at Jessie or Spencer when she met them. This cold November evening, it was five months since she had seen her son for after his marriage he had not even attended Lawton Church. Instead, he had gone with Jesse to the little Methodist church over at Shattuck, and this was another of the grievances of Mrs. Gamble Sr. There has never been a moment in all the five long, lonely years that her heart has not yearned secretly over him, although she never admitted it. Now, as she sat over the dying embers, she confessed to herself at last that she had been hard and unjust. As her husband said, it would have been wiser to have made the best of it. After all, poor as the Greens were, nothing except her poverty and some disreputable relatives could have been urged against Jessie herself. She might have learned to love her.
for Spencer's sake. The house was big enough for them all. It would have been pleasant to have had Spencer's wife for company and Spencer's golden-haired little girl playing about the old place. And now, little Flory was dying, and Spencer was ill. Mrs. Gamble wiped away some unaccustomed tears. The fire had gone out, and the room was getting very cold. At the next morning's breakfast table, Mrs. Gamble broke a long silence so abruptly that her husband started. James, I'm going to walk down to the center after breakfast and see Spencer's folks. I suppose if some of us has got to knuckle down, it's my place to do it. Anyhow... I won't have much peace of mind if I don't go. I dare say Jessie'll shut the door in my face. I'm sure she won't do anything of the kind, said her husband eagerly, an expression of relief coming out strongly on his thin, pinched features. She'll be glad enough to see you, no doubt. We ought to have done it long ago. Better take a basket along with you, Melly. Maybe if Jessie's had to wait on Flory all by herself, she'll have got behind hand with other things. It was a generous basket that Mrs. Gamble packed, albeit with a grim face. She kept that same grim face on as she walked down the valley road. Snow had come in the night and was still falling softly. The plowed fields were stretches of snowy dimples, and the barn roofs were like sheets of marble. The spruces stood up along the road, feathered over whitely, and every twig on the beaches was outlined in pearl. The faraway hills loomed dimly through the misty veil of snowflakes. To Mrs. Gamble, it seemed as if the very cows in the barnyards, blinking their mild eyes at her over the fences, with broad rayed flakes clinging to their sides, knew her errand. The faces she saw looking at her from the windows seemed to wear significant smiles. A neighbor's hearty greeting seemed overcharged with sinister meaning. More than once, she was on the point of turning back. Could it be possible that she, Amelia Gamble, was going to knuckle down to Jessie Green, a green from Shattuck, at that Yet she went steadily on till she found herself standing before the door of Spencer Gamble's tiny house at the center. From the windows of a house opposite, she saw Lorilla Johnson's pale, curious face peering out. In spite of herself, Mrs. Gamble smiled. Spurred on by the consciousness of being watched by Lorilla, She rapped sharply at Spencer's door and then stepped back with a vague impulse to run from the spot in spite of a dozen Lorillas. Spencer himself, hollow-eyed and unshaven, opened the door. (sighs) Amazement, incredulity, and alarm chased each other over his haggard face. He was too surprised to speak and stood dumbly in the doorway. Come, Spencer, ain't you going to ask me in? said his mother crisply. I haven't walked all the way down here in the snow for nothing. How is Flory? And Jessie? 
She brought the last word out with a choke. It broke the back of her pride. But it was a hard blow. Spencer stepped back, embarrassed. Of course. Come in, Mother. Jesse, Flory, they're well. No, I mean. Mrs. Gamble pushed past him and went in. There was nobody in the neglected kitchen. She stalked to the door of the little bedroom off it and peered in grimly. Jessie Gamble, bending over her child's cot, started with dismay as she saw her mother-in-law. She looked thin and heartbroken. When Spencer Gamble had married her, she had been the prettiest girl in Shattuck. Now the color was all gone from her long cheeks. Her soft, fairish brown hair was falling loosely on her neck, and her large, wistful brown eyes were full of fear and sorrow. Something. Pride, coldness, disappointment, or whatever it was, gave way in Mrs. Gamble's heart at that moment. She did not say anything, but she held out her arms, and the next moment the younger woman was sobbing in them. It was half an hour before Mrs. Gamble came out to the kitchen which Spencer was clumsily trying to restore to order. She had her bonnet and shawl off and was tying a big apron about her substantial waist. Jessie's clean tuckered out, Spencer. She's gone to sleep in there, and I'm going to look after Flory. I believe she'll pull through. Dr. Richardson don't know everything. I never had much opinion of him anyway. If you haven't had time to do much cooking, you'll find something eatable in that basket, I dare say. I knew you'd be all sort of upset, so I brought it along. Then I want you to go home and tell Father I won't be back today, and he must cook his own meals. You needn't be afraid to, she added seeing the doubt on her son's face. He'll be glad to see you again, Spencer. When the doctor came that night, it was to find Flory out of danger. It's all owing to you, Mother, said Jessie humbly. If you hadn't come today, I believe Flory would have died. I was so weak and sick myself, I couldn't do right for her. I haven't been real strong since the summer. A month later, the house at the center was locked up and the windows boarded over. Spencer Gamble and his wife and child had moved to the big house on the hill. End of Section 11, The Knuckling Down of Mrs. Gamble, recording by Brenda J. Davis. Section 12 of Uncollected Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 12. The Children's Garden. Come with me and see the children's garden, said a dear old lady with lovely silvery puffs of hair and bright dark eyes to me once. I knew that all her own children were long ago grown up and scattered from the Atlantic to the Pacific, and even further, 
but I also knew she had many grandchildren who loved to spend the vacation days at the old homestead, and I went with her, expecting to see, perhaps, a little plot of ground, somewhat untidily cultivated by childish hands, with straggling beds of gay-hued annals, so that when I really found myself in the garden, I stared. Is this it? I said. Miss Adair nodded. Don't dare to tell me you don't think it is a lovely place, she said. It was a lovely place. Had it been in front of the house, one might have called it a lawn, but being where it was, it was just a garden, a lovely, quaint, unworldly old garden, where trees and flowers and shrubs grew at their own sweet will in orderly confusion, just inside the gate, which was arched over by twin lilac trees, were two huge clumps of tiger lilies, like gorgeously bedight sentinels on guard. All around the enclosure, which was about two acres in extent, ran a double row of trees of all kinds, apples, pears, and plums, mixed up with white birches, branching willows, tall poplars, and even a big pine in one corner. Trees were scattered here and there all over it, and between them ran winding paths, bordered by shrubs and old-fashioned perennials, peonies and hollyhocks, foxgloves and bride's bouquet, sweet william and bleeding hearts, and a score of others. It was like no garden I had ever seen before. It was quite the sweetest and most delightful, with all the charm and distinction of really lovely old, old things. It's a place one might dream of, or in, I said. It has grown through the years. I hate brand new things, but a children's garden. Mrs. Adair smiled. You expected something different, didn't you? But this is really my children's garden. Let us sit down, and I will tell you about it. We found an old stone bench under a couple of big willows, where lilies of the valley crept about our feet with their spikes of fragrant bells. You are quite right in thinking this is a garden that has grown, said Mrs. Adair. Forty-eight years ago, my little first-born son was laid in my arms, and his father said, I've just bought the two-acre lot from Moore, wifey. We can have it for a garden, and I'll go out and stick a tree down in honor of the air. You see that magnificent willow across from us? That was Frank's birth tree, and the beginning of our garden. It just went on from that. For every baby that came to us, a new tree was planted here. That big apple tree over there is Llama's tree. The rowans on the slope are Allen's. The hedge of cherry trees on the west side were planted by his father on the day Rodney was born. Each of my ten children has a birth tree here. Then, whenever the anniversary of a birthday came around, it was commemorated by a tree. Of course, some of the birthdays were in winter, and we had to wait until spring came to plant the tree, but it was always selected on the day itself. As soon as the children grew old enough, they did their own planting. Little Tom was only three years old when he toddled home from the woods with a pine sapling and put it in the corner there. It was a few inches high. Look at it now. Twice, death came to our home and took one of our babies away but we always remembered their birthdays just the same. When the children, one by one, grew up and went away to school, we marked their vacation homecomings by some addition to our garden. When they married, we did the same thing. And to this day, whenever they come back to visit the old home, they bring something for the garden in memory of their visit. Charles is a missionary in Japan, you know. He brought and set out those Japanese maples the last time he was home. Many of them bring rare trees and shrubs now, and they are very beautiful. But I think I love best the old-fashioned things which my boys and girls planted and tended here long ago, when they were little lads and lasses and blouses and pinafores. Nowadays, the grandchildren have a share in it too, and every vacation visit leaves its souvenir here. We have never tried to keep up any formal arrangement. It was an unwritten law that anyone who planted anything here should just stick it in where he pleased. We fell into the habit of commemorating our children's successes in this way. For instance, when ten-year-old Teddy carried off the prize for general proficiency in his class, he planted one of those clumps of tiger lilies at the gate, and twelve years later, when he graduated from college, 
leader of his class, he came home and planted the other clump. So you see, my dear, this old garden is just our family history, written out in a script of leaf and blossom. Everything in it has some treasured memory attached to it, sweet or sad or merry. Edith planted these lilies of the valley here on the very first day she was able to come to the garden after a long and dangerous illness. Millicent planted the honeysuckle by the trellis on her graduation day, and that big white rosebush came from a little slip in Sarah's wedding bouquet of bride roses. Do you see that big circle of snowball trees over in the center of the garden, with the two tall silver poplars behind them? My husband and I planted the poplars on our silver wedding day, and the children planted a snowball each. Next year we hope to have our golden wedding, and something more will be added to our garden. Last year, when our eldest grandson came home with the soldier boys from South Africa, he planted the Pardeberg tree. You see it? That little maple sapling behind the poplars? The boys ran mostly to trees, you know, and the girls to flowers. When I come here, all the past seems to live again for me. I wouldn't exchange this rambling old garden for the most beautiful lawn in the world, my dear. I shouldn't think you would, I said. Why, it's sacred and the whole idea embodied in it is one of the most beautiful I've ever heard of. End of section 12. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. Section 13 of Uncollected Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery Section 13 One Mother's Opinions The little mother who was serving and the school ma'am who was curled up in an armchair were talking. The school ma'am always said she got many a hint from the little mother which helped her wonderfully in ruling her motley little subjects in the brown schoolhouse. Presently, five-year-old Winnie ran in, bubbling over with excitement about an accident that had befallen her doll. The little mother's sewing had to be laid aside while she listened to Winnie's story, sympathized, and comforted the little maid, and finally saw her run happily off to her play again. How could you stop your work and listen to it all so interestedly? when you are in a hurry to finish your sewing, asked the school ma'am. I'm sure I wouldn't have had the patience. The little mother smiled. I'm afraid I wouldn't have either, always. But last summer, I learned a lesson one day when I was calling on Mrs. Clifford. You know her daughter, Edith Clifford, that bright, handsome girl who is so clever and ambitious? Mrs. Clifford was talking to me about Edith she said that Edith never confided in her, never talked to her of her plans and hopes, her failures and successes, as she did to her own girlfriends, or as other girls did to their mothers. She said she felt completely shut out of her daughter's inner life. The tears were in her eyes as she spoke. I felt so sorry for her, and yet I couldn't help thinking she was greatly to blame herself for it although I am sure she would have been much surprised had anyone told her so. For she has always been a most affectionate and self-sacrificing mother. But often, when I was there, when Edith was a tiny girl, I have seen her come to her mother just as Winnie came to me now, eager to tell some little incident or plan, which seemed very trifling to a busy woman, but of great importance in the eyes of a child, Mrs. Clifford would push her away, sometimes impatiently, saying, Edith, dear, mother is too busy, or there, there, I haven't time to bother now. Edith's face would cloud over, and she would go away with quivering lips. What wonder if, after repeated repulses, the child came to think that none of her little interests mattered to her mother. She had grown up with that impression, and it can never be effaced. I thought of all this while Mrs. Clifford was speaking, and I made a compact with myself never to risk the loss of my child's confidence in like manner. 
I believe that if Winnie, when she comes to me in her small trials and triumphs now, always finds me ready to listen and sympathize or suggest, she will continue to do so when she grows into young girlhood. You are right, little mother, said the school ma'am. I haven't forgotten how grieved and hurt I used to be when I was a wee mite and found that grown people took no interest in what seemed so wonderful to me, or what was even worse, laughed at or ridiculed some of my childish thoughts when I tried to express them. Oh, it cut right to the bone and marrow. It is a pity that most folks never seem to realize how sensitive the blossom of a child's confidence is. At the first rude touch it shrinks and closes, never to reopen. By the way, little mother, what are you doing? Little mother laughed. Something foolish, I dare say, you'll think. You know I made these two print aprons for Lillian to wear to school. They were long, full, high-necked, and long-sleeved. Very neat and nice, I thought, besides being very serviceable. When Lillian came home from school yesterday, there were tears on her face. When I asked her what the trouble was, she said that the girls in her class had laughed at her aprons and called them baby dresses. So I am taking off the sleeves and cutting down the necks. I suppose many people would think me very foolish indeed, but I don't think I am. Of course, I think a mother should stand firm if a real principal were involved, and I don't believe in humoring mere whims or vanity either, but neither do I think that a mother ought to inflict unnecessary discomfort on a child. Lillian is very sensitive and would really suffer if she had to go on wearing those aprons at which her little world laughed. This seems very trifling to me, of course. But suppose I myself were compelled to wear a broad sum garment, no matter how serviceable it might be, which my acquaintances ridiculed. I know how I would feel. So I didn't try to scold or ridicule Lillian, and I'm fixing over the aprons. I know, nodded the school ma'am. When I was a little tot, an uncle brought me home a pair of embroidered deerskin moccasins from the West. My parents made me wear them to school, and I'll never forget how I suffered. Looking back now, I know that the moccasins were really very sweet and pretty, and I wish somebody would give me a pair like them nowadays, but nothing like them had ever been seen in my small world before, and they seemed to me very odd and bizarre. Nobody else wore such things, and I felt as if everybody were looking at my feet. How I loathed and detested those poor little gay little moccasins. They both laughed. Then the little mother said, I'm going to fess to something else so that you'll not get too much of a shock when you see him. I had Teddy's curls cut off today. Oh, little mother, protested the school ma'am. Why did you do it? I've approved of you right along, but I can't, no, I can't approve of this. His lovely long golden curls? Well, I discovered that his lovely long golden curls were so many thorns in my little son's soul. Oh, I hated to let them go. They did look so sweet and picturey when I combed them out over his velvet suit and lace collar. But poor Ted's heart was broken. He said that the other boys laughed at him and called him girl baby and offered him curl papers, and he just couldn't stand it. I had a bit of a struggle with myself. Then I thought I had no right to make Ted's life a wilderness of woe just to gratify my maternal vanity. So I took Ted to the barber's, and he is a shorn lamb now, bless his dear little round, close-clipped pate. He isn't half so pretty, but he's a great deal happier. What a wise Teddy to choose you for his little mother, said the school ma'am with a resigned sigh. End of section 13. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. Section 14 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Austin. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 14. Bright Sayings. Once upon a time there were mothers together, and they were telling the bright things their children had said. There was also a listener who listened with interest because these were real speeches of real children, and not simply funny column emanations of grown-up brains. 
Yesterday, said Mrs. Wise, I was giving my little boy a lesson in arithmetic. He is rather dull of figures, and addition seems to be a sad stumbling block to him. Now, Harry, I said, if you had four candies in one hand and five in the other, how many would you have all together? A mouthful, promptly answered Harry. That reminds me, said Mrs. Milner, who had once been a school teacher, of some answers that my pupils used to give me. One little chap, on being asked what a glacier was, said it was a man who put in window frames. Gladys wanted to know the other day, said Mrs. Campbell, if her kitty had a soul, and if so, would he have a little heaven all to himself when he died? Last summer, said Mrs. Price, my sister's little Mary, a small mite who had never been in the country before, spent a month with us on our farm. One day she said to me, Oh, Aunt Lena, I feel so much gooder here than in town. Why, I feel so good that I say my prayers two or three times through the day. The real humor of children's sayings consists in their earnestness, said Mrs. Hay, laughing. They are always so very solemn. Last summer, we spent a fortnight at a farmhouse where they had several of those monstrosities known as curly hens. Just as soon as four-year-old Henrietta caught sight of one of them, she exclaimed, Oh, Mama, that hen has put on its feathers wrong side out. There was another small boy in the second primer class who could not learn to spell. All his gray matter went into the theory and practice of mischief, apparently. One day I was trying to get him to spell speckled, but he could not get it right at all. At last, after trying every combination of letters you could imagine, besides several you couldn't, he said, well, teacher, I can't spell it, but I know what it means. His impish grin might have warned me, but I was inexperienced and said rashly, well, Arthur, what does it mean? George Howat's face, ma'am. George was celebrated in the school for his freckles. I had to laugh myself, and so did all the scholars. But I think George paid Arthur up for his joke at recess. Since we are on the subject, said Mrs. Sunderland, I must tell you our latest family joke. The other day, a gentleman who gave his name as Mr. Lord called to see Robert. I showed him the parlor and went out to find Robert. As I crossed the hall, my little three-year-old Jack said, Mama, who is in there? Mr. Lord, I responded as I hurried out. Mr. Lord himself told me what happened after that. Jack pattered away to the parlor, pushed open the door softly and tiptoed in, looking at the caller with an expression of mingled awe and curiosity. Mr. Lord held out his hand and said, Well, little chap, come here. So Jack sidled up, put one grimy little hand on Mr. Lord's knee, and said very reverently, Are you God? It took Mr. Lord some seconds to grasp the situation. Then he couldn't help laughing so heartily that I fear poor Jackie's ideas of divinity got a rude shock. The tears welled up in his eyes, and he ran indignantly away. When I heard the story, I had to laugh too, but it took me a good hour to comfort Jackie and straighten out his theology a bit. After the laugh, which greeted Mrs. Sutherland's story, had subsided, Mrs. Norton said, That makes me think of what Dottie said the other night. She is just three years old, too. That seems to be the worst age for visitations of acuteness. I had put her to bed at dusk and said to her, Now, Dottie, you won't be frightened to go to sleep here alone, will you? Just remember that God is right here with you all the time. All right, responded Dot cheerfully. I went down, but in a few minutes heard her calling me. Going to the foot of the stairs, I asked her what she wanted. Oh, Mama, said a tearful voice. Won't you come up here and stay with God and let me go down and stay with Papa? Now, said the minister's wife, I'm going to tell you what one of my Sunday school class said last Sunday. The lesson was on the translation of Elijah and the falling of the mantle on Elisha. Now, I said at the end, what was it Elijah left to Elisha when he went to heaven? At once, a tiny maiden of five lisped out gravely and reverently, his old clothes. The mother's meeting broke up at this point, and the listener laughed and scribbled in her notebook. 
End of 14. Section 15 of Uncollected Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 15 Margaret's Books. Margaret Hartley put down the letter which she had been reading and looked in a somewhat homesick fashion out through the window of the little log schoolhouse across the prairies that were dull and gray in the late autumn weather. It was the noon hour, and Margaret had eaten her dinner out of the little tin pail in which Mrs. Murray always put it up and smiled when she thought how Bert and Patty would laugh to see her, but Bert and Patty and home were far away. The little schoolroom, with its shabby desks and tattered maps, was very quiet. The younger scholars were playing down by the spring under the willow bluff. In a corner of the room, a group of five girls, all of whom were as old as Margaret herself, were poring intently over a paper which Lizzie Ryan and Sue Robertson held between them. Now and then, the silence was broken by a long-drawn sigh of excitement from one of the quintet or a whispered question as to whether they all had finished the page. When Margaret had read and reread her letter, she found time to wonder in what the big girls were so interested. Generally, during noon hour, they lounged about the schoolroom and discussed Lindsay gossip with a zest which made their teacher half sorry and half contemptuous. The contempt, however, was always checked when she remembered that these girls had nothing else to talk about. With so little to broaden or beautify their bare, narrow lives, it was small wonder that this one's marriage and that one's beau, this family scandal and that family quarrel, filled up their thoughts and conversation. Sometimes Margaret tried to talk with them about books and art and the great events and discoveries of the busy age. The girls listened with an almost pitiful interest, but they could not discuss that of which they knew and understood nothing, and the result was a rather dismal monologue. They were bright girls, too, eager to learn and to make the most of their limited opportunities. There were many more like them in Lindsay who did not come to school, and Margaret would have liked to help them, but she did not know how. Presently, Margaret got up and went down the aisle to the corner where the girls sat. So absorbed were they in their paper that they did not heed her approach, and she stood by Rosetta Carney's side for a few minutes unnoticed. The paper they were reading was a cheap illustrated one. The particular story over which Rosetta and her friends were poring was entitled Beautiful Dolores's Lovers, or The Mystery Midnight Marriage at Haddington Hall, and the page was garnished with the picture of a wild-eyed young lady being carried off bodily by a young man with a magnificent mustache, presumably the villain, while a weird old crone exulted in the background. Presently, Rosetta, becoming aware of the teacher's presence, looked up with flushed cheeks and overbright eyes. Oh, Miss Hartley, it is such a splendid story, she said breathlessly. I declare I can hardly wait from one week to another for it. Oh, girls, why would you read such stories, said Margaret. They are absolute trash. Surprise and wonder were depicted on her listeners' faces. Perhaps Louise Thompson the oldest girl and best scholar in the school, understood her teacher's meaning more clearly than the others, for she colored slightly and said in a somewhat resentful tone, We've nothing else to read, Miss Hartley. People here are thankful for any kind of reading matter when winter comes. Rena's aunt down east sends her this paper, and she hands it all round. I don't see any harm in these stories. There may be no positive harm in them, said Margaret gently, but they are silly and exaggerated and present very distorted views of life. I don't like to see my girls reading them. Mother reads them too, said Rosetta Carney sullenly, and she thinks they are just splendid. Margaret was silent. She went back to her desk, and the girls, after a few doubtful whispers, returned to the history of beautiful Dolores's lovers, of whom she seemed to have so many that the greatest mystery was how their historian ever managed to keep track of them all. Louise Thompson alone had lost her interest. That evening, she walked home with Margaret and reverted somewhat shamefacedly to the noon incident. 
I suppose, Miss Hartley, you think we are very foolish girls to get so interested in those stories, but they are kind of exciting when you get into them, and we've nothing much to read. I understand, said Margaret sympathetically, but Louise, I really think it would be better not to read anything at all than to read that trash. It isn't wholesome. But it's so dull here, pleaded Louise. You don't know how dreadful it is in winter, the long evenings with nothing to do. We wouldn't want those papers if we had anything better. That evening, when Margaret was sitting alone in the room, an idea came to her that made her frown and look wistfully at her bookcase. It was a big one, and well filled with dainty volumes in the choicest bindings. She sat down before them and looked them over. Histories and biographies, volumes of poems and essays, books of travel and exploration and science, together with the best fiction of the master storytellers. The bookcase contained the very cream of her down east library. I hate to do it, but I will, she said. The next day was Saturday, and Margaret went to town on her wheel. She brought back a bottle of mucilage and as much brown paper as she could carry. By night, all the volumes in her bookcase were swathed in stout covers, and a blank book with spaces ruled for entry had been added to them. Monday afternoon in school, Margaret made an announcement which created quite a sensation and sent ripples of excitement all over Lindsay before night. It was to the effect that she intended to open up a small circulating library with her books, and anyone who wished could get a book on Saturday afternoons at her boarding house. The idea was a success from the start. Every Saturday afternoon, there was a crowd of eager applicants at Mrs. Murray's. Not only the girls and boys, but their fathers and mothers came for books. At the noon hour, Margaret no longer found it difficult to talk with her girls. They were all ready and eager to discuss what they had read and ask for explanation concerning things they had not understood. A sort of informal literary club sprang up in Lindsay. Margaret wrote home, and Bert and Patty sent up dozens of old magazines and reviews that were new to the Lindsay people. Louise Thompson was a valuable and active assistant in Margaret's enterprise, and it would have been hard to say which was the more alert and interested. When the spring came and Margaret's thoughts turned homeward, she made another little sacrifice cheerfully. I'm going to leave these books here for the club, she told Louise. They will serve as a nucleus for a good library. When I go home, I will send you papers and magazines regularly. The rest depends on yourselves. Rosetta and I have been talking the matter over, said Louise brightly, and we have lots of plans. Next winter, said Margaret, I advise you to form yourselves into a literary society with a constitution, meet regularly in the schoolhouse for discussion, and charge a small membership fee to cover expenses. New ways and ideas will come to you all the time. I think there's no fear of your lapsing back to midnight murders and gruesome mysteries. No, I think not, said Louise, frankly. You know, my brother used to read those stories, and he was awful discontented. He grumbled all the time about the dull life here and slaving to no purpose and all that. He wanted to go away, to some big city. Well, he doesn't talk like that at all now, and he's real well satisfied. He was reading the Oregon Trail last night, and he thought it was just splendid. When Louise had gone, Margaret went to her bookcase and looked at the well-read volumes and eloquent gaps with satisfied eyes. I'm so glad I did it, she said. I'm ashamed now to think how hard it was at first. End of section 15. Recording by Marcia Epic Harris. Section 16 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 16. Syriac's Pony, A Story of School Days. Lockport, November 2nd, 18 blank. My dear Jack, your letter has gone unanswered for a long time, but, to tell the truth, I haven't felt like writing letters lately. I've been all mixed up. 
You said in your letter that Bert Sawyer had written you that there had been a bit of a rumpus in school, and that Bob Morrison and I had been mixed up in it, and you wanted to know all about it. Well, I'll try to tell you, although I won't enjoy the telling very much. However, somebody else will be sure to tell you if I don't, and maybe get things crooked. So here goes to tell you just what happened. To begin with, when school reopened in September, Syriac Bort came to school. You don't know Syriac, of course. He is a French-Canadian boy and belongs to that wretched little settlement called St. Anne, about six miles back in the country. You remember we went through it on our wheels last summer, and you said you thought it the most poverty-stricken place you'd ever seen. It's just as poor as it looks, and so are the people in it. Syriac's family is about the poorest of them all, but it seems that Syriac is ambitious in spite of his poverty. He had gone to the little third-rate school at St. Anne until he had learned all the teachers there could teach him, and then he determined to attend Lockport School for a year before trying the entrance examination for the Dayton High School. How we sixth-grade boys howled when we found that Syriac meant to try for the scholarship for which we all meant to compete ourselves. He didn't look as if he could spell C-A-T cat, so Bob Morrison said, and so we all thought. But it was a big mistake to judge Syriac by his looks, as we soon found out. But there is no use talking, Jack. He did look funny. He was a tall, lanky fellow and looked all wrists and ankles, for his trousers and coat sleeves were four inches too short for him. And such patches! Patches everywhere, and of every color and size. And never a vestige of tie or collar, of course. He had a great shock of whitish-colored hair, a long, brown, stolid sort of face, and big, inky black eyes. Sleepy-looking chap, I thought. But I tell you, a fellow would have to get up early to get ahead of that same Syriac. His brains were all right, there wasn't a doubt of that. To be sure, he talked English with a fearful accent, and when he tried to read Latin, he convulsed the class, and even Mr. Unsworth had to look the other way. But just give Syriac pen and ink and a clean sheet of fool's cap, and accent didn't count there. In the monthly examinations at the end of September, Syriac came out ten percent ahead of everyone, even of Bob Morrison and your humble servant, who used to think themselves the flowers of the flock. It was a pretty stiff dose for us all, and especially for Bob and me. Here was this backwoods fellow whom we had despised and made fun of, with his patched clothes and fronty accent and his big, brown, work-hardened paws, walking off with all our class honors as easy as rolling off a log. We were surprised and mad at the same time. Indeed, all the sixth-grade boys felt cut up, except the stupid ones who hadn't expected to mark high anyhow, and were just as glad to see Syriac take us top chaps down a peg or two as not. But mad or not, there was no changing the fact that there at the head of Mr. Unsworth's report was the name of Syriac Bort, with ninety-eight per cent to his credit. It rankled in our minds a bit, Bob's and mine, and we were just asking for a chance to pay Syriac back in some way. Mean? Yes, of course it was mean. Dirt mean. I see that now, and you'd better believe me I feel ashamed of myself. But I was so sore just then after getting beaten in examinations that I was a regular cad. We didn't have to look long for a chance to play a trick on Syriac. There was one ready to hand. Syriac, of course, couldn't walk six miles to school every morning and then home again at night, so he rode on a pony that looked as if it might have come out of the ark as far as age went. We found out that he had worked all haying and harvest with a man over at Swampscott in payment for the nag. It was so old that it was gray in spots, and it was blind in one eye and lame in one leg, and so thin you could count its ribs. Altogether, I'll bet a hat, Jack, you never saw such a specimen in your life, and we boys tormented the life out of Syriac about his sorry steed. Syriac always took our personal slurs and jokes with perfect good humor, but it made him mad when we sneered at Napoleon Bonaparte. That was the pony's name. He was as fond of Nap as if he had been a beauty, and took just as much care of him. When he came to school in the morning, Nap was carefully tethered where he could get grass and water and shade. At recesses, Syriac would go and talk to him, and at night, he mounted him and ambled off up the road as proud as a king. Well, Bob and I thought it would be a good joke on Syriac 
to take old Nap away and tether him someplace where he couldn't find him when school came out. Syriac would have to trudge home for once, and it would give him a jolly good scare if he thought his precious horse was lost. So one day when school went in after the last recess, Bob and I hung back a bit, and as soon as everybody had disappeared, we rushed to where Nap was tied. Bob untied his rope and led him up a lane in the woods for about a quarter of a mile, coming out where that little bridge crosses the Lockport Millbrook on Simon Crossway's land. You've been there, Jack, on trouting expeditions, and you know how deep and steep the banks are, and that there isn't any railing on the bridge. Bob tied old Nap good and solid to a birch tree, and we left him there, nibbling peacefully at the grass. Nap was always eating, but it never seemed to fatten him any, poor old fellow. We hurried back to school then, and slipped in unnoticed while Mr. Unsworth was hearing the junior botany. When school came out, Syriac shambled off to Nap's usual haunt, but, of course, no Nap was to be found. Wasn't Syriac in a stew? Not that he made a fuss, you know. That wasn't Syriac's way. But anyone could see that he felt worried. He hunted around everywhere near, but he didn't find Nap, and finally he started to walk home. Some of the boys told him that Nat must have got loose and gone home, and Syriac looked as if he were trying to believe it, but couldn't. I suppose he knew as well as the rest of us that poor old Nap hadn't enterprise enough to start off anywhere alone. Bob and I hung around until all the other chaps had gone home. Then we started, intending to bring Nap back and tie him up in the old spot. Wouldn't Syriac look bewildered when he came and saw him in the morning? He will worry all night about him when he finds he isn't home, said Bob. Then we chuckled as if Bob had said something witty. But when we got to Crossway's Bridge, we didn't chuckle. No, Jack, my boy, we didn't feel a bit like it. Poor old Nap had strayed over to the bridge, giving his rope a twist around another tree at the edge as he did so. And then, owing, I suppose, to his blind eye, he had fallen over the bridge, and there he hung dead as a doornail. Well, Jack, I simply can't describe how Bob and I felt, so I won't try. And we were thoroughly scared, too, for we thought there'd be an awful fuss and likely as not the mischief to pay all round. There was nothing we could do. Poor old Nap was dead, beyond doubt, and we couldn't even haul him up. So the only thing is just to leave him here and cut for home, said Bob. We can't bring Nap back to life now. I wish we'd never touched him, I said disconsolately. Oh, so do I, growled Bob. But what good is wishing going to do? He wasn't worth his pasture anyhow. So home we went, the cheapest feeling boys in Lockport. I tell you, Jack, I put in a miserable night. I was sure we were in for a scrape, and I felt sorry for Syriac, too. I hope, old fellow, that you'll never be in such a mixed-up state of conscience as I was that night. Well, next morning Syriac was at the school bright and early looking for Nap. He had walked all the way from home. He hunted all the morning, and at last he found him. Nobody knows how he took it, but when he reappeared at the school he looked awfully cut up. Bob wasn't in school at all. He had left Lockport that morning for a week's visit with some cousins at Swampscott. He'd been invited there for some time, but if it hadn't been for old Nap's hanging himself— I'll bet Bob would never have gone holidaying in term time. I must say I thought it shabby of Bob to leave me to face the music alone, but for a wonder, there wasn't any fuss. It never seemed to enter into Syriac's head to blame any of the schoolboys for kidnapping his pony. Instead, he declared that it was Leon Poirier who had been hired at Crossways all summer and who had an old grudge against Syriac. Leon had left Lockport that very day to hire with a man ten miles up country, and Syriac believed that he had revenged himself upon Nap before going. Mr. Unsworth did hold a bit of an investigation, and asked us all in turn if we had tied Nap at the bridge. I said no with the rest. It was true enough, for Bob had done the tying. But there's no use in talking, Jack. I felt mean, mean, mean. Well, Syriac had no pony to carry him to school now, but the third day after the inquest, as the boys called it, he turned up again, looking tired to death, for he had walked the whole way, and he wasn't at all strong. That night going home, he got well drenched in a shower, and there was no Syriac at school the next morning. 
Three days later, John Carslake's hired boy, Jerry, brought word from St. Anne that Syriac Boat was down with pneumonia. Ammonia, Jerry called it, as a consequence of getting so wet that day, and the doctor didn't think he would live. Bob was back at school by this time, and he just turned as white as a sheet when George Carslake told him the news. I guess I did, too. When Bob and I got together, we were as solemn as crows. If Syriac dies, said Bob miserably, it will be our fault, or mine, I should say, since I was most to blame. As for me, I felt too wretched to say anything. I wouldn't live over those next four days for anything. But at last, we heard that Syriac was getting better. Talk about reprieves to condemned criminals. Bob and I know just how they feel. We got together that day at recess and had a consultation. Now, well, what is to be done? said Bob. Syriac's getting better, but he can't come back to school if he has to walk. That is plain. We've just got to get him another pony in place of nap, that's all, I said. I've been saving up to buy a bicycle, and I've got fifteen dollars. I'll give that. I'd rather have a clear conscience again than all the bicycles in the world. So would I, agreed Bob. Well, I haven't any money, but I think I know a way to get some. Next day, Bob turned up with twenty dollars. He looked glum and triumphant by turns. "'How did you make it out, Bob?' I asked. "'Sold wrecks,' answered Bob, briefly. He didn't say another word, and I didn't either. I knew what a sacrifice Bob had made. Rex was the very apple of his eye. He was a beautiful Gordon setter pup that Bob's Uncle Henry had given him, and every boy in Lockport had envied Bob that dog. We had to hunt around for a couple of days before we found a pony for our price, but we finally bought one from Stephen Cook over at White Bay. He was a bit old and slow, the pony, I mean, not Stephen, but he had two good eyes and was worth a dozen naps. Then Bob and I took him over to St. Anne and went to Jerome Woods. Syriac's mother met us at the door. She was a great, big, fat, jolly-looking woman, and she couldn't speak a word of English. Bob and I had quite a time making her understand that we wanted to see Syriac, but we succeeded at last, and she towed us into the little bedroom where he was lying, looking so thin and white, with his big, black, hollow eyes, that I felt choky. You should have seen his face light up when we went in. How glad he was! And he began to ask questions about the school and Mr. Unsworth and the classwork so fast that we couldn't keep up with him or get a chance to tell him what we came for. But at last his mother jabbered away in French a bit to him, and I suppose she told him he mustn't talk too much and hurt himself, for he got quiet, and then Bob began. He told the whole story, plump and plain, and I helped him out here and there when he got stuck. Syriac listened, with his eyes getting bigger and bigger, and when Bob told him that we had brought another pony for him in Knapp's place and asked him to forgive us, he gave a great swallow. "'That's all right, boys,' he said, and it was all he ever did say. He tried to get out something about thanking us, but we stopped him right up and told him that if he could forgive us for one mean trick and for having nearly killed him, it would be for us to thank him.' But we went to see Syriac often after that, and as soon as he was well enough to come back to school, we sixth-grade fellows gave him a rousing reception. Of course the story got out, but nobody said much to Bob and me, not even Mr. Unsworth, although of course it made lots of talk in the school. Syriac is head of the class again, and of course he'll get the Dayton scholarship. Nobody will grudge it to him, for he is a regular brick, and we all like him, and he can talk English and read Latin quite well now. I shall tell you more general news in my next letter, when I won't have Syriac and his pony so much on my brain. We all miss you in class this winter and wish you were back. Yours fraternally, Will. End of section 16。section 17 of uncollected short stories of L. M. Montgomery。this is a librivox recording。All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen Arnold. 
Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery Section 17 What Became of a Dare A Story for Young Folks It was such a rainy afternoon that Josie and I had to stay in the house. This we disliked very much, for we loved to be out of doors. Josie and I were cousins, and we were both twelve years old. We had never met until this summer when I had come down from my city home to spend my vacation at Uncle Donald's farm. I thought I had never seen a lovelier place than Morningside, with its wide apple orchards, its splendid barns scented with hay, and the big green beech woods which towered behind them. I thought Josie was lovely too. I admired her bright black eyes, round rosy cheeks, and brisk country ways very much. Of course, she knew a great deal more about farm life and ways than I did and thought me very green. She even made fun of me at times, but as I always cheerfully acknowledged my ignorance, we never quarreled, and by dint of keeping my eyes open and profiting by Josie's instructions when she was in a condescending mood, I soon gathered quite a respectable fund of information concerning the birds, bugs, flowers, and trees at Morningside Farm. Uncle Donald and Aunt Harriet and Josie's elder brother and sister were very indulgent to us, and we were allowed quite as much of our own way as was good for us. The only thing that vexed Uncle Donald seriously was our habit of daring. He had no patience with this at all. Josie had become addicted to the practice at school, where it evidently flourished. I was initiated into it on the very day of my arrival at the farm— when Josie had taken me out to show me her brood of ducks and dared me to walk the rail of the poultry yard fence. I did not exactly know the code of daring, but instinct and Josie's mischievous eyes told me that my reputation for spunk was at stake and that if I failed, I would never recover lost ground. So I bravely climbed to the topmost rail, balanced myself, and tried to walk along it. Needless to say, I promptly tumbled off. For with the best intentions in the world, one cannot walk fence rails without some practice. But the fact that I had not hesitated to attempt the feat was in my favor, and Josie, after having shown her contempt for my feeble effort by mounting the fence and walking erectly down the rail, was graciously pleased to state that I would do, and we were fast friends from that time. Seldom a day passed, however, that we did not dare each other to do something— Naturally, Josie had the advantage of me, but I never took a dare, no matter what the consequences might be, and they were often unpleasant enough, as, for instance, when Josie dared me to walk through the pig pen yard. While I was doing this in mortal terror, one of the pigs ran at me, and in the rush and scramble which ensued, I scratched my hands and ruined my dress on the nails in the fence. As a result, I got a hearty scolding from Aunt Harriet while poor Josie was punished for daring me by being deprived of pudding for dinner. Now, a rainy day had come, and there could be no picnicking in our playhouse, no picking berries in the pond pasture, no fishing for trout over the bridge. In short, none of our dearly beloved delights. We must be good and quiet, because Aunt Bethia was an invalid and couldn't stand noise. But after dinner, Josie had an inspiration and asked her mother if we might go and play in the garret. Permission, hedged about with sundry warnings and prohibitions, having been given, we scampered joyfully off and climbed the dim, dusty stairs. I had never been in the garret at Morningside, and its appearance was quite a surprise to me. "'Nice place, isn't it?' asked Josie, surveying its effect on me with evident satisfaction. It was a nice place, for it was gloriously suggestive of games— It ran the whole length of the big farmhouse. Along the sides were ranged boxes and old trunks, while bunches of herbs, bundles of knitting yarn, and other odd articles were suspended from the beams. At one end, the rag room, as it was called, was partitioned off from the rest of the garret. It was full of old clothes, bags of rags, broken furniture, and odds and ends. The kitchen chimney went up through it and was hung around with bundles of soft, fluffy rolls ready for spinning. What a time we had, to be sure. But after a long play spell, we grew tired and sat down on an old trunk to have a talk. This is splendid in daytime, I said, but it must be awfully dismal at night. Mice, said Josie with a shiver, and spiders, fancy, and ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts. 
I said scornfully. There isn't any such thing. Oh, isn't there? said Josie mysteriously. You don't know Elma Stanley. Well, did you ever see one? I demanded. Josie had to admit that she never had. But I know someone who did, she added triumphantly. Old Mrs. Jenkins down at the corner saw one night. I heard her tell about it. What was it like? I asked, curiosity getting the better of my skepticism. Well, said Josie with a glance around, for the garret was getting dusky. It was all in white, you know, and awful tall, and had living coals for eyes. It had so. Mrs. Jenkins said so, and she wouldn't tell a lie, you know. What did the ghost do to Mrs. Jenkins? I asked, with a shiver of conviction, for Josie's last argument had been quite unanswerable. Nothing. It just walked past her and shook a long, bony hand. Mrs. Jenkins said she knew it was a warning and that she would die inside of nine days. But that was a year ago, and she is alive yet, so that couldn't have been what the ghost meant. Do you suppose this garret is haunted? They say garrets always are. Nonsense, I said scoffingly. Something has to be done in a place before it can be haunted. Somebody killed or something like that, you know. And anyway, there's no such things as ghosts. It is easy to talk like that, said Josie sagely, but I don't believe that you would stay in this garret alone at night. I wouldn't mind a bit, I declared rashly. Then I dare you to do it, cried Josie maliciously. I dare you to come up here alone at bedtime and sleep here at night. Then I saw where my boasting had led me. I was between two fires. On one hand was the prospect of spending a night in the garret. On the other was the certainty that Josie would never let me hear the last of it if I failed to make good my words. Terrible as was the former alternative, it was less so than the latter, and I said, trying to speak as boldly as possible, I'll do it, Josie Bell, and I'm not afraid to either. Josie looked at me with a trace of reluctant admiration. The mice will run over you. You know you're scared to death of mice. And perhaps you will see a ghost. Ugh, I wouldn't be you for anything, Elma Stanley. What will I sleep on? I asked, trying to turn the conversation. For at every word of Josie's, I found my miserable courage ebbing away. There's an old feather bed in the rag room, said Josie. We'll drag it out here, and you can bring up your share of the bedclothes and a pillow. Of course, we mustn't let on a word to the others, or they won't let you do it. You'll come crawling down again in mortal terror, I know. I won't, then, I said stoutly. You'll see. Come down to tea now. It's getting dark here already. At nine o'clock that night, Josie and I slipped away to our room quite unnoticed, for Aunt Thea was having one of her spells, and everybody who was not in her room was in the kitchen getting up a roaring fire to heat water. It's a splendid chance for you to get up to the garret without being seen, said Josie. You look awfully scared, Alma. I had no doubt that I did, but I resented Josie's saying so. At least I had no thought of backing out. "'You must help me carry up the clothes,' I said. "'Deed and I won't,' returned Josie promptly. "'Couldn't pay me to set a foot up there at this hour of the night. "'Something might grab me coming down the stairs. "'I'll tell you what I will do, though. "'I'll hold the candle at the foot for you to see your way up.' "'It was no use to coax Josie, "'so I began to mount the stairs, "'carrying my pillow and dragging a sheet and spread.' When I reached the top and saw the long, desolate room before me, I almost faltered. But a glimpse of Josie's malicious face at the bottom decided me. Good night, I called out, brave. Good night. Don't let the rats carry you off, was Josie's cheerful parting salute. Then the little glimmer of light vanished. The stair door was shut, and I was alone. A pale stream of moonlight fell through the gable window down the center of the long, ghostly room. But all along the walls was shadow, and the things hanging from the beams assumed weird, grotesque shapes in the dim light. I do not know how I managed to creep along the floor to my bed, glancing fearfully over my shoulder at every step. Just at that moment, if I could have found myself safely out of the garret, I would not have cared if Josie had taunted me all of my life. But when I was once snuggled down under my quilt, things were not so bad. As the minutes passed quickly by and nothing dreadful happened, my courage returned and I ventured to look around. 
My eyes soon grew accustomed to the dim light, and the suspended objects no longer terrified me by their unearthly appearance. After all, the garret by moonlight was not such a very bad place, and I began to feel quite brave and confident. To be sure, the wind outside was making a dismal noise about the eaves. I could also hear the rats and mice of Josie's cheerful prophecies scrambling among the boxes, and I drew up my toes with an involuntary shiver. I thought of Mrs. Jenkins' ghost, too, as well as every other ghost I had ever heard of. But at last I fell sound asleep. I do not know how long I slept, but I began to dream a dreadful dream. I thought the door of the rag room opened and that Mrs. Jenkins' ghost came out and advanced down the moonlight path to my bed. I watched its progress in fascinated horror. Yes, there it was, tall and white, with the eyes of flame and smoke issuing from its mouth and nostrils. Now it had reached my bed, its bony hand was extended to touch me, and I awoke with a shudder and found myself sitting bolt upright. The garret was quiet and untenanted, save by myself. The ghost of my dreams, with blazing eyes and bony hands, was gone. But the smell of smoke was not. It was still distinctly there. I turned my eyes to the rag room. Through the cracks of the partition, I saw ruddy, flickering gleams of light, and smoke was curling through the crevices. I sprang from my bed, rushed to the door, and threw it open. To my terrified eyes, it seemed as if the room and everything it contained was a mass of flames. The next moment, I went screaming down the garret stairs, burst open the door, and rushed to Uncle Donald's room. "'What on earth is the matter?' I heard Uncle's sleepy voice exclaiming. "'The rag room is on fire!' I screamed, and after that I don't really know what happened. In a few minutes, the whole household was aroused, and Uncle, Aunt, Jack, Bessie, and the hired man were dashing up and down the garret stairs with pails of water. For nearly an hour they fought the fire, while Josie and I, bidden to keep out of the way, huddled forlornly in our room. At last the fire was out and we crept into the hall, where the others were assembled. "'That was a close call,' said Uncle Donald, wiping the perspiration from his grimy face. "'I believe ten minutes later would have been too late. Those rolls must have caught from the flu somehow. We had such a fire on in the range for Bethia. I have always said, Harriet, that it wasn't safe to have those rolls and feathers so close to the flu. But how on earth did you come to discover it, Elma?' "'I... I was sleeping in the garret.' I said shamefacedly. "'Sleeping in the garret?' exclaimed Aunt Harriet. "'Yes. Josie dared me. She said I'd be too scared to stay there, and I said I wouldn't. And I fell asleep and woke up and smelled smoke.' "'The idea,' said Uncle, trying to speak sternly but failing. "'Well, I can't scold you now, for your prank has certainly been the means of saving the house. But do let this end your nonsense.' Go to bed now, like good girls. I never saw anybody so subdued as Josie was when we crept away to our room. I'll never dare anyone again as long as I live, she declared. Elma Stanley, just suppose that you hadn't wakened up till it was too late and you had been smothered or burnt to death. It would have been all my fault, and just think how I should have felt. It was not until the next day that Josie remembered to ask me about the ghost. Did you see it? she said. No, but I dreamed I did. And after all, Joe, you know there's no such thing. Well, I suppose there isn't, admitted Josie. But if it wasn't a ghost Mrs. Jenkins saw, what was it? I am sure I don't know, I said. But I expect she dreamed it, just as I did. And there the matter rests to this day. End of Section 17 What Became of a Dare A Story for Young Folks Recording by Colleen Arnold. Section number 18 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 18. Teddy's Mother It was a public holiday, and almost everybody in Dalton had gone to see the football game at Satan between the Dalton Wanderers and the Satan College men. But William Fielding had decided to spend the day in his office. 
His wife and his two daughters were in Europe. He did not care for football, and there was a good deal of extra work to be done. I'll have a good look into these papers in the C&R Railroad case today, he thought as he entered his office. The big building seemed unusually quiet and hushed. He reflected with satisfaction that he was not likely to be disturbed by callers. Later in the day, he remembered that he had not read the letter which he had found in his box on the way downtown. It was addressed to him in a somewhat tremulous hand and bore the post office stamp of a little village at the other side of the continent. Mother writes a good hand for a woman of her age, he thought as he opened it. The letter was short and written on cheap blue lined paper with frequent lapses of spelling and grammar. It told all the simple home news and bits of gossip about neighbors whom he had half forgotten. On the last page, the handwriting grew shakier. She was feeling terrible lonesome, she wrote. It seems so long since I've seen you, William. Can you come home for a spell this summer when Marion is in Europe? You haven't been in home for ten years, William, I'm thinking. I do so long to see my dear boy. Mr. Fielding frowned slightly as he folded the letter up. He drummed his fingers on the desk. His mother's request had come at a peculiarly inconvenient time. To be sure, he had often felt that he ought to go and see her, but he had always been too busy, he could not spare the time. A trip is to be worthwhile at all would take at least two months. I can't possibly go this summer anyhow, he reflected impatiently. Those nine cases are coming on next month. I suppose Morton could attend to them, but I should hardly care to trust them solely to him. Then there's the house to look after while Marion is away, and I've promised Tremaine to spend my vacation hunting silvertips in the mountain with him. Mother must wait until next summer. I'll write her just how it is. She'll understand. Mother was always a famous hand to understand a fellow. But he did not feel altogether satisfied as he began his letter. He determined to write a good, long, newsy letter by way of a salve to his conscience, remembering with some shame the hasty scrawls he had fallen into the habit of sending her. A rap at the door interrupted him. Come in, he called impatiently, wondering who it could be. The figure that appeared in the doorway was quaint enough to provoke a smile. A little old woman, such a tiny scrap of a woman, with delicate bleached features and bright dark eyes. Under a very old-fashioned bonnet of quilted black satin, her silvery hair was twisted down over her ears in a fashion which Mr. Fielding remembered seeing old ladies in his boyhood. Her dress was a dull-colored print, plain and neat, and she wore a gay paisley shawl. In one hand she carried a huge bunch of sweet peas, and in the other a small covered basket. She flashed a quick glance over the room. Oh, ain't Teddy here? She faltered, disappointedly. Teddy! Mr. Fielding remembered that young Windham, the clever young lawyer next door, was called Teddy by his friends. This was probably his mother. He knew that Wyndham belonged in the country. He rose and offered the little lady a chair. If you mean Mr. Wyndham, his office is next door, but I'm afraid you won't find him there either. I think he has gone to the football match at Satan. This is a public holiday, you know. No, I didn't know, sir. There was a tremor in her voice and her lips quivered suddenly. If I had known it, I wouldn't have come. Do you know when Teddy will be back? Not before night, I'm afraid, Mrs. Windham. The game won't be over until late in the afternoon, and I believe there is to be a banquet in the evening. And I must go home on the afternoon train. I won't see Teddy at all. Well, I suppose it serves me right for not sending him word I was coming. Ted always likes me to send him word so he can meet me at the train and look after me. But I thought I'd just like to surprise him, and anyhow... I took the notion sudden like this morning, and I brought him a basket of jelly tarts. Ted is so fond of jelly tarts, and is posy. Ted likes flowers. Maybe you'd like to keep them, sir. Tis in no use lugging them back. They'd only fade. She gave a little choke of disappointment, in spite of her efforts to suppress it. Mr. Fielding felt as uncomfortable as if he had been responsible. He got up briskly and took the flowers. Thank you, Mrs. Minham. Your sweet peas are beautiful and remind me of those which used to grow in my mother's garden away down east. I'm not so fortunate as Ted. My mother is too far away to drop in and see me. I guess she wishes she could often enough. She must miss you dreadful, said his visitor simply. It don't seem as if I could live if I didn't see Ted every once in a little while. He knows that and he comes out most every week for all he's so busy. 
If he can't come, he sends a great long letter just full of fun and jokes. Teddy is an awful good son, sir. Mr. Fielding felt still more uncomfortable as he hunted out a glass for his sweet peas. Perhaps the contrast between his conduct and Ted's came home to him sharply. The little lady, who was evidently fond of talking, went on. As I came along on the train, I was just thinking what good times we'd have today. Last time he was out, Teddy promised me a drive in the park next time I came to town. I'm real disappointed, but it's all my own fault. I should have remembered it was a holiday. The gentle little voice ended in a sigh. The lawyer noticed that she had looked very tired. Under the impulse of a sudden idea, he said, Mrs. Windham, I think you must let me act as Ted's proxy today. You will be my little mother and I'll give you as good a time as possible. You shall have your drive in the park. Mrs. Windham looked at him, doubtfully yet eagerly. Oh, sir, you, but you're busy. No, I'm not, or I oughtn't to be. I'm beginning to think I'm a very unpatriotic citizen pegging away here instead of enjoying my holiday. We will have a splendid time. My name is Fielding, and I assure you I'm considered a very respectable person. The first thing is lunch. I know you're hungry, and so am I. So come along. Remember, I'm to be your son for the day. A pink flush of delight spread over her tiny face. I guess you know what mother's like, she said gleefully, and I know how much your mother must think of you, and you of her, when you're so good to other boys' mothers. Oh, I'm real glad to go with you, sir. I don't know anybody here, and I always feel kind of bewildered when I haven't had to stick to. May I leave these jelly tarts here? Yes, I'll lock them up in my desk, said Mr. Fielding boyishly. Tell get them when he comes. She gave herself up to enjoyment with the abandon of a child. Her clear little laugh trolled out continually. She chattered to him as she might have done to Ted, telling him all the ins and outs of the farm at home. She did not often take a holiday, she assured him. Her husband was dead and she had run the farm for years. Ted was her only son. Such a good, kind, clever boy. There ain't many like him, if I do say it myself, she declared proudly. They had lunch together in an uptown restaurant whose splendor nearly took her breath away. Then Mr. Fielding telephoned for his own luxurious carriage and they went for their drive in the park. The busy, middle-aged lawyer felt like a boy again. He found himself talking to her of his own mother, describing the little down-east village where he was born and relating some scraps of his school days that made her laugh. That's so much like Ted, such a boy for mischief as he was. Not bad mischief, though. How proud your mother must be of you, and how often she must think of you. It is such a comfort to have a good son who doesn't forget his mother. I'm awful sorry for the poor mothers whose boys get kind of careless-like and neglectful, not writing to them or going to see them as often as they might. When the drive was over, he took her to the train. Such a good time as I've had, she said gratefully. Ted himself couldn't have given me a better treat. I think our holiday has been a success, said Mr. Fielding, genially. I know I've enjoyed being Ted's proxy ever so much. Ted always kisses me goodbye, she said archly. Mr. Fielding laughed and bent over the little old lady. There, that's one for Ted and here's another for my mother. Goodbye and safe home to you. From the window of the car she beckoned to him as the train started. Them jelly tarts, she whispered. I forgot about him. You keep him for yourself. Tittle has such good things at the bank that he won't want him. When Mr. Fielding went back to his office, he saw his half-written letter to his mother lying on the desk. He tore it in two and flung it into the wastebasket. Then he sat down and wrote, Dear little mother, your letter came today. This is not an answer to it, but merely a note to say I'll answer it in person. I'm going east as soon as I can make the necessary arrangements and you may look for me within a week or so after receiving this. We will have a real good long visit together. With much love, your affectionate son, William Fielding. So much the credit of Ted's mother, he said with a smile. And now for some of those tarts. End of section 18「Section number 19 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lola Janey of Virginia. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. 
The Curtain Island Mystery One evening in mid-September, Ellis Abbey came down to ask me if I would go cranberrying on Lenox Island with him the next day. I needed no coaxing for a berrying expedition to Lenox was always good fun. We'll sail over early in the morning, take a basket of grub, and make a day of it, said Ellis. Mother has been at me for a week to get her some cranberries. And Thanksgiving will be here in two months, and we must have some jelly for our cobbler. I think it well to prepare for the future in due time. Lenox Island was one of several in Ascot Bay. They were all uninhabited, and most of them were thickly wooded. Among the latter was Curtin Island, which was covered with pine and beech, except at its northeast corner, where there was a small cranberry bog. It was never visited on this account, however, as the berries were small and of poor quality. What's that? said Father, who now came out on the porch. Going cranberry? Well, take care old Oliver's ghost doesn't catch you. We all laughed at this. Just then, old Oliver's ghost was a standing joke along shore. Oliver Snyder, a weather-beaten old fisherman at the harbor, had taken to insisting that curtains was haunted. Several nights, when he had been out late in his boat, he had seen a mysterious light flittering over the cranberry bog, or gleaming fitfully among the pines. Nobody else had ever seen the light, not even the men who were in the boat with him, but this only the more firmly convinced old Oliver that it was supernatural. A real light would have been seen by everybody. That he alone was able to see it argued it not of earth. Old Oliver took it for a sign and brooded over it. He believed that it portended his early death and neither argument nor ridicule could shake his conviction. We're not going to curtains, said Ellis, and nobody has been seeing lights on Lennox. Heard anything further about the Richmond burglaries? Asked Father, turning to go in. Well, I heard today that Sheriff Pearson has offered a reward of $200 for information which will lead to their discovery and capture, responded Ellis. He is at his wit's end. You heard about their breaking into Dan Burrell's store last week and carrying off a lot of plunder? Since then, they've robbed Abraham Gowan's smokehouse of several hams. It's a mystery how they can cover up their tracks so completely they must have a rendezvous and loot depot somewhere. In Richmond, most folks seem to believe that they have their headquarters inland somewhere around Cantho, and it seems most likely. Ascot Bay was crescent-shaped. Albury Plains, where we lived, was on the eastern horn. Directly across the bay from us on the other horn was Richmond, a thriving fishing, farming, and dairying village. For three months, more or less, Richmond had been terrorized by mysterious burglaries. Stores, warehouses, cheese factories, and farmhouses had been broken in impartially and all kinds of booty carried off. This done, looters and loot seemed to vanish as completely as if the earth had opened and swallowed them up. After Father had gone in, Ellis said, Are you going to Coney Academy, Kent? I shook my head. Can't. Time's too hard, I said, laconically. Ellis nodded. My case exactly. Well, can't be helped, I suppose. So long. I'll meet you at the point in good time, wind and weather permitting. After Ellis had gone home, I sat on the porch until moonrise, thinking rather dejectedly over the matter referring to his question. We both wanted to go to Colney Academy. We had passed the matriculation examination in June very credibly. But, much to our disappointment, there seemed to be no chance for further progress along that line. The morning was fair and clear with a good sailing wind. I met Ellis at the point where we hired Jim Snyder's boat. Old Oliver, his father, looked at us gloomily. Steer clear curtains, he said warningly. There's nothing the matter with Lennox as I know on, but curtains? Old Oliver paused and shook his head as if to indicate his belief that all the powers of darkness had taken up their abode on curtains. 
Ellis and I, with a smothered laugh, embarked and sailed away. Our trip over was pleasant and uneventful. We anchored in a small cove on the west of Lennox, waded ashore with baskets and buckets, and set to work. Lennox was rather peculiar in shape, more like a soup plate than anything else to which I can compare. The rim was high and rocky, with a thick girdle of pines around it. The depressed center was the cranberry bog. Here, a perpetual calm rain blow what winds there might. Consequently, Ellis and I did not realize that the wind kept increasing or that it had veered round northeast, and we got an unpleasant surprise when, at four o'clock, we went down to the shore. It was blowing a hurricane out behind the islands. Got to stay here all night, commented Ellis briefly. If we were on curtains, I would not mind, I said. It's high and dry and there's better shelter. We can get there, said Ellis promptly. It's only a mile over and comparatively calm. Accordingly, we sailed across, sheltered from the gale by Bird Island, which lay between Curtin and Lennox to our right. We anchored in a cove on the east of Curtin's and soon found ourselves on shore. We took refuge in a small tumble-down hut, which had been formerly used by oyster fishermen, but was now almost in ruins. We did not expect to be very comfortable, for we were tired, wet, and hungry, but we made the best we could for our circumstances. Wish we had some matches, I shivered. A fire would fit in very well just now. I wonder if any of old Oliver's spooks will be around tonight, said Alice jokingly. He had scarcely spoken when he started excitedly. By Jove, Kent, there's a life, sure enough. Where? I exclaimed. It's gone now, but I'll swear I saw it not a moment ago on the edge of the cranberry bog. Will o' the wisp, I said carelessly. But I will own that I thought of old Oliver, and a disagreeable crawly sensation traveled up my spine. Didn't look like that, more like, there it is again. There's someone on the island besides ourselves, said Ellis. Come on, Kent, I don't believe in spooks or ghosts or haunts. I'm going to see who or what it is. We at once ran down the avenue of hoary old pines and skirted the curve of the bog. At intervals, the light glimmered out before us. Presently, as we rounded the scrub pines, we saw about ten yards away three men, distinctly visible by the light of a small lantern which one of them carried. I was about to hail them when Ellis, as if guessing my intention, laid his hand on my arm. Easy, Kent. Somehow I don't like their looks. Let's follow in silence. Accordingly, we dropped somewhat further behind. The men walked swiftly and appeared to be heading for the very heart of the island. They were muffled up in long coats and low-pulled hats, and, as Ellis said, they did look rather queer. There was nothing familiar about them. They could not be any of the harbor fishermen as I had first thought. On and on they went, never pausing to look behind. We were evidently striking right across the island, and the men seemed to know the way well, although to me there seemed no trace of track or path. I reflected that if the light were to go out, Ellis and I would be in somewhat unpleasant predicament in the heart of Curtain Woods on a pitchy dark night. In about three quarters of an hour, we had crossed the island and heard the surf thundering on the reef that stretched out from it in the direction of Richmond. Suddenly, the men halted before the largest of five deserted oystermen's huts that were snugly hidden among the sheltering pines, extinguished their lantern, and entered. A minute later, a pale light gleamed from one small square window. Ellis and I, breathless from our tramp, for our mysterious quarry had traveled speedily, looked at each other in the gloom. Who and what are they? I said. I don't know, said Ellis, but I feel sure they are here for no good purpose. They're not fishermen who have taken refuge here from the storm, and there's never any oystering in the bay now. I'm going up to look in that window. We cautiously stole up as near the hut as prudent and, standing on a small hillcock, 
about four feet away, we saw distinctly the interior of the room where the men were sitting. Two of them had their backs to us. The face of the third was plain in view, and I started. That's Cy Golding from over Cantho Way, Ellis, I muttered. Great Caesar, can these be the Richmond burglars? I've been suspecting that ever since we saw them, said Ellis, but we must have more proof than this. Careful now, this is risky, Kent. If they catch us, I'm afraid we will disappear as mysteriously as Farmer Gowan's hams. Let's steal up and listen under the window. One of the panes is out, and if you hear a sound to indicate suspicion on their part, bolt for the woods at once. Now, tingling with excitement, we crept up and crouched down under the window. The low voices of the men were quite audible. It did not take long to assure us that this was the gang of burglars who had terrorized Richmond. They were plotting another raid on Con Warrison's store at Richmond Center the following night. Presently, Ellis pulled me away and we stealthily retraced our steps to a safe distance and then scrambled down the bank to the shore around which we followed until we regained our hut. You may be sure we did not sleep much that night. Apart from our excitement, we had a disagreeable fear that some prowling burglar might become aware of our proximity and make matters unpleasant for us. The wind went down during the night, and as soon as the first pale dawnlight was whitening over the faraway purple shores of the bay, we get on board our boat and sailed away from Curtin Island with a feeling of relief. Arriving home, we took father into our confidence and then hitched up old Bess to the buckboard and started out for Comey, there to interview the county sheriff. That night, a well-armed posse went to Warrington's store and captured the gang red-handed. Later on, a good deal of the plunder was found stored in the huts on Curtin's Island, except perishable articles, which they had contrived to dispose of. Ellis and I obtained the offered reward, and it meant Coney Academy for both of us. As for old Oliver, it was a great triumph to him that he really had seen lights, and a great relief that they were not haunts, and consequently did not forebode his approaching dissolution. End of section 19《セクション twenty of uncollected short stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Uncollected short stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery.》Ted's double, a Christmas folly. When Morris Stanley came east and Ted Stanley met him at the gate, both boys looked at each other for a moment in a somewhat bewildered way. "'If you're not me myself, you must be my cousin Morris from the wild and woolly west,' said Ted, with a hearty handshake. "'Welcome to Chestnut Hill, old fellow.' "'When I first got a glimpse of you,' said Morris with a smile, "'I thought I had come on ahead of myself and got here first. In fact, the resemblance between the two boys was wonderful. They were the same in age, height, and general build. Their features were similar, and both had curly reddish hair, clear blue-gray eyes, and a healthy coloring. To be sure, when they were together, a close observer could easily have detected some difference. Morris had a graver, more thoughtful expression than had rollicking Ted, and was quieter in his manner, although as fond of fun and jokes as a boy could be. This was his first visit east, and the first occasion of his meeting with a host of uncles and aunts, cousins and second cousins. Morris had never spent so delightful a vacation. The prairie farm where he had lived all his life was so big a one, and surrounded by so many still bigger ones, that neighbors were few and far away. So Morris reveled in his host of eastern cousins and the comradeship he had always craved. One day, when he had been at Chestnut Hill about six weeks, he found Ted rummaging over a huge pile of books in his den, said den being a corner of the big garret where Ted kept all his household gods and sojourned on rainy days. Both boys were very fond of the den. It was such a jolly old place, as untidy as they pleased, where 
nobody ever disturbed them or their traps up under the eaves with one small window looking out over the uplands of chestnut hill but this particular day was a sunny one and the sight of unstudious ted up to his ears in books in the middle of vacation was one for which morris was unprepared as something serious happened he queried solemnly you'd think so to look at me wouldn't you grinned ted well something serious has happened to be sure but it has nothing to do with my present uncanny fit of bookishness it simply occurred to me that the space taken up in this corner by all these books woo, aren't they dusty shade of mary jane would be much better filled by my collection of birds eggs so i'm patiently weeding them out all that i shall need for college in the fall must be left and the rest i shall dump into the rag room you're a lucky chap ted said morris with a sigh because i'm going to college queried ted blowing the dust from a venerable julius caesar well it is jolly wish you could come too think there's no chance of it morris shook his head not a shadow of it no use in talking about it ted it only makes me grum in the brief silence that followed ted sorted out some ill-used english classics and morris ruminated gloomily to go to college was his greatest desire but he knew it could not be granted the crops had failed for three years on the prairie farm morris knew that when he went home in the fall he was to take a position as clerk in one of the big department stores in the nearest city and he hated the prospect sturdily even while he congratulated himself on being able to get it and so lighten his father's burden somewhat what is the serious thing that has happened he asked at last recalling that part of ted's speech i had a letter from great aunt deborah inviting me to tea with her at her residence in rexford on christmas day i don't see anything dreadful in that enviable blindness you don't know great aunt deborah i'd rather be invited to sup with the king of the cannibal islands Besides, Christmas morning is the day of the ice hockey game at Moreland, and I've been looking forward to it for weeks. Well, don't go to your great Aunt Deborah's, then, suggested Morris. My son, you do not appear to realize that great Aunt Deborah's invitations are like under royalties. They are commands and must be obeyed under penalty of her eternal displeasure. But don't say your great Aunt Deborah in a tone which implies that I have a monopoly in great aunts she is your great aunt as well as mine mistress deborah stanley is how is it that i've never seen her then asked morris i thought i'd met all my relatives to the third and fourth generations of late there is a bit of family history involved in the answer to that great aunt deborah knows you are here but she doesn't like you because you are the son of your father did you ever hear uncle chester speak of his aunt deborah not that i remember well when your father and mine were boys your father was great aunt deborah's favorite nephew she was always very eccentric father says but uncle chester got along with her beautifully she intended to make him her heir she's worth a pot of money you know well when your father married it made her very angry she wanted him to marry someone else the daughter of the man she had once expected to marry herself i believe they had a bitter quarrel and it ended in great aunt deborah forbidding your father ever to speak to her or cross her threshold again he took her at her word father says that is really what she has never forgiven him for and went out west she had never allowed his name to be spoken in her hearing since very vindictive lady our great aunt deborah she's always been rather fond of me father says it is because i'm so like what your father was when we met she used to pat me on the head and give me peppermints i haven't seen her for two years she'll think i've grown a bit christmas happens to be her birthday too i shall have to go of course father insists on it and i shall miss the hockey game ted fired a harmless virgil across the den and scowled at the same moment he saw himself and morris reflected in the long cracked mirror which hung at the other end of the garret christopher columbus he said morris stanley hearken unto me and lend me your ears if you have a proper cousinly regard for me i shall be able to eat my cake and have it too i shall go to the game at moreland and you shall go to tea with great aunt deborah at rexford 
but she hasn't invited me and doesn't want me objected morris morris my friend you are singularly lacking in quickness of comprehension you will go not as morris stanley but as theodore stanley to wit myself great aunt deborah will never know the difference no more will anybody else i always knew we didn't look so much alike for nothing morris stared and then went off in a shout of laughter but ted oh i really can't do that i'd be discovered and besides no you wouldn't now don't refuse to help a fellow out morris i'd do as much for you you don't care about the game and i do and no harm can be done at first morris protested but ted eagerly overruled all his objections and in the end he consented the spice of mischief in the plan commended it to him besides he was conscious of a curiosity to see great aunt deborah i'll go he said but if great aunt deborah discovers that i am a rank impostor and takes some fearful and summary vengeance i trust you to break the news gently to my parents on saturday afternoon morris and ted both set off at the crossroads they parted and, and ted trudged down the hills to moreland while morris steadily footed his way to rexford he did not feel altogether comfortable but it was too late to back out now mrs deborah stanley lived in an old-fashioned but picturesque house on the outskirts of rexford morris admired the beautiful grounds as he walked up the serpentine drive under the chestnuts he felt rather nervous but his love of mischief bubbled up within him and primed him for the ordeal it also lent an added sparkle to his eyes as he went up to the steps great aunt deborah met him at the door i am glad to see you theodore she said with a kindly handshake and i am glad to see you aunt deborah said morris sincerely enough and to wish you many happy returns of the day the appearance of his great aunt was a surprise to morris who had somehow imbibed from ted an impression very different from the reality true she said as ted had warned him eyes like a hawk so keen and piercing that morris trembled for the success of his ruse but they were dark handsome eyes as well she was richly dressed and had a great deal of snow-white hair arranged in puffs so carefully as to betoken that great aunt deborah had a pet vanity yet altogether morris liked her looks as he would have said he was taken into a big gloomy room full of quaint old furniture and here they talked for an hour morris talked well even under the handicap of talking as if he were ted he was not free from an unpleasant dread that he might inadvertently say something that would give him away and several of great aunt deborah's questions were rather hard to answer as he told ted afterwards i had to take some liberties with your imagination but on the whole he got on very cleverly although he felt the reverse of comfortable if only great aunt deborah were not so kind if she had been cranky and crotchety as he had expected the joke would have had a much better flavor his bad quarter of an hour came after tea when great aunt deborah said abruptly you have a cousin staying with you i hear chester stanley's son what sort of boy is he morris blushed so hotly that he felt thankful to the gloom he's he's always rather a jolly chap he answered confused a good deal like me they say you are very like what his father was at your age said great aunt deborah half sharply half tenderly he was my favorite nephew until he disobeyed me well theodore i'm glad to have seen you this afternoon you have improved a great deal as for this cousin of yours what does he intend to make of himself is he clever does he intend to go to college i i can hardly say stammered morris no i don't think he is going to college he would like to but well i don't think he is going can't afford it i suppose chester stanley is poor said great aunt deborah with a certain jarring note of satisfaction in her voice but this is not to my purpose it is of yourself i wish to speak theodore i have something to give you she went to an old desk in the corner and took out two cases one brand new the other somewhat old-fashioned sitting down by morris she said i am going to give you this in remembrance of your visit and my birthday it is very good of you to give up your other plans and spend the afternoon with me after this you must come oftener here is your present theodore 
it was a beautiful gold watch with ted's monogram on the back morris took it foolishly if floors ever did open to swallow up boys he wished the one he was on would do so then thank you aunt deborah he stammered but great aunt deborah did not notice his embarrassment she was fumbling with the stiff catch of the other case which on being opened revealed another watch of very elaborate although old-fashioned design and ornamentation this watch she said i had made twenty years ago for your uncle chester when he disregarded my wishes i did not give it to him it is as good as ever for all practical purposes take it to your cousin morris stanley with his great aunt deborah's love she held it out to morris but instead of taking it he stood up suddenly with a very grave determined face i can't take that watch aunt deborah he said quietly i'm not ted i am morris i i ted wanted to go to the game at moreland today so i agreed to come here in his place i thought it was a good joke at the time i see now that it was a dishonorable trick i'm very sorry for it aunt deborah so you ought to be aunt deborah spoke sharply at first she had looked amazed then angry but now her keen old eyes were twinkling i suppose you thought it was smart to play a trick on an old woman oh no said morris quickly i never thought of it in that way although i did think it a joke please forgive me and don't blame ted it it was mostly my fault you and ted are a pair of graceless scamps said aunt deborah severely i ought to be very angry with you both i feel sure ted put you up to this but i shall have to forgive you both i suppose and you are chester stanley's son you look like him well go home take your watches and be off tell ted he is to come here next saturday afternoon and get his scolding as for you well if you care to come back any time i will be glad to see you morris i am an old crank but even cranks can be amiable at times now go morris went he felt rather bewildered when he got home he told ted the whole story gee rusalem said the latter won't great aunt deborah give me a calming down when she sees me i suppose i deserve it she treated you pretty white anyhow and those watches are dandies it is the most astonishing thing that she wasn't furious at you when you blurted out that confession are you going to see her again of course i am i like great aunt deborah said morris he did go not once only but often there was no denying that somehow or other morris had found his way to great aunt deborah's heart and when he went back west the departmental clerkship had vanished forever from his horizon he was to go to college in the fall great aunt deborah had said so and her will was law great aunt deborah is a brick said ted when they parted i repent in sackcloth and ashes of anything i ever said to the contrary good-bye till next month old chap won't we waken the old university up though end of section twenty Section 21 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Section 21 Brenton Kennedy's Monument First published in American Agriculturalist, January 24, 1903 I must put up a monument to him, said Josephine firmly. I don't know yet just how I'm going to manage it, but it must be done. Josephine's sallow little face took on an expression of determination, and her thin, faded lips settled into a yet harder line. She looked out from her doorway, over the beds of striped ribbon grass and rich crimson peonies, under the lush clover fields and the pond in the pasture below them, to the burying ground on the sunrise slope of the hill beyond. All of my family are buried there, 
and there's a real good handsome white marble headstone to every one of them. Brenton isn't there, but a monument he shall have just the same. Abner Dolman nodded, not knowing just what to say. Secretly he thought it a piece of folly on Josephine Kennedy's part, but he knew it would not do to say so. What good is a monument going to do Brendan Kennedy when he's buried thousands of miles away? I don't know where she's going to get the money to put it up with, he said to himself as he went away around the curve of the birch trees that hemmed the little brown house in. Josephine did not know either. It was a problem, but a problem that must be solved. She had been thinking it over for weeks, ever since the news had come that Brenton had died in the Klondike. Brenton had been Josephine's brother, but she seemed more like his mother than his sister. She had been twenty years old when Brenton was born and her mother died. Josephine had brought him up. Their father had died ten years later, and Josephine and Brenton lived alone together. Josephine had a very little money coming in every year from a small investment of her father's. It was enough to live on if she practised the most pinching economy. Josephine did not mind that. She was used to it. But when Brenton grew up, she knew he must go away. There was nothing for him to do in Springvale. Brenton was a good boy, honest and steady. Josephine did not allow herself to worry when she had to let him go. She thought Brenton would come out all right. They had a few plans for the future, when Brenton should have made enough money to come home and buy a farm in Springvale. The Morrison farm, if possible. Josephine had always thought the old Morrison homestead the most beautiful place on earth. And I shall go and keep house for you till you get married, she told him. And then I'll just want a corner for myself and a bit of garden. Only you must marry a nice girl, Brenton. Brenton went to the Klondike. Six months later, Josephine got a brief letter from a stranger telling her of his death from pneumonia. She grieved so over it that her neighbours thought she would fret herself to death. Abner Dolman declared that it was only the hope of putting up a monument to Brenton that kept her alive at all. Josephine was very determined. It would take time, but she must earn the money somehow. She knew just the kind of monument she wanted. Nothing second-rate would do. She must have the best. She had picked it out from Mr Purdy's designs already. It would cost ninety dollars, but Mr Purdy told her he could make it eighty for her. She picked berries all that summer, as long as they lasted, and took them over to sell at the summer hotel in the mountain. She put her pride under her feet and did day's work for her neighbours. She took in washing for the men who were building the factories at Springvale Centre. When the winter came, she knit socks and stockings and sold them. But as she was not strong, her hard work told on her, and sometimes she was afraid that she would not live long enough to put up Brenton's monument. And if I don't do it, it'll never be done, she moaned. It about kills me to think of it. It took Josephine two years to earn the eighty dollars. When she added the last one to the little hoard in her shell box, there were tears of thankfulness in her eyes. I'll go over to the centre tomorrow and order it from Mr Purdy, she said exultantly. I shall have the verse Mother liked so much on it. Asleep in Jesus, far from thee, thy kindred and their graves may be, but thine is still a blessed sleep from which none ever wakes to weep. If he was with his own it wouldn't seem so hard, but at least he shall have his monument among them. She went up to see Emma Chase that evening, and found her crying. This was not unusual, for Emma Chase often cried. She had had a good deal of trouble. Her only daughter, Emmy, had hip trouble. Emmy was twelve years old, and had been a cripple for a long time. She was lying on the sofa, looking wistfully at her mother. "'What is the matter?' asked Josephine. "'It's Emmy,' sold Emma. My nephew was here to see us yesterday. He's a medical student in the big hospital at Churlettsville, you know. He said he believes they have a new doctor there who could cure Emmy. There is a new way, they found out, if, if I could afford it. 
but it would take about a hundred dollars, Jim said. I can't get it any more than a thousand. I haven't more than ten saved up. It seems awful hard if Emmy can't be cured just because we're so poor. Emma Chase would not have complained to anyone who was well off. She was very proud, and she would have been afraid that they would think that she was trying to get them to help her. But Josephine was poor like herself, and Emma did not mind confiding in her. She did not know about Josephine's monument hoard. Josephine did not answer at once. Her little face grew pinched and grey in the sunset light. She bent down and broke off one of the daylilies that grew by the hall door. The fragrance reminded her of Brenton. He had always liked daylilies. She felt too miserable to speak, and Emma thought her unsympathetic. She dried her eyes with a little dignity and began to speak of other things. Josephine said she had come up to get a slip of Emma's white pergolonium, and Emma cut it for her. She went away as soon as she could, and when she got home she sat down on her sagging doorstep in the sweet, windless summer dusk and cried. I don't know how I can do it, she sobbed, but I must. It would be sinful not to. The living ought to come before the dead. I suppose Brenton will understand all about that. It's some comfort to think that, but I feel as if my heart would break. The next day, Josephine took the money out of the inlaid shell box and went with it to Emma Chase. It's for Emmy, she said. With your ten, it will make ninety, and I guess you can manage ten more some way. But, but you can't afford it, I'm sure, faltered Emma, and I don't know when I could ever pay you back. I can spare it as well as not, said Josephine firmly, and I don't expect you to pay me back. It's my gift to Emmy. After she had prevailed on Emma to take the money, Josephine went to the Springvale Commons and picked blueberries all day. She cried bitterly while she picked them. I shall have to begin all over again, she said dreamily, and I don't feel able somehow, but I'm glad I gave it to Emmy. I ain't a bit sorry for that, even if Brenton never gets his monument. When Emmy Chase came home from the hospital, she was cured. To be sure, she had to lie on the sofa most of her time still, and was not allowed to walk much for a long time. But the doctors said that with care, she would eventually become quite well and strong. When Josephine went up to see her, Emma Chase cried again with joy and gratitude. I don't know how I can ever thank you, Josephine, she said. Josephine's careworn face looked brighter. After all, she thought, I guess a living flesh and blood girl saved from helpless suffering is a good deal better monument than one of white marble. A week later, when Josephine reached home one evening, after she had been to the hotel with her berries, she saw an express wagon under the birches. A couple of big trunks were in it. Josephine recognised Hosea Atkinson's rig. Hosea usually hauled the luggage of the hotel guests to and fro from the station. Josephine thought he was likely on his way to the station now to catch the night express. She wondered what he had called for. As she opened her sagging little gate and hurried up the path, Hosea came around the hall to the front door. Here she is, he shouted to someone behind him. The next moment Hosea was pushed out of sight and another man stepped out. He was tall and bronzed, with a soft brown beard and a pleasant face. Josephine did not think she had ever seen him before, yet there was something about him that seemed curiously familiar. He held out his arms to her. Josie! Then Josephine knew him. Brenton! she gasped, and her face became as white as the daylilies. She would have fallen if he had not caught her. I scared you, he said penitently. Hosea told me you thought I was dead. I'd ought to have been more careful. There, there, it's all right, Josie. Josephine was crying and laughing together. Her first audible words were, Oh, Brenton, you won't need a monument now. Brenton threw back his head and laughed heartily. Not much, I don't. Never felt less in need of one. But I must pay off Hosea and get my trunks in before I can begin to talk. 
While he was out, Josephine found her way into the house. As yet, she was dazed. She heard Brenton's shouts of laughter out in the lane as he and Hosea dragged the trunks in. Just fancy if I'd had that monument up, she said hysterically. When they were alone, Brenton sketched his experiences briefly. When I got to Dawson City, I had hard luck at first, Josie. I was too late. There were hundreds there, next door to starvation. After a pretty rough time, I fell in with a party that were going prospecting away up north, clear of even the fringes of civilization. They were all desperate like myself. I went, too. I wrote you before I started, but the letter must have gone astray. All the adventures I went through would fill a book. There wasn't no way of writing to you. We had hard times, but we struck luck at last. And just as soon as I could, I started for home. I haven't made a fortune, Josie, but I've got enough to buy the Morrison farm. It's for sale, too, Hosea tells me. To think I didn't know you at first, said Josephine breathlessly. It's that big beard of yours. But how did that story of your death come? Well, I can't be sure, because I never knew it had come until I got home. But I guess it was this way. When I left Dawson, there was a man named Burton Kennedy there, sick with pneumonia. He didn't seem to have any friends to speak of. I left Dawson pretty quiet and sudden, and he must have died, and they mixed him up with me. <laughs> Jerusalem! You should have seen the folks at the station stare at me. They thought I was a ghost, sure. But here I am, alive and well, and we are going to have a good time, Josie. Emmy Chase is cured, and you're home, cried Josephine with a long breath. I'm the happiest woman in the world. And I'm so thankful that I was prevented from putting up that monument. It would have been a dreadful bad omen. End of section 21. Recording by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia. Section 22 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jamie Church. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. A Patent Medicine Testimonial. The Overreaching of Uncle Abimelech. You might as well try to move the rock of Gibraltar as attempt to change Uncle Abimelech's mind when it is once made up, said Murray gloomily. Murray is like dear old Dad. He gets discouraged rather easily. Now, I'm not like that. I'm more like mother's folks. As Uncle Abimelech has never failed to tell me when I've annoyed him, I'm all foster. Uncle Abimelech doesn't like the fosters, but I'm glad I take after them. If I had folded my hands and sat down meekly when Uncle Abimelech made known his good will and pleasure regarding Murray and me after father's death, Murray would never have got to college. Nor I either, for that matter. Only, I wouldn't have minded that very much. I just wanted to go to college because Murray did. I couldn't be separated from him. We were twins and had always been together. As for Uncle Abimelech's mind... I knew that he never had been known to change it. But as he himself was fond of saying, there has to be a first time for everything, and I had determined that this was to be the first time for him. I hadn't any idea how I was going to bring it about, but it just had to be done, and I'm not all foster for nothing. I knew I would have to depend on my own thinkers. Murray is clever at books and dissecting dead things, but he couldn't help me out in this even if he hadn't settled beforehand that there was no use in opposing Uncle Abimelech. I'm going up to the garret to think this out, Murray, I said solemnly. Don't let anybody disturb me. And if Uncle Abimelech comes over, don't tell him where I am. If I don't come down in time to get tea, get it yourself. I shall not leave the garret until I have thought of some way to change Uncle Abimelech's mind. Then you'll be a prisoner there for the term of your natural life, dear sis said Murray skeptically. You're a clever girl, Prue, and you've got enough decision for two, but you'll never get the better of Uncle Abimelech. We'll see, I said resolutely, and up to the garret I went. 
I shut the door and bolted it good and fast to make sure. Then I piled some cushions in the window seat, for one might as well be comfortable when one is thinking as not, and went over the whole ground from the beginning. Outside, the wind was thrashing the broad leafy top of the maple, whose tallest twigs reached to the funny gray eaves of our old house. One roly-poly little sparrow blew or flew to the sill and sat there for a minute, looking at me with knowing eyes. Down below, I could see Murray in a corner of the yard, pottering over a sick duck. He had set its broken leg and was nursing it back to health. Anyone, except Uncle Abimelech, could see that Murray was simply born to be a doctor, and that it was flying in the face of Providence to think of making him anything else. From the garret windows I could see all over the farm, for the house is on the hill end of it. I could see all the dear old fields and the spring meadow and the beech woods in the southwest corner, and beyond the orchard were the two gray barns, and down below, at the right-hand corner, was the garden with all my sweet peas fluttering over the fences and trellises like a horde of butterflies. It was a dear old place, and both Murray and I loved every stick and stone on it, but there was no reason why we should go on living there when Murray didn't like farming, and it wasn't our own anyhow. It all belonged to Uncle Abimelech. Father and Murray and I had always lived here together. Father's health broke down during his college course. That was one reason why Uncle Abimelech was set against Murray going to college, although Murray is as chubby and sturdy a fellow as you could wish to see. Anybody with Foster in him would be that. To go back to Father, the doctors told him that his only chance of recovering his strength was an open-air life. So Father rented one of Uncle Abimelech's farms, and there he lived for the rest of his days. He did not get strong again until it was too late for college, and he was a square peg in a round hole all his life, as he used to tell us. Mother died before we could remember, so Murray and Dad and I were everything to each other. We were very happy, too, although we were bossed by Uncle Abimelech more or less, but he meant it well, and Father didn't mind. Then Father died. Oh, that was a dreadful time. I hurried over it in my thinking out. Of course, when Murray and I came to look our position squarely in the face, we found that we were dependent on Uncle Abimelech for everything, even the roof over our heads. We were literally as poor as church mice, and even poorer, for at least they get churches rent-free. Murray's heart was set on going to college and studying medicine. He asked Uncle Abimelech to lend him enough money to get a start with, and then he could work his own way along and pay back the loan in due time. Uncle Abimelech is rich, and Murray and I are his nearest relatives, but he simply wouldn't listen to Murray's plan. "'I put my foot firmly down on such nonsense,' he said, "'and you know that when I put my foot down, something squashes.'" It was not that Uncle Abimelech was miserly, or that he grudged us assistance. Not at all. He was ready to deal generously by us, but it must be in his own way. His way was this. Murray and I were to stay on the farm, and when Murray was twenty-one, Uncle Abimelech said he would deed the farm to him, make him a present of it out and out. "'It's a good farm, Murray,' he said. "'Your father never made more than a bare living out of it, because he wasn't strong enough to work it properly. That's what he got out of a college course, by the way.' but you are strong enough and ambitious enough to do well. But Murray couldn't be a farmer. That was all there was to it. I told Uncle Abimelech so firmly, and I talked to him for days about it, but Uncle Abimelech never wavered. He sat and listened to me with a quizzical smile on that handsome, clean-shaven, ruddy old face of his with its cut granite features. And in the end, he said, You ought to be the one to go to college if either of you did, Prue. You would make a capital lawyer, if I believed in the higher education of women, but I don't. Murray can take or leave the farm as he chooses. If he prefers the latter alternative, well and good, but he gets no help from me. You're a foolish little girl, Prue, to back him up in this nonsense of his. It makes me angry to be called a little girl when I put up my hair a year ago, and Uncle Abimelech knows it. I gave up arguing with him. I knew it was no use anyway. I thought it all over in the garret, 
but no way out of the dilemma could I see. I had eaten up all the apples I had brought with me, and I felt flabby and disconsolate. The sight of Uncle Abimelech stalking up the lane, as erect and lordly as usual, served to deepen my gloom. I picked up the paper my apples had been wrapped in and looked it over gloomily. Then I saw something, and Uncle Abimelech was delivered into my hand. The whole plan of campaign unrolled itself before me, and I fairly laughed in glee. Looking out of the garret window, right down on the little bald spot on the top of Uncle Abimelech's head, as he stood laying down the law to Murray about something. When Uncle Abimelech had gone, I went down to Murray. Buddy, I said, I've thought of a plan. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you are to consent to it without knowing. I think it will quench Uncle Abimelech, but you must have perfect confidence in me. You must back me up, no matter what I do, and let me have my own way in it all. All right, sis, said Murray. That isn't solemn enough, I protested. I'm serious. Promise solemnly. I promise solemnly. Cross my heart, said Murray, looking like an owl. Very well. Remember that your role is to lie low and say nothing like Br'er Rabbit. Alloway's anodyne liniment is pretty good stuff, isn't it, Murray? It cured your sprain after you had tried everything else, didn't it? Yes but I don't see the connection. It isn't necessary that you should. Well, what with your sprain and my rheumatics, I think I can manage it. Look here, Prue. Are you sure that long brooding over our troubles up in the garret hasn't turned your brain? My brain is all right. Now leave me, minion. There is that which I would do. Murray grinned and went. I wrote a letter, took it down to the office, and mailed it. For a week, there was nothing more to do. There is just one trait of Uncle Abimelech's disposition more marked than his fondness for having his own way, and that one thing is family pride. The Melvilles are a very old family. The name dates back to the Norman Conquest, when a certain Roger de Melville, who was an ancestor of ours, went over to England with William the Conqueror. I don't think the Melvilles ever did anything worth recording in history since. To be sure, as far back as we can trace, none of them has ever done anything bad either. They have been honest, respectable folks, and I think that is something worth being proud of. But Uncle Abimelech pinned his family pride to Roger de Melville. He had the Melville coat of arms and our family tree, made out by an eminent genealogist, framed and hung up in his library and he would not have done anything that would not have chimed in with that coat of arms and a conquering ancestor for the world. At the end of the week, I got an answer to my letter. It was what I wanted. I wrote again and sent a parcel. In three weeks' time, the storm burst. One day, I saw Uncle Abimelech striding up the lane. He had a big newspaper clutched in his hand. I turned to Murray, who was poring over a book of anatomy in the corner. Murray, Uncle Abimelech is coming. There is going to be a battle royale between us. Allow me to remind you of your promise. To lie low and say nothing? That's the cue, isn't it, sis? Unless Uncle Abimelech appeals to you. In that case, you are to back me up. Then Uncle Abimelech stalked in. He was purple with rage. Old Roger de Melville himself never could have looked fiercer. I did feel a quake or two, but I faced Uncle Abimelech undauntedly. No use in having your name on the roll of Battle Abbey if you can't stand your ground. Prudence, what does this mean? thundered Uncle Abimelech as he flung the newspaper down on the table. Murray got up and peered over. Then he whistled. He started to say something but remembered just in time and stopped. But he did give me a black look. Murray has a sneaking pride of name, too, although he won't own up to it, and laughs at Uncle Abimelech. I looked at the paper and began to laugh. We did look so funny, Murray and I, in that advertisement. It took up the whole page. At the top were our photos, half life-size, 
and underneath our names and addresses printed out in full. Below was the letter I had written to the Alloway Anodyne Liniment folks. It was a florid testimonial to the virtues of their liniment. I said that it had cured Murray's sprain after all other remedies had failed, and that, when I had been left a partial wreck from a very bad attack of rheumatic fever, the only thing that restored my joints and muscles to working order was Alloway's anodyne liniment, and so on. It was all true enough, although I dare say old Aunt Sarah from the Hollow's rubbing had as much to do with the cures as the liniment, but that is neither here nor there. "'What does this mean, Prudence?' said Uncle Abimelech again. He was quivering with wrath, but I was as cool as a cucumber, and Murray stood like a graven image. "'Why that, Uncle Abimelech?' I said calmly. "'Well, it just means one of my ways of making money. That liniment company pays for those testimonials and photos, you know. They gave me fifty dollars for the privilege of publishing them.' Fifty dollars will pay for books and tuition for Murray and me at Kentville Academy next winter. And Mrs. Treadgold is kind enough to say she will board me for what help I can give her around the house and wait for Murray's until he can earn it by teaching. I rattled all of this off glibly before Uncle Abimelech could get in a word. It's disgraceful, he stormed. Disgraceful. Think of Sir Roger de Melville and a patent medicine advertisement. "'Murray Melville, what were you about, sir, to let your sister disgrace herself in her family name by such an outrageous transaction?' I quaked a bit, if Murray should fail me, but Murray was true blue. "'I gave Prue a free hand, sir. It's an honest business transaction enough, and the family name alone won't send us to college, you know, sir.' Uncle Abimelech glared at us. "'This must be put an end to.' he said. This advertisement must not appear again. I won't have it. But I've signed a contract that is to run for six months, I said sturdily, and I have others in view. You remember the herb cure you recommended one spring? And that it did me so much good. I'm negotiating with the makers of that, and... The girl's mad, said Uncle Abimelech, stark staring mad. Oh, no, I'm not Uncle Abimelech. I'm merely a pretty good businesswoman. You won't help Murray to go to college, so I must. This is the only way I have, and I'm going to see it through. After Uncle Abimelech had gone, still in a towering rage, Murray remonstrated. But I reminded him of his promise, and he had to succumb. Next day, Uncle Abimelech returned, a subdued and chastened Uncle Abimelech. See here, Prue, he said sternly. This thing must be stopped. I say it must. I am not going to have the name of Melville dragged all over the country in a patent medicine advertisement. You've played your game and won it. Take what comfort you can out of the confession. If you will agree to cancel this notorious contract of yours, I'll settle it with the company. And I'll put Murray through college and you too if you want to go. Something will have to be done with you, that's certain. Is this satisfactory? Perfectly, I said promptly, if you will add thereto your promise that you will forget and forgive Uncle Abimelech. There are to be no hard feelings. Uncle Abimelech shrugged his shoulders. In for a penny, in for a pound, he said. Very well, Prue. We wipe off all scores and begin afresh but there must be no more such doings. You've worked your little scheme through. Trust a foster for that. But in future, you've got to remember that in law, you're a Melville, whatever you are in fact. I nodded dutifully. I'll remember, Uncle Abimelech, I promised. After everything had been arranged and Uncle Abimelech had gone, I looked at Murray. Well, I said. Murray twinkled. You've accomplished the impossible, sis. But, as Uncle Abimelech intimated, don't you try it again. This is the end of Section 22. Recording by Jamie Church. Section 23 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Noons. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Uncle Dick's Little Girl. Uncle Dick reached up to the apple tree above him and pulled a long, sinuous bough, picked out with delicate, rose-hearted bloom, down to him with a caressing motion. Through the little gap thus made in the big pyramid of blossom was seen a faraway glimpse of the harbor on the western side of the Four Winds Peninsula. The sun had lately set, and the harbor was like a great ruby cup filled with fire and glamour. On the other side of the orchard, long fields, fresh with the tinting of early spring, sloped down to the shore of the open Atlantic, long and white, where a calm ocean slept bluely, and sighed in its sleep with the murmur that rings forever in the ears of those whose good fortune it is to have been born within sound of it. Back landward were the wooded pine hills, where the twilight was already hanging thickly, and would presently overflow and trickle down on the lowland homesteads and orchards of four winds. But the harbor glow would linger long, and it was always a sight worth seeing when the great stars came out in the clear-swept arch of sky above it, like jewels in some huge overturned crystal flagon of night. When these blossoms have given place to fruit, I'll have my little girl with me again, said Uncle Dick tenderly. He looked through the boughs to the harbor, and his gentle brown eyes filled with a light that was not of the sunset or the lustrous water. The smile that came to the sensitive lips, veiled in the sweep of a silken, silver-sprinkled brown beard, told that Uncle Dick's thought was a very pleasant one. Two of his listeners smiled at each other. The tolerant, significant smile, which expresses our slightly amused recognition of some harmless fallacy in our friends. Do you really expect that she'll come back to Four Winds after all these years, Uncle Dick, and her such a great lady now? said Martin Baker, perhaps thinking it wise to soften any blow the near future might have in store for this Uncle Dick, whom everybody in Four Winds loved, even those who, safe in their hard shell of protective common sense, laughed in a not unkindly fashion at his dreamy fancies and odd ways. Uncle Dick released the apple bough, and it swung back to its place with a gush of perfume that flooded the cool air like a wave. I know she will come, he said calmly. Bertha Lawrence never forgot or broke a promise in her life. The years will have made no difference in her in that, at least. Even so, said Christopher Merriam. Ain't you afraid that she won't be happy or contented here, Uncle Dick? Seven years makes a good deal of difference in folks. "'especially seven such years as she has spent "'living with rich people and traveling abroad and all that.' "'Uncle Dick looked at the last speaker tolerantly. "'A humorous sparkle replaced the musing light in his eyes, "'and his smile was half quizzical. "'I don't think you need be worrying over that, Christopher. "'I'm not. "'None of you really know my little girl, "'although she lived among you fourteen years.' "'He spoke in a tone of quiet confidence. "'Miriam and Martin,' After a few more casual remarks, strolled away, and Uncle Dick was left with Philip Armory, the young minister of Four Winds Church, whose manse was just across the road from Uncle Dick's place, and who had fallen into the habit of straying over often to talk with this high-souled, simple-minded old man, with the eternal youth in his eyes and heart. Mr. Armory was sitting on the stone wall under the huge apple tree. When the other men had gone, his blue eyes met Uncle Dick's brown ones, with quiet comprehension. "'They're laughing at me, those two, said Uncle Dick with a smile. "'They're thinking now and most likely saying, "'What a fool that old Dick Romney is over his little girl. "'She'll never come back. "'But I don't blame them. "'They just don't know her, that's all. "'They just don't know her.' "'He came over and leaned against the mossy stones. "'The twilight was thick about them now, "'and the apple blossoms were dizzily sweet in the dew. "'I don't know her either.' said Philip Armory gently. But I think she will come back to you. Uncle Dick nodded. Folks think I'm foolish because I talk so much about my little girl. I don't talk half as much about her as I think. 
I'm thinking of her always. Have been ever since she went away seven years ago. She's been in my heart all the time, and I've been in hers, don't I know? What does it matter that she doesn't write very often, or speak of coming back when she does write? I know she'll come. She'll keep her promise, and keep it gladly, too. If I didn't know that, I wouldn't want her to keep it at all. How was it she came to leave you? asked Armory. I don't think I've ever heard the rights of the story. I had a sister once, said Uncle Dick gently. She was beautiful and good. She married a fine fellow, too, but he took her away from us. He died soon after Bertha was born, and my sister came home here and died also of grief. She gave her baby to me with her latest breath. That can't never be undone. Bertha was her mother's gift to me. To me. There's nobody has a right before that. But her father's will had left her under the guardianship of his own people. They wanted to take her away at once, but I pleaded hard for her, and they agreed to leave her with me till she was fourteen. Then they took her away. It most broke her little heart. When she went away, she took my hand in both of hers, and away she had, and she looked up at me with her whole lovely, pure soul shining out of her great eyes, and she said, Uncle Dick, as soon as I am twenty-one, I'll come back to you. I've never seen her since. They won't even let her write me often, but I am content. Bertha will be twenty-one in September, and she will come to me then. Perhaps a shade of doubt showed itself on the younger man's face. Uncle Dick detected it and laughed in his low, gentle fashion. You don't feel so sure. You've heard of her cleverness and her beauty and what they call her social triumphs? Yes, yes, but you'll see. They'll all see. As Philip Armory walked home through the purple, softly scented dusk, he recalled all he had heard of Bertha Lawrence. The thought of her had been curiously interwoven with his life and dreams since he had come to Four Winds a year ago. He believed in her, but not quite with Uncle Dick's entire faith. She would come back, but would she be soul-free? Would the life here satisfy her now? Between the child of fourteen, knowing no home save Uncle Dick's gray old cottage, and the woman of twenty-one, who had spent her seven formative years amid all that wealth and culture can give, what unbridgeable gulf might not yawn. I hope there is no disappointment in store for Uncle Dick, thought Armory tenderly. I have never met a purer, sweeter soul. As the summer waned, Uncle Dick talked less about his little girl than was his wont. His four winds neighbors said that he was growing doubtful himself, but Philip Armory knew better. He knew how Uncle Dick was counting the slow-passing days, and his heart was troubled with the fear that there was some sorrow in store for the sweet old man. She will not come, or coming will be changed, was his unuttered doubt. But Uncle Dick remained untroubled. His eyes were always tranquil and happy when he spoke of her, as he often did to Philip. Miriam was here today, Mr. Armory. He said he supposed I'd soon be fixing up the house and getting ready for Bertha. I said no. She would find it as she left it, and it would satisfy her. The Four Winds folks laugh at me, and I laugh at them. I know her. They don't, you see. That makes all the difference. A great, although quiet, change had come over Uncle Dick in those purple-hearted days of the late summer. He went about humming scraps of old-time songs. His step was lighter. His deep, kindly voice had a new and richer note of tenderness. He liked to linger in his orchard at twilight and dream of his little girl. Armory, who often walked there with him, forbore by word or motion to interrupt his charmed reveries. He walked beside him, suiting his younger, stronger step to the old man's. Sometimes Uncle Dick patted his friend's arm and laughed softly. What a nuisance the old man is, isn't he? he asked whimsically. Old dreamer, but uh, you don't know my little girl, Mr. Armory. I hope you will know her, he said again, not as her fashionable world knows her, nor yet as these well-meaning, stupid four-wind folks know her, but as I know her, in all of her beautiful woman's soul and her noble, loyal little heart. She will be worth knowing. Her mother was a queen among women. One evening, 
Uncle Dick came to meet Armory with an almost boyish lightness of step. In his eyes was a glow and brightness. He held the letter in his hand. Writ on her twenty-first birthday, he exclaimed. She will be here in a week's time. God bless her. On a September day, when four winds in its ripely tinted breadth and length lay basking in the mellow autumn sunshine that spilled over the brim of the valley, through the grim old pines, down to the harbor, cupped in its harvest golden hills, Bertha Lawrence came home. All four winds knew it by night. Philip Armory did not make his customary evening call on Uncle Dick. For one thing, he feared to intrude on the sacredness of this reunion. For another, he was still troubled by the thought that he might see something besides gladness in his old friend's eyes. Some perplexed shade of doubt or fear, some token that his dream lacked perfect fulfillment. But when he went over the next evening, he understood that his fear had been needless. Uncle Dick had been right. He, and only he, had thoroughly known his little girl. They were in the orchard, those two, among the bronzing leaves and hanging boughs bent earthward by their mellow burden. They came to meet him slowly through a long avenue of fruition with an arch of primrose sky at its seaward end. Uncle Dick's face was an open book written over with unmarred triumph and happiness. Armory was quick to see that there was no shadow in the old man's eyes, and equally quick to realize that, as far as the girl at his side was concerned, there never would be. Bertha Lawrence had come to her own. She was very lovely, lovelier than even rumor had painted her. This tall, graceful girl with the dark, finely poised head and the clear, untroubled gray eyes. Apart from her loveliness, she had the distinctive charm, feminized and subtilized, that Armory had come to associate with Uncle Dick. She held out her hand with a gesture of fine, frank friendship. This is my little girl, said Uncle Dick proudly. You have justified his faith in you, said Armory to her with a smile. Anyone in whom Uncle Dick believed would do that, she answered. His faith is of that rare kind which carries its own fulfillment. She turned and held out her hands to Uncle Dick with a sudden girlish delight that broke through her womanly calm, like a gleam of sunlight rippling over a placid sea. Oh, how happy I am, she said. Everything here is so dear, and you, Uncle Dick, are the dearest of all. Uncle Dick took her hand softly in his own. My little girl, he murmured tenderly. Armory turned away his head, as if from some glimpse of soul communion too holy to be desecrated by stranger eyes. But on his face was the light of one who sees a great glory widening and deepening down the vista of his future. End of Uncle Dick's Little Girl Recording by Tom Noons Section 24 of Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aretha Smith, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Uncollected Short Stories of L. M. Montgomery by Lucy Maud Montgomery Section 24 A Pioneer Wooing Donald Fraser, sitting by the low four-paned window of his new house, was playing old Scotch airs on his fiddle to beguile and dull time away on a cold winter afternoon more than a hundred years ago. The place was a remote settlement in a nascent Canadian province, where the settlers were engaged in the arduous task of carving out homes for themselves in the wilderness. Donald's new house had only four small rooms, but it was considered quite a pretentious edifice in those primitive days. Before it, the cleared fields of his farm sloped down to the ice-bound bay. Behind it, great woods stretched inland, intersected here and there by trails and wood roads. 
In the winter, the ice was the great highway of traffic, and people from far and wide passed Donald's door, often calling to warm themselves before his fire and exchange news of the very scattered settlements. This day was bitter cold, and a storm threatened. Few travelers were abroad, and Donald had no callers. He felt lonely and got his fiddle down for company. It was too early yet to go across the bay to Sherman's. Donald smiled to himself as he played Annie Laurie and thought of Nancy Sherman more beautiful than the heroine of the old ballad. Her face, it is the fairest that e'er the sun shone on, hummed the young Scotch-Canadian softly. The Frasers were one of the best families in the little colony, which was as yet so thinly populated that everybody in it knew everybody else. Alexander Fraser, Donald's father, had been one of the earliest immigrants from Scotland. He was a man liked and respected by all, and had taken a prominent part in shaping the affairs of the colony. From him, Donald, his firstborn, inherited his broad shoulders, sandy hair, deep-set gray eyes, and resolute jaw. But it was from his Irish mother that Donald got the qualities which made him a favorite with all who knew him. The merry curve of his mobile mouth, the twinkle in his gray eyes, the gay smile, the flashing wit, the irrepressible good comradeship that distinguished him from the more reserved, purebred Scotch folk, even the faint suggestion of brogue in his ringing tones, all contributed to form a personality which was destined to stamp its influence on those rude early days. Many a blue-eyed Scotch and English lassie would have been glad and willing to listen had Donald Fraser come a-wooing, and many a girlish heart of a hundred years ago beat quicker at his step or voice. But Donald cared only for one whom many others wooed likewise. He was not openly favored above his rivals. He did not know whether Nancy Sherman cared for him or not, but he knew that if she would not come to be the mistress of his new house, none other ever should. So he dreamed of her as he drew the bow over the strings and filled the low room with the sweetness of old lowland ballads, the fine frenzy of highland reels and strathspeys, and the rollicking abandon of Irish jigs. When he played the last, the Irish fun in his nature overflowed him, drowning out the Scottish romance, and he wished that somebody would drop in and crack a joke with him. When he left the north window, which he liked best because it looked out over the bay to Sherman's, and went to the south one, looking out over a dreary expanse of stumps and half-cleared land, he saw a sleigh emerge from the woods. He knew the driver at a glance, and rushing to the door, threw it open with hearty hospitality. Anyone would have been welcome, but this visitor was Neil Campbell, who was Donald's especial crony. Friends they had always been, and friends they were yet, and they were also rivals. People had expected to see their friendship blotted out by their rivalry, but it had stood the test. Each loved Nancy Sherman, and each knew that the other knew it. Each was determined to win her, and neither would have hesitated over any ruse that would give him the advantage. But no ill feeling found place between them, and when Neil came from Berwick, he always called to see Donald before he crossed the bay, and sometimes, so free from bitterness was their rivalry, he even took Donald over. He got out at the door and shook Donald's proffered hand heartily. Then he tied his restive young mare to a post, threw the buffalo robe over her, and followed Donald to the kitchen. Neither in appearance nor character was there the slightest resemblance between the two men. In point of looks, Neil Campbell could not for an instant compare with Donald Fraser. He was smaller and slighter, with a dark, melancholy face and intensely blue eyes, the vivid blue of a St. Lawrence water on a windy autumn day when the sun breaks out after a storm. In parentage, he was pure Highland, with all the Highlander's mystic poetic temperament. He was not so wildly popular as the gay and dashing Donald, and he was not a favorite with women, but his few friends loved him rarely, and it was said by some that if a woman once loved him, she would do and dare all things to win him. Neil threw himself down by the roaring fire with a sigh of satisfaction. 
It was ten miles from Berwick to the bay shore, and though a lover thought little of that when his lass waited for him at the end, a blazing back log and a taste of good Scotch whiskey were not to be despised at the halfway station. It's cold the day, he said briefly. You'll be going over the bay, I'm thinking, said Donald good humouredly. A slight tinge of colour showed itself on Campbell's dark face. While he bore Donald no grudge for their rivalry, he could not refer to it in the unreserved way of his friend. To him, Donald's offhand way of looking at the situation savoured of greater confidence than he possessed, and this stung him. He only nodded in reply to Donald's remark. The latter had meanwhile been rummaging in his untidy bachelor cupboard, and now he emerged with a bottle of whiskey and a couple of tumblers. This was a matter, of course, a hundred years ago. A woman might offer her woman friends a cup of hot tea, but a man treated his callers to a taste of the best whiskey obtainable. If he failed to do so, he was looked upon as seriously lacking in what were then considered the most rudimentary elements of hospitality. You look cold, said Donald. Set nearer to the fire, man, and let this put a bit of warmth in your veins. You'll need it before you get over the bay. It's bitter cold on the ice today. Now for the Berwick news. Has Jean McLean made up with her man yet? And is it true that Sandy MacDonald is to marry Kate Ferguson? Twill be a match now. Sure, and with her red hair, Sandy will not be like to lose his bride past finding. Berwick was Donald's boyhood home, and Neil had plenty of news for him concerning friends and kin. At first he talked little and cautiously, as was his wont, while Donald bantered and joked, but presently the whiskey which neither spared began to tell on the different temperaments. Donald's volatile spirits evaporated, and the Scotch element of his nature came uppermost. He grew cautious and watchful, talked less, but made shrewder remarks. The Highlander, on the contrary, lost his reserve and became more and more confidential. At last, after being shrewdly manipulated by Donal, Neil Campbell confessed that he meant to put his fate to the test that very night. He was going over the bay to ask Nancy Sherman to marry him. If she consented, then Donald and the rest should see a wedding such as the colony had never yet seen. Donald rose abruptly and went to the window, leaving Neil to sip his grog and gaze smilingly into the fire with the air of a man very well satisfied with himself. As for Donald, he was for the moment nonplussed. This was worse than he had expected. He had never dreamed that Neil would dare bring matters to a crisis yet. But there was no time to be lost if he meant to get ahead of his rival. In his heart, Donald hoped that Nancy Sherman cared for him. What else could those modestly bestowed favors and shy looks, such as she gave to no other, mean? Yet he might be mistaken. She might like Neil best, after all. And whether or no, the first man there stood the better chance. Donald knew very well that Nancy's father favored Neil Campbell as being the richer man in worldly goods. If Neil asked Nancy to marry him when he, Donald, had not yet spoken, Elias Sherman would have the most to say in the matter and Nancy would never dream of disputing her father's command. Donald looked far out over the bay, and realized that his chance of winning Nancy depended on his crossing that white expanse before Neil did. How could it be managed? A twinkle came into Donald's eye. All was fair in love and war, and Nancy was well worth the trial. He went back to the table and sat down. Have some more, man. Have some more he said persuasively. "'Twill keep the life in you in the teeth of that wind. Help yourself. There's plenty of more where that came from. "'Is it going over the bay the night that yourself will be doing?' asked Neil as he obeyed. Donald shook his head. "'I had thought of it,' he owned. "'But it looks a wee like a storm, and my sleigh is at the blacksmith's to be shod.' If I went, it must be on Black Dan's back, and he'd like a canter over the ice in a snowstorm as little as I. His own fireside is by far the best place for a man to be tonight, Campbell. Neil nodded drowsily. His potations, after his long, cold drive, were beginning to have their effect. Donald, with laughter in his deep-set eyes, watched his friend, and persuaded him again and again 
to have yet another tasting. When Neil's head at last fell heavily on his arm, Donald arose with the smile of a man who was won in a doubtful game. Neil Campbell was sound asleep, and would remain so for some time. How long was the question? It might be for hours, and it might be for only a few minutes, but half an hour's start would be enough. For the rest, it would depend on Nancy. But there was no time to lose. Donald flung on his stout homespun overcoat, pulled his fur cap warmly over his ears, and wrapped a knitted muffler of hand-spun yarn around his neck. Then he caught his mitts and riding whip from the nail over the fireplace and strode to the door with a parting glance at the reclining figure of his unconscious friend. "'May your sleep be long and sweet, man,' <laughs> he laughed softly. "'As for the waking, twill be betwixt you and me.' With an amused smile, he untied Neil's horse, climbed into Neil's sleigh, and tucked Neil's buffalo robe comfortably around him. When he wakes, Black Dan will carry him as well as he would have carried me, thought the schemer. But if the snow comes after sunset, it's little we'll see of either over by the bay tonight. Now, Bess, old girl, do your bonniest. There's more than you know hangs on your speed. If the Campbell awakes too soon, Black Dan could show you a pair of clean heels for all of your good start. On, my girl! Brown Bess, one of the best mares in the county, sprang forward over the ice like a deer. The sun was nearing its setting, the gleaming white expanse of the bay gemmed here and there with wooded purple islets and rimmed in by dark violet coasts, glittered like the breast of a fair woman decked with jewels. Above the curdled gray rolls of cloud flushed faintly pink, but the north and east were gray with the presage of night and storm. Donald thought of none of these things, nor of the rare spiritual beauty of the wastes about him, as he urged Brown Best forward with now and then a glance behind to see if Black Dan were yet following, he thought of only what he should say to Nancy Sherman, and of what her answer would be. The Shermans were a family of United Empire Loyalists who had come to Canada at the close of the American War of Independence. They had never spoke of their former fortunes, but it was the general opinion that they had once been wealthy. However that might be, they were poor enough now, and life was even a harder struggle for them than it was for the Scotch immigrants who had already obtained a footing on the Canadian soil. Elias Sherman was a genial, friendly soul, and his wife was a pale, proud woman who had once been beautiful and was dignified and gracious yet. When they came to the little maritime colony, they brought two children with them. These two children, Nancy and Betty, grew up amid many hardships and privations. But as they blossomed out into young womanhood, they were widely famed for their beauty and lovers from the best and wealthiest of the colonial families came a-wooing to the little cottage on the bay shore, and thought themselves richly repaid if they won a smile or a kind glance from the beautiful Sherman girls. Beautiful and stately they were indeed, with a grace and charm of manner that triumphed over mean attire and rough surroundings. A hundred years ago, Nancy and Betty Sherman, now sleeping forgotten in mossy grass-grown graves, on a hill that slopes down to the moaning St. Lawrence Gulf, had the pick of five counties to their hands. Not one of the blue-eyed, fresh-faced Scotch and English lassies, the Jeans and Kates and Margarets, could for a moment compare with them. They were envied bitterly enough, no doubt, and caused many a long-forgotten heartache. Yet the fault was not theirs. They made no effort to win or retain the homage offered to them. The boldest lover never boasted of favors received. A kindly word or gracious smile was all that any ever won, and was esteemed enough. Even Donald Fraser could but own to himself that Nancy was as likely to say no as yes. She had said it calmly and sweetly to better men. Well, he would face the question bravely, and if he were refused, Neil will have the last laugh on me then. Sure, and he's sleeping well and the snow's coming soon, there'll be a bonny swirl on the bay ere long. I hope no harm will come to that lad if he starts to cross. 
When he wakes, he'll be in such a fine, highland temper that he'll never stop to think of danger. Well, Bess, my girl, here we are at last. Now, Donald Fraser, pluck up heart and play the man. Remember you're a Scotchman with a dash of old Ireland to boot, and never flinch because a slip of a lass looks scornful at you out of the bonniest dark blue eyes on earth. In spite of his bold words, however, Donald's heart was thumping furiously when he drove into the farmyard. Nancy was there, milking a cow by the stable door, but she stood up when she saw him coming. Grasping her pail with one hand and holding the other out to him in the gracious, untroubled way for which she was noted, hallowed by the sunset light that was flinging its rosy splendors over all the wide white wastes around them, the girl was so beautiful that Donald's courage failed him almost completely. Was it not the wildest presumption to hope that this exquisite creature could care for him or would come to be the mistress of his little house? She who was fit for a king's halls. In all the humility of a true lover, he stood before her, and Nancy, looking into his bonny face, understood with woman's instinct why he had come. A color and light that was not of the sunset crept into her face and eyes. She did not withdraw her hand from his grasp, but she turned her face aside and bent her head. Donald knew that he must make the most of this unexpected chance. He might not see Nancy alone again before Neil came. Clasping both of his hands over the slender one he held, he said breathlessly, Nan, lass, I love you. You might think tis a hasty wooing, but that's a story I can tell you later, maybe. I know well I'm not worthy of you, but if true love can make a man worthy, there'd be none before me. Will you have me, Nan? Nancy's head in its crimson shawl drooped lower still. For a moment Donald endured an agony of suspense. Then he heard her answer. Oh, such a low, sweet answer. And he knew that she was one. The snow was beginning to fall when they walked together to the house. Donald looked over the bay, misty white in the gathering gloom, and laughed light-heartedly. I must tell you that story, my lass, he said, catching Nancy's look of wonder and you'll see what a trick I played on my best friend to win you. And tell it he did, with such inimitable drollery as such emphasized brogue that Nancy could but laugh as heartily as she did. She was not proof against the humor of the situation, even amid the sweeter romance of it. When morning broke, the storm was over, and Donald knew that vengeance must be on his track. Not wishing to make the Sherman house the scene of a quarrel, he resolved to get away before Neil came, and he persuaded Nancy to drive with him to the county town, some ten miles away, for a callie. As he brought Neil's sleigh up to the door, he saw a black speck far out on the bay, and laughed. Black Dan goes well, but he'll not be quick enough, he said, as he helped Nancy in. Half an hour later, Neil Campbell, with a blackly bent brow and a fire in his blue eyes that was woe to see, dismounted from his smoking horse at the Sherman's door and strode into the kitchen. Had Donald Fraser been there, the comedy might shortly have been turned into a tragedy, for there was blood fury in Campbell's heart and eyes, but the wily rival was far away and the kitchen was empty. Neil stood and chafed at the door until Mrs. Sherman came down the rude stairs from the loft above. At the sight of Campbell, she started in surprise, for though many a wooer came to her house, they did not usually come so early in the day. But she came forward to meet him in a gracious manner. "'Good morning, Mr. Campbell. "'Tis a fair day after the storm, but a cold. "'Come nearer to the fire.' Neil felt his blind fury ebbing away before this woman of the queen-like presence and pale, sorrowful face, so little in keeping with the rude, low room. Mrs. Sherman always imposed a sense of deference upon the person to whom she spoke. Neil could not bring himself to demand of her where Donald Fraser or Nancy was, yet he must say something. "'Where is Betty the morning?' he asked trying to speak calmly, although his voice shook. 
On being told that she had gone to the well for a pail of water, he went out, vowing that he would discover her from the whereabouts of his false friend. Betty Sherman saw him coming across the snow and stood up erectly behind the well with a smile on her face. Her lips parted, and her breath fluttered over them quickly. She put up her slender brown hands and nervously caught the crimson fringes of her knitted shawl together under her chin, while into her eyes leapt a strange light of fear and passion and some undefined emotion that strove to conquer the other two. As far as feature and bearing went, Nancy and Betty Sherman looked marvelously alike. Yet so different were they in coloring, and more than all in expression, that they were scarcely held to resemble each other. The hair that lay in skeins of silken fairness on Nancy's white forehead rippled off from Betty's in locks as richly brown as October nuts. The misty purple of Nan's eyes was so dark and deep in Betty's as to be almost black, and while Nancy was oftener pale than not, a dusky red always glowed in Betty's cheeks and deepened to scarlet in the curves of a very sweet, very scornful mouth. As for their expression, Nancy's was always gracious and charming, while Betty's was mocking and maddening. Though Betty had many lovers, they were afraid of her. Her tongue was a sharp and unsparing one, and she satirized them to their faces. Woe be tied to the rash youth with a squint or a stutter who came courting Betty Sherman. And even those who had no defect of person or manner fared little better. Yet come they did, for there was that about the girl that held a man, though she treated him as the dust under her feet. When Neil Campbell had first come to the cottage on the bay shore, it had been Betty whom he came to see. In those days he had thought Nan by far the less bonny. But Betty, always cruel to her suitors, was doubly so to Neil. She mimicked his highland accent, mocked at his highland ways, and laughed at his shyness as highland pride. Neil, believing his suit was hopeless, left the scornful maid to her own devices, and was gradually drawn into the train of Nancy's lovers, soon to become the most devoted of them. Thenceforth, Betty had treated him with an unvarying indifference, although generally she was as merciless to Nancy's lovers as to her own. Neil felt that his humiliation would be doubly bitter from Betty's probable railing, but in his passionate anger, an anger that quite overmastered the sting of baffled love, he did not care what she might say. "'Good morning, Mr. Campbell,' said Betty's silver-clear voice as he came up to her. "'It's early abroad you are, and on Black Dan, no less.' Was I mistaken in thinking that Donald Fraser said that his favorite horse should never be backed by any man but him? But doubtless a fair exchange is no robbery, and Brown Bess goes well and fleetly. Where is Donald Fraser? said Neil thickly. It is him I am seeking, and it is him I will be finding. Where is he, Betty Sherman? Donald Fraser is far enough away by this, said Betty lightly. He is a prudent fellow, that Donald and has some quickness of wit under that sandy thatch of his. He came here last night at sunset with a horse and a sleigh not his own or lately gotten, and he asked Nan in the stable yard to marry him. Did a man ask me to marry him while I was at the cow's side with my milking pail in my hand? Tis a cold answer he'd get for his pains. But Nan was ever fond of Donald, and tis kindly she must have answered him, for they sat late together last night, and twas a bonny story that Nan wakened me to hear when she came to bed, the story of a bra lover who let his secret out when the whiskey was a in the wit, and then fell asleep while his rival was away to woo and win his lass. Did you ever hear a like story, Mr. Campbell? Neil clenched his fists. Oh, yes, he said fiercely. It is laughing at me over the countryside that Donald Fraser will be doing in telling that story. But when I meet him, it is not laughing he will be doing. Oh, no. There will be another story to tell. What will you do to him? Cried Betty in alarm. Don't meddle with the man. 
Now what a state to be in because a slip of a good-looking lass prefers sandy hair and gray eyes to highland black and blue. You have not the spirit of a wren, Neil Campbell. Were I you, I would show Donald Fraser that I could woo and win a maid as speedily as any lowlander of them all. That would I. There's many a girl would say yes gladly for your asking. I know one myself as bonny as Nan, if folks say true, who would think herself a proud and happy woman if you looked kindly on her, and would love you as well as Nan loves her Donald, aye, and ten times better. Betty's face went crimson, and her eyes faltered down to the pale at her feet. And who may it be, Betty? asked Neil after a brief silence. Betty did not answer in words. She came a step nearer and put one hand on Neil's shoulder with her head still drooping, but looking up at him with her eyes, and an expression half defiant, half yielding, wholly captivating, that answered as plainly as words. Neil took the two cold hands in his. If this be so, lass, he said gently, why did you mock at me so when I came first? What simpletons men are, pouted Betty. Why, it was because I liked you best, to be sure. Then she suddenly sprang away from him with flushing cheeks and clouded eyes. Oh, what must you think of me? She cried. Bold, unmaidenly, that is what you will call me, and truly. But when I saw you coming, and I had loved you for so long, what thought I to lose all for want of one little bold word? Twas hard to speak. But I have spoken it. And now you will despise me. She clasped her hands and stood meekly before him with her face hanging on her breast. Neil came nearer and drew her into his arms. Thank you for that word, he said simply. Betty, it was you that I liked best at first. And if you will marry me, it is a good husband I will try to make you and a proud and happy man I'll be. Betty looked up at him with eyes where tenderness and mischief were mingled. Then maybe Donald Fraser will not do so much laughing after all, she said. Look, Junil, lead me to manage this. When Nan comes back, I'll say to her, Nan, is Donald so very sure that Neil Campbell said your name when he told of his errand? Tis a mistake your lowlander has made, sister. And then I will tell her how you came this morning and asked me to marry you, though twas I that did the asking, was it not? but I'll not tell her that. End of section 24